Moby Dick, Chapter 54. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapter 54 The Town Hose Story as told at the Golden Inn. The Cape of Good Hope, and all the watery region about there, is much like some noted four corners of a great highway, where you meet more travellers than in any other part. It was not very long after speaking the Goni that another homeward-bound whaleman, the Town Ho, was encountered. She was manned almost wholly by Polynesians, in the short gam that ensued she gave us strong news of Moby Dick. To some the general interest in the white whale was now wildly heightened by a circumstance of the town ho's story, which seemed obscurely to involve with the whale a certain wondrous inverted visitation of one of those so-called judgments of God which are at times said to overtake some men. This latter circumstance, with its own particular accompaniments, forming what may be called the secret part of the tragedy about to be narrated, never reached the ears of Captain Ahab or his mates, for that secret part of the story was unknown to the captain of the town Ho himself. It was the private property of three Confederate white seamen of that ship, one of whom, it seems, communicated it to Tashtego with Romish injunctions of secrecy, but the following night Tashtego rambled in his sleep, and revealed so much of it in that way, that when he was wakened he could not well withhold the rest. Nevertheless, so potent an influence did this thing have on those seamen in the Pequod who came to the full knowledge of it, and by such a strange delicacy, to call it so, were they governed in this matter, that they kept the secret among themselves so that it never transpired abaft the Pequod's mainmast. Interweaving in its proper place this darker thread with the story as publicly narrated on the ship, the whole of this strange affair I now proceed to put on lasting record. Footnote. Town Ho the ancient whale cry upon first sighting a whale from the masthead, still used by whalemen in hunting the famous Galapagos terrapin. End of footnote. For my humor's sake I shall preserve the style in which I once narrated it at Lima, to a lounging circle of my Spanish friends, one saint's eve, smoking upon the thick gilt, tiled piazza of the Golden Inn, of those fine cavaliers, the young dons Pedro and Sebastian were on closer terms with me, and hence the interluding questions they occasionally put, and which are duly answered at the time. Quote, Some two years prior to my first learning the events which I am about rehearsing to you, gentlemen, the town ho, sperm whaler of Nantucket, was cruising in your Pacific here, not very many days sail eastward from the eaves of this good golden inn. She was somewhere to the northward of the line. One morning, upon handling the pumps, according to daily usage, it was observed that she made more water in her hold than common. They supposed a swordfish had stabbed her, gentlemen. But the captain, having some unusual reason for believing that rare good luck awaited him in those latitudes, and therefore being very averse to quit them, and the leak not being then considered at all dangerous, though indeed they could not find it after searching the hold as low down as was possible in rather heavy weather, the ship still continued her cruisings, the mariners working at the pumps at wide and easy intervals. But no good luck came, more days went by, and not only was the leak yet undiscovered, but it sensibly increased, so much so that, now taking some alarm, the captain, making all sail, stood away for the nearest harbour among the islands, there to have his hull hove out and repaired. Though no small passage was before her, yet if the commonest chance favoured, he did not at all fear that his ship would founder by the way, 
because his pumps were of the best, and being periodically relieved at them, those six and thirty men of his could easily keep the ship free, never mind if the leak should double on her. In truth, well-nigh the whole of this passage being attended by very prosperous breezes, the town ho had all but certainly arrived in perfect safety at her port without the occurrence of the least fatality, had it not been for the brutal overbearing of Radney, the mate, a vineyarder, and the bitterly provoked vengeance of Steelkilt, a lakeman and desperado from Buffalo. Lakeman, Buffalo, pray what is a lakeman, and where is Buffalo? said Don Sebastian, rising in his swinging mat of grass. On the eastern shore of our Lake Erie, Don, but I crave your courtesy, uh, may be you shall soon hear further of all that. Now, gentlemen, in square-sail brigs and three-masted ships, well-nigh as large and stout as any that ever sailed out of your old Callao to far Manila, this lakeman, in the landlocked heart of our America, had yet been nurtured by all those agrarian freebooting impressions popularly connected with the open ocean. For in their interflowing aggregate, those grand freshwater seas of ours, Erie and Ontario and Huron and Superior and Michigan, possess an ocean-like expansiveness with many of the ocean's noblest traits, with many of its rimmed varieties of races and of climes, they contain round archipelagos of romantic isles, even as the Polynesian waters do, in large part are shored by two great contrasting nations as the Atlantic is. They furnish long maritime approaches to our numerous territorial colonies from the east, dotted all round their banks, here and there are frowned upon by batteries, and by the goat-like craggy guns of lofty Mackinaw. They have heard the fleet thunderings of naval victories. At intervals they yield their beaches to wild barbarians, whose red-painted faces flash from out their peltry wigwams. For leagues and leagues are flanked by ancient and unentered forests, where the gaunt pines stand like serried lines of kings in Gothic genealogies, those same woods harboring wild Afric beasts of prey, and silken creatures whose exported furs give robes to Tartar emperors. They mirror the paved capitals of Buffalo and Cleveland, as well as Winnebago villages. They float alike the full-rigged merchant ship, the armed cruiser of the state, the steamer, and the beach canoe. They are swept by Borean and dismasting blasts as direful as any that lash the salted wave. They know what shipwrecks are, for out of sight of land, however inland, they have drowned full many a midnight ship with all its shrieking crew. Thus, gentlemen, though an inlander, Steelkilt was wild ocean-born and wild ocean-nurtured, as much of an audacious mariner as any. And for Radney, though in his infancy he may have laid him down on the lone Nantucket beach, to nurse at his maternal sea, though in after-life he had long followed our austere Atlantic and your contemplative Pacific, yet he was quite as vengeful and full of social quarrel as the backwoods seaman, fresh from the latitudes of buckhorn-handled buoy-knives. Yet was this Nantucketer a man with some good-hearted traits, and this lakeman, a mariner, who, though a sort of devil indeed, might yet, by inflexible firmness, only tempered by that common decency of human recognition which is the meanest slave's right, thus treated, this steel kilt had long been retained harmless and docile. At all events, he had proved so thus far, but Radney was doomed and made mad, and steel kilt. But, gentlemen, you shall hear. It was not more than a day or two at the furthest after pointing her prow for her island haven that the town hose leak seemed again increasing, but only so as to require an hour or more at the pumps every day. You must know that in a settled and civilized ocean like our Atlantic, for example, some skippers think little of pumping their whole way across it, though of a still sleepy night, should the officer of the deck happen to forget his duty in that respect, 
the probability would be that he and his shipmates would never again remember it, on account of all hands gently subsiding to the bottom. Nor in the solitary and savage seas far from you to the westward, gentlemen, is it altogether unusual for ships to keep clanging at their pump-handles in full chorus, even for a voyage of considerable length, that is, if it lie along a tolerably accessible coast, or if any other reasonable retreat is afforded them. It is only when a leaky vessel is in some very out-of-the-way part of those waters, some really landless latitude, that her captain begins to feel a little anxious. Much this way had it been with the town Ho. So, when her leak was found gaining once more, there was in truth some small concern manifested by several of her company, especially by Radney, the mate. He commanded the upper sails to be well hoisted, sheeted home anew, and every way expanded to the breeze. Now this Radney, I suppose, was as little of a coward, and as little inclined to any sort of nervous apprehensiveness touching his own person, as any fearless, unthinking creature on land or on sea that you can conveniently imagine, gentlemen. Therefore, when he betrayed this solicitude about the safety of the ship, some of the seamen declared that it was only on account of his being a part owner in her. So, when they were working that evening at the pumps, there was on this head no small gamesomeness slyly going on among them, as they stood with their feet continually overflowed by the rippling clear water, clear as any mountain spring, gentlemen, that, bubbling from the pumps, ran across the deck, and poured itself out in steady spouts at the lee scupper holes. Now, as you well know, it is not seldom the case in this conventional world of ours, watery or otherwise, that when a person placed in command over his fellow men finds one of them to be very significantly his superior in general pride of manhood, straightway against that man he conceives an unconquerable dislike and bitterness, and if he have a chance, he will pull down and pulverize that subaltern's tower, and make a little heap of dust of it. Be this conceit of mine as it may, gentlemen, at all events Steelkilt was a tall and noble animal with a head like a Roman, and a flowing golden beard like the tasseled housings of your last viceroy's snorting charger, and a brain and a heart and a soul in him, gentlemen, which had made Steelkilt Charlemagne, had he been born son to Charlemagne's father. But Radney, the mate, was as ugly as a mule, yet as hardy, as stubborn, as malicious. He did not love Steelkilt, and Steelkilt knew it. Espying the mate drawing near as he was toiling at the pump with the rest, the lake men affected not to notice him, but unawed went on with his gay banterings. Ay, ay, my merry lads, it's a lively leak, this. Hold a canakin, one of ye, and let's have a taste. By the Lord, it's worth bottling. I tell ye what, men, old Rad's investment must go for it. He had best cut away his part of the hull and tow it home. The fact is, boys, that swordfish only began the job. He's come back again with a gang of ship carpenters, sawfish, and filefish, and what not. And the whole posse of em are now hard at work, cutting and slashing the bottom, making improvements, I suppose. If old Rad were here now, I'd tell him to jump overboard and scatter em. They're playing the devil with his estate, I can tell him. But he's a simple old soul, Rad, and a beauty, too. Boys, they say the rest of his property is invested in looking-glasses. I wonder if he'd give a poor devil like me the model of his nose. "'Damn your eyes! What's that pump stopping for?' roared Radney, pretending not to have heard the sailors talk. "'Thunder away at it!' "'Aye, aye, sir,' said Steelkilt, merry as a cricket. "'Lively, boys, lively now!' And with that the pump clanged like fifty fire-engines. The men tossed their hats off to it, and ere long that peculiar gasping of the lungs was heard, which denotes the fullest tensions of life's utmost energies. 
Quitting the pump at last with the rest of his band, the lakeman went forward all panting, and sat himself down on the windlass, his face fiery red, his eyes bloodshot, and wiping the profuse sweat from his brow. Now what cousining fiend it was, gentlemen, that possessed Radney to meddle with such a man in that corporeally exasperated state, I know not. But so it happened. Intolerably striding along the deck, the mate commanded him to get a broom and sweep down the planks, and also a shovel, and remove some offensive matters consequent upon allowing a pig to run at large. Now, gentlemen, sweeping a ship's deck at sea is a piece of household work, which in all times but raging gales is regularly attended to every evening. It has been known to be done in the case of ships actually foundering at the time. Such, gentlemen, is the inflexibility of sea usages, and the instinctive love of neatness in seamen, some of whom would not willingly drown without first washing their faces. But in all vessels this broom business is the prescriptive province of the boys, if boys there be aboard. Besides, it was the stronger men in the town ho that had been divided into gangs, taking turns at the pumps, and, being the most athletic seaman of them all, Steelkilt had been regularly assigned captain of one of the gangs. Consequently, he should have been freed from any trivial business not connected with truly nautical duties, such being the case with his comrades. I mention all of these particulars so that you may understand exactly how this affair stood between the two men. But there was more than this. The order about the shovel was almost as plainly meant to sting and insult steel kilt as though Radney had spat in his face. Any man who has gone sailor in a whale ship will understand this, and all this and doubtless much more the lakeman fully comprehended when the mate uttered his command. But as he sat still for a moment, and as he steadfastly looked into the mate's malignant eye, and perceived the stacks of powder casks heaped up in him, and the slow match silently burning along towards them. As he instinctively saw all this, that strange forbearance and unwillingness to stir up the deeper passionateness in any already ireful being, a repugnance most felt, when felt at all, by really valiant men, even when aggrieved, this nameless phantom feeling, gentlemen, stole over steel -kilt. Therefore, in his ordinary tone, only a little broken by the bodily exhaustion he was temporarily in, he answered him, saying that sweeping the deck was not his business, and he would not do it. And then, without at all alluding to the shovel, he pointed to three lads as the customary sweepers, who, not being billeted at the pumps, had done little or nothing all day. To this Radney replied with an oath, in a most domineering and outrageous manner, unconditionally reiterating his command, meanwhile advancing upon the still-seated lakeman with an uplifted cooper's club hammer, which he had snatched from a cask nearby. Heated and irritated as he was by his spasmodic toil at the pumps, for all his first nameless feeling of forbearance, the sweating steel kilt could but ill brook this bearing in the mate but somehow still smothering the conflagration within him, without speaking he remained doggedly rooted to his seat, till at last the incensed Radney shook the hammer within a few inches of his face, furiously commanding him to do his bidding. Steelkilt rose, and slowly retreating round the windlass, steadily followed by the mate with his menacing hammer, deliberately repeated his intention not to obey. Seeing, however, that his forbearance had not the slightest effect, by an awful and unspeakable intimation with his twisted hand, he warned off the foolish and infatuated man. But it was to no purpose, and in this way the two went once slowly round the windlass, when resolved at last no longer to retreat, bethinking him that he had now forborne as much as comported with his humour, the lakeman paused on the hatches, and thus spoke to the officer. "'Mr. Radney, I will not obey you. Take that hammer away, or look to yourself.' 
but the predestinated mate coming still closer to him where the lakeman stood fixed now shook the heavy hammer within an inch of his teeth meanwhile repeating a string of insufferable maledictions retreating not the thousandth part of an inch stabbing him in the eye with the unflinching poniard of his glance steelkilt clenching his right hand behind him and creepingly drawing it back told his persecutor that if the hammer but grazed his cheek he steelkilt would murder him but gentlemen the fool had been branded for the slaughter by the gods immediately the hammer touched his cheek the next instant the lower jaw of the mate was stove in his head he fell on the hatch spouting blood like a whale ere the cry could go aft steelkilt was shaking one of the backstays leading far aloft to where two of his comrades were standing their mastheads they were both canallers canallers cried don pedro we have seen many whale ships in our harbours but never heard of your canallers pardon who and what are they canallers don are the boatmen belonging to our grand erie canal you must have heard of it nay senor hereabouts in this dull warm most lazy and hereditary land we know but little of your vigorous north ay well then don refill my cup your chicha's very fine and ere proceeding further i will tell you what our canallers are for such information may throw sidelight upon my story for three hundred and sixty miles gentlemen through the entire breadth of the state of new york through numerous populous cities and most thriving villages through long dismal uninhabited swamps and affluent cultivated fields unrivalled for fertility by billiard-room and bar-room through the holy of holies of great forests on roman arches over indian rivers through sun and shade by happy hearts are broken through all the wide contrasting scenery of those noble mohawk counties and especially by rows of snow-white chapels whose spires stand almost like milestones flows one continual stream of venetianly corrupt and often lawless life there's your true ashanti gentlemen there howl your pagans where you ever find them next door to you under the long-flung shadow and the snug patronizing lee of churches for by some curious fatality as it is often noted of your metropolitan freebooters that they ever encamp around the halls of justice so sinners gentlemen most abound in holiest vicinities is that a friar passing said don pedro looking downwards into the crowded piazza with humorous concern well for our northern friend dame isabella's inquisition wanes in lima laughed don sebastian proceed senor a moment pardon cried another of the company in the name of all us limis i but desire to express to you sir sailor that we have by no means overlooked your delicacy in not substituting present lima for distant venice in your corrupt comparison oh no do not bow and look surprised you know the proverb along all this coast corrupt as lima it but bears out your saying too churches more plentiful than billiard tables and forever open and corrupt as lima so too venice i have been there the holy city of the blessed evangelist st mark st dominic purge it your cup thanks here i refill now you pour out again freely depicted in his own vocation gentlemen the canaller would make a fine dramatic hero so abundantly and picturesquely wicked is he like mark antony for days and days along his green turfed flowery nile he indolently floats openly toying with his red-cheeked cleopatra ripening his apricot thigh upon the sunny deck but ashore all this effeminacy is dashed the brigandish guise which the canaller so proudly sports his slouched and gaily ribboned hat betoken his grand features a terror to the smiling innocence of the villages through which he floats his swart visage and bold swagger are not unshunned in cities 
Once a vagabond on his own canal, I have received good turns from one of these canalers. I thanked him heartily, would fain not be ungrateful, but it is often one of the prime redeeming qualities of your man of violence, that at times he is as stiff an arm to back a poor stranger in a strait as to plunder a wealthy one. In some gentlemen, what the wildness of this canal life is, is emphatically evinced by this, that our wild whale fishery contains so many of its most finished graduates, and that scarce any race of mankind, except Sydney men, are so much distrusted by our whaling captains, nor does it at all diminish the curiousness of this matter, that to many thousands of our rural boys and young men born along its line, the probationary life of the Grand Canal furnishes the sole transition between quietly reaping in a Christian cornfield and recklessly ploughing the waters of the most barbaric seas. "'I see, I see!' impetuously exclaimed Don Pedro, spilling his chicha upon his silvery ruffles. "'No need to travel. The world's one lima. I had thought now that at your temperate north the generations were cold and holy as the hills. But the story—' I left off, gentlemen, where the lakeman shook the backstay. Hardly had he done so, when he was surrounded by the three junior mates and the four harpooners who all crowded him to the deck. But sliding down the ropes like baleful comets, the two canalers rushed into the uproar, and sought to drag their man out of it toward the forecastle. Others of the sailors joined with them in this attempt, and a twisted turmoil ensued. While standing out of harm's way, the valiant captain danced up and down with a whale-pike, calling upon his officers to manhandle that atrocious scoundrel, and smoke him along to the quarter-deck. At intervals he ran close up to the revolving border of the confusion, and prying into the heart of it with his pike, sought to prick out the object of his resentment. But Steelkilt and his desperadoes were too much for them all. They succeeded in gaining the forecastle deck, where, hastily slewing about three or four large casks in a line with the windlass, these sea Parisians entrenched themselves behind the barricade. "'Come out of that, ye pirates!' roared the captain, now menacing them with a pistol in each hand, just brought to him by the steward. "'Come out of that, ye cutthroats!' Steelkilt leaped on the barricade, and, striding up and down there, defied the worst the pistols could do, but gave the captain to understand distinctly that his, Steelkilt's, death would be the signal for a murderous mutiny on the part of all hands, Fearing in his heart lest this might prove but too true, the captain a little desisted, but still commanded the insurgents instantly to return to their duty. "'Will you promise not to touch us if we do?' demanded their ringleader. "'Turn to! Turn to! I make no promise. To your duty! Do you want to sink the ship by knocking off at a time like this? Turn to!' And he once more raised a pistol. "'Sink the ship!' cried Steelkilt. "'Aye, let her sink. Not a man of us turns to, unless you swear not to raise a rope-yarn against us. What say ye men?' turning to his comrades. A fierce cheer was their response. The lakeman now patrolled the barricade, all the while keeping his eye on the captain, and jerking out such sentences as these. "'It's not our fault. We didn't want it. I told him to take his hammer away.' It was boy's business. He might have known me before this. I told him not to prick the buffalo. I believe I have broken a finger here against his cursed jaw. Ain't those mincing knives down in the forecastle there, men? Look to those handspikes, my hearties. Captain, by God, look to yourself. Say the word, and don't be a fool. Forget it all. We are ready to turn to. Treat us decently, and we're your men. But we won't be flogged. Turn to! I make no promises. Turn to, I say. Look ye now, cried the lakeman, flinging out his arms towards him. There are a few of us here, and I am one of them, who have shipped for the cruise, do you see? Now, as you well know, sir, we can claim our discharge as soon as the anchor is down. So we don't want a row. It's not our interest. 
We want to be peaceable. We are ready to work, but we won't be flogged. Turn to, roared the captain. Steelkilt glanced round him a moment, and then said, I tell you what it is now, captain. Rather than kill you and be hung for such a shabby rascal, we won't lift a hand against you unless you attack us. But till you say the word about not flogging us, we don't do a hand's turn. Down into the forecastle, then. Down with ye. I'll keep ye there till you're sick of it. Down you go. Shall we? cried the ringleader to his men. Most of them were against it, but at length, in obedience to Steelkilt, they preceded him down into their dark den, growlingly disappearing like bears into a cave. As the lakeman's bare head was just level with the planks, the captain and his posse leaped the barricade, and, rapidly drawing over the slide of the scuttle, planted their group of hands upon it, and loudly called for the steward to bring the heavy brass padlock belonging to the companionway. Then, opening the slide a little, the captain whispered something down the crack, closed it, and turned the key upon them, ten in number, leaving on deck some twenty or more, who thus far had remained neutral. All night a wide-awake watch was kept by all the officers, forward and aft, especially about the forecastle scuttle and fore hatchway, at which last place was feared the insurgents might emerge after breaking through the bulkhead below. But the hours of darkness passed in peace, the men who still remained at their duty toiling hard at the pumps, whose clinking and clanking at intervals through the dreary night dismally resounded through the ship. At sunrise the captain went forward, and, knocking on the deck, summoned the prisoners to work, but with a yell they refused. Water was then lowered down to them, and a couple of handfuls of biscuit were tossed after it. When again turning the key upon them and pocketing it, the captain returned to the quarter-deck. Twice every day for three days this was repeated, but on the fourth morning a confused wrangling, and then a scuffling was heard as the customary summons was delivered, and suddenly four men burst up from the forecastle, saying they were ready to turn too. The fetid closeness of the air, and a famishing diet, united perhaps to some fears of ultimate retribution, had constrained them to surrender at discretion. Emboldened by this, the captain reiterated his demand to the rest, but Steelkilt shouted to him a terrific hint to stop his babbling and betake himself where he belonged, on the fifth morning, three others of the mutineers bolted up into the air from the desperate arms below that sought to restrain them. Only three were left. "'Better turn two now,' said the captain with a heartless jeer. "'Shut us up again, will ye?' cried Steelkilt. "'Oh, certainly,' the captain, and the key clicked. It was at this point, gentlemen, that— Enraged by the defection of seven of his former associates, and stung by the mocking voice that had last hailed him, and maddened by his long entombment in a place as black as the bowels of despair, it was then that Steelkilt proposed to the two canallers, thus far apparently of one mind with him, to burst out of their hole at the next summoning of the garrison, and armed with their keen mincing knives, long crescentic, heavy implements with a handle at each end, run amuck from bowsprit to taffrail, and if by any devilishness of desperation possible, seize the ship. For himself he would do this, he said, whether they joined him or not. That was the last night he should spend in that den. But the scheme met with no opposition on the part of the other two. They swore they were ready for that, or for any other mad thing, for anything in short but a surrender and what was more, they each insisted on being the first man on deck, when the time to make the rush should come. But to this their leader as fiercely objected, reserving that priority for himself, particularly as his two comrades would not yield the one to the other in the matter, and both of them could not be first, for the latter would but admit one man at a time. And here, gentlemen, the foul play of these miscreants must come out. Upon hearing the frantic project of their leader, each in his own separate soul had suddenly lighted, it would seem, upon the same piece of treachery, 
namely, to be foremost in breaking out, in order to be the first of the three, though the last of the ten, to surrender, and thereby secure whatever small chance of pardon such conduct might merit. But when Steelkilt made known his determination still to lead them to the last, they in some way, by some subtle chemistry of villainy, mixed their before secret treacheries together, and when their leader fell into a doze, verbally opened their souls to each other in three sentences, and bound the sleeper with cords, and gagged him with cords, and shrieked out for the captain at midnight. Thinking murder at hand, and smelling in the dark for the blood, he and all his armed mates and harpooners rushed for the forecastle. In a few minutes the scuttle was opened, and, bound hand and foot, the still struggling ringleader was shoved up into the air by his perfidious allies, who at once claimed the honor of securing a man who had been fully ripe for murder. But all these were collared, and dragged along the deck like dead cattle, and side by side were seized up into the mizzen rigging, like three quarters of meat, and there they hung till morning. "'Damn ye!' cried the captain, pacing to and fro before them. "'The vultures would not touch ye, you villains!' At sunrise he summoned all hands, and separating those who had rebelled from those who had taken no part in the mutiny, he told the former that he had a good mind to flog them all round, thought upon the whole he would do so, he ought to, justice demanded it, but for the present, considering their timely surrender, he would let them go with a reprimand, which he accordingly administered in the vernacular. "'But as for you, you carrion rogues,' turning to the three men in the rigging, "'for you, I mean to mince you up for the tripots.' And, seizing a rope, he applied it with all his might to the backs of the two traitors, till they yelled no more but lifelessly hung their heads sideways, as the two crucified thieves are drawn. "'My wrist is sprained with ye,' he cried at last. "'But there's still rope enough left for you, my fine bantam, that wouldn't give up. Take that gag from his mouth, and let us hear what he can say for himself.' For a moment the exhausted mutineer made a tremulous motion of his cramped jaws, then, painfully twisting round his head, said in a sort of hiss, "'What I say is this, and mind it well. If you flog me, I murder you.' "'Say you so? See then how you frighten me.' And the captain drew off with the rope to strike. "'Best not,' hissed the lakeman. But I must, and the rope was once more drawn back for the stroke. Steelkilt here hissed out something, inaudible to all but the captain, who, to the amazement of all hands, started back, paced the deck rapidly two or three times, and then, suddenly throwing down his rope, said, I won't do it. Let him go. Cut him down, do you hear? But as the junior mates were hurrying to execute the order, a pale man with a bandaged head arrested them. Radney, the chief mate. Ever since the blow he had lain in his berth, but that morning, hearing the tumult on the deck, he had crept out, and thus far had watched the whole scene. Such was the state of his mouth that he could hardly speak, but mumbling something about his being willing and able to do what the captain dared not attempt, he snatched the rope and advanced to his pinioned foe. "'You are a coward,' hissed the lakeman. "'So I am, but take that!' The mate was in the very act of striking, when another hiss stayed his uplifted arm. He paused, and then, pausing no more, made good his words, spite of steel kilt's threat, whatever that might have been. The three men were then cut down, all hands were turned to, and sullenly worked by the moody seamen, the iron pumps clanged as before. Just after dark that day, when one watch had retired below, a clamor was heard in the forecastle, and the two trembling traders running up besieged the cabin door, saying they durst not consort with the crew. Entreaties, cuffs, and kicks could not drive them back, so at their own instance they were put down in the ship's run for salvation. Still, no sign of mutiny reappeared among the rest. 
On the contrary, it seemed that mainly at Steelkilt's instigation they had resolved to maintain the strictest peacefulness, obey all orders to the last, and when the ship reached port, desert her in a body. But in order to ensure the speediest end to the voyage, they all agreed to another thing, namely, not to sing out for whales, in case any should be discovered. For spite of her leak, and spite of all her other perils, the town ho still maintained her mastheads, and her captain was just as willing to lower for a fish at that moment as on the day his craft first struck the cruising ground, and Radney, the mate, was quite as ready to change his berth for a boat, and with his bandaged mouth seek to gag in death the vital jaw of the whale. But though the lakeman had induced the seamen to adopt this sort of passiveness in their conduct, he kept his own counsel, at least till all was over, concerning his own proper and private revenge upon the man who had stung him in the ventricles of his heart. He was in Radney, the chief mate's watch, and, as if the infatuated man sought to run more than half-way to meet his doom, after the scene at the rigging he insisted, against the express counsel of the captain, upon resuming the head of his watch at night. Upon this, and one or two other circumstances, Steelkilt systematically built the plan of his revenge. During the night Radney had an unseamanlike way of sitting on the bulwarks of the quarter-deck, and leaning his arm upon the gunwale of the boat which was hoisted up there, a little above the ship's side. In this attitude, it was well known, he sometimes dozed. There was a considerable vacancy between the boat and the ship, and down between this was the sea. Steelkilt calculated his time, and found that his next trick at the helm would come round at two o'clock, in the morning of the third day from that in which he had been betrayed. At his leisure he employed the interval in braiding something very carefully in his watches below. "'What are you making there?' said a shipmate. "'What do you think? What does it look like?' "'Like a lanyard for your bag. But it's an odd one, seems to me.' "'Yes, rather oddish,' said the lakeman, holding it at arm's length before him. "'But I think it will answer. "'Shipmate, I haven't enough twine. Have you any?' But there was none in the forecastle. "'Then I must get some from old Rad.' And he rose to go aft. "'You don't mean to go a-begging to him,' said a sailor. "'Why not? Do you think he won't do me a turn when it's to help himself in the end, shipmate?' And going to the mate, he looked at him quietly, and asked him for some twine to mend his hammock. It was given him. Neither twine nor lanyard were seen again, but the next night an iron ball, closely netted, partly rolled from the pocket of the lakeman's monkey jacket, as he was tucking the coat into his hammock for a pillow. Twenty-four hours after, his trick at the silent helm, nigh to the man who was apt to doze over the grave always ready dug to the seaman's hand, that fatal hour was then to come, and in the foreordaining soul of steel kilt the mate was already stark and stretched as a corpse, with his forehead crushed in. But, gentlemen, a fool saved the would-be murderer from the bloody deed he had planned. Yet complete revenge he had, and without being the avenger. For, by a mysterious fatality, heaven itself seemed to step in and take out of his hands into its own the damning thing he would have done. It was just between daybreak and sunrise of the morning of the second day when they were washing down the decks, that a stupid Tenerife man, drawing water in the main chains, all at once shouted out, "'There she rolls! There she rolls! She's you! What a whale!' It was Moby Dick. "'Moby Dick!' cried Don Sebastian. "'Saint Dominic! Sir Sailor! But do whales have christenings? Whom call you Moby Dick?' A very white and famous and most deadly immortal monster, Don, but that would be too long a story. How, how, cried all the young Spaniards crowding. Nay, Don's, Don's, nay, nay, I cannot rehearse that now. Let me get more into the air, sirs. The chicha, the chicha, cried Don Pedro. Our vigorous friend looks faint. Fill up his empty glass. 
No need, gentlemen. One moment, and I proceed. Now, gentlemen, so suddenly perceiving the snowy whale within fifty yards of the ship, forgetful of the compact among the crew, in the excitement of the moment the Tenerife man had instinctively and involuntarily lifted his voice for the monster, though for some little time past it had been plainly beheld from the three sullen mastheads. All was now a frenzy. The white whale! The white whale! was the cry from the captain, mates, and harpooners, who, undeterred by fearful rumors, were all anxious to capture so famous and precious a fish, while the dogged crew eyed askance, and with curses, the appalling beauty of the vast milky mass that lit up by a horizontal spangling sun shifted and glistened like a living opal in the blue morning sea. Gentlemen, a strange fatality pervades the whole career of these events, as if verily mapped out before the world itself was charted. The mutineer was the bowsman of the mate, and when fast to the fish, it was his duty to sit next to him while Radney stood up with his lance in the prow, and haul in or slacken the line at the word of command. Moreover, when the four boats were lowered, the mates got the start and none howled more fiercely with delight than did Steelkilt as he strained at his oar. After a stiff pull their harpooner got fast, and spear in hand Radney sprang to the bow. He was always a furious man, it seems, in a boat, and now his bandaged cry was to beach him on the whale's topmost back. Nothing loath, his bowsman hauled him up and up, and through a blinding foam that blent two whitenesses together, till of a sudden the boat struck as against a sunken ledge, and, keeling over, spilled out the standing mate. That instant, as he fell on the whale's slippery back, the boat righted and was dashed aside by the swell, while Radney was tossed over into the sea, on the other flank of the whale. He struck out through the spray, and for an instant was dimly seen through that veil, wildly seeking to remove himself from the eye of Moby Dick. But the whale rushed round in a sudden maelstrom, seized the swimmer between his jaws, and rearing high up with him, plunged headlong again and went down. Meantime, at the first tap of the boat's bottom, the lakeman had slackened the line, so as to drop astern from the whirlpool. Calmly looking on, he thought his own thoughts, but a sudden terrific downward jerking of the boat quickly brought his knife to the line. He cut it, and the whale was free. But at some distance Moby Dick rose again, and with some tatters of Radney's red woolen shirt, caught in the teeth that had destroyed him. All four boats gave chase again, but the whale eluded them, and finally wholly disappeared. In good time the town ho reached her port, a savage, solitary place, where no civilized creature resided. There, headed by the lakemen, all but five or six of the foremastmen deliberately deserted among the palms, and eventually, as it turned out, seizing a large double war canoe of the savages, and setting sail for some other harbor. The ship's company being reduced to but a handful, the captain called upon the islanders to assist him in the laborious business of heaving down the ship to stop the leak, but to such unresting vigilance over their dangerous allies was this small band of whites necessitated, both by day and by night, and so extreme was the hard work they underwent, that upon the vessel being ready again for the sea, they were in such a weakened condition that the captain durst not put off with them in so heavy a vessel. After taking counsel with his officers, he anchored the ship as far offshore as possible, loaded and ran out his two cannon from the bows, stacked his muskets on the poop, and warning the islanders not to approach the ship at their peril, took one man with him, and setting the sail of his best whaleboat, steered straight before the wind for Tahiti, five hundred miles distant, to procure a reinforcement to his crew. On the fourth day of the sail a large canoe was descried, which seemed to have touched at a low isle of corals, he steered away from it, but the savage craft bore down on him, and soon the voice of Steelkilt hailed him to heave to, or he would run him under water. 
the captain presented a pistol. With one foot on each prow of the yoked war canoes, the lakeman laughed him to scorn, assuring him that if the pistol so much as clicked in the lock, he would bury him in bubbles and foam. "'What do you want of me?' cried the captain. "'Where are you bound, and for what are you bound?' demanded Steelkilt. "'No lies. I am bound to Tahiti for more men. Very good. Let me board you a moment. I come in peace.' With that he leaped from the canoe, swam to the boat, and, climbing the gunwale, stood face to face with the captain. "'Cross your arms, sir. Throw back your head. Now repeat after me. As soon as Steelkilt leaves me, I swear to beach this boat on yonder island, and remain there six days. If I do not, may lightning strike me.' "'A pretty scholar,' laughed the lakeman. "'Adios, signor.' And, leaping into the sea, he swam back to his comrades. Watching the boat till it was fairly beached, and drawn up to the roots of the coconut trees, Steelkilt made sail again, and in due time arrived at Tahiti, his own place of destination. There luck befriended him. Two ships were about to sail for France, and were providentially in want of precisely that number of men which the sailor headed. They embarked, and so forever got the start of their former captain, had he been at all minded to work them legal retribution. Some ten days after the French ships sailed, the whale-boat arrived, and the captain was forced to enlist some of the more civilized Tahitians, who had been somewhat used to the sea. Chartering a small native schooner, he returned with them to his vessel, and finding all right there, again resumed his cruisings. Where steel kilt now is, gentlemen, none know, but upon the island of Nantucket, the widow of Radney still turns to the sea, which refuses to give up its dead, still in dreams sees the awful white whale that destroyed him. "'Are you through?' said Don Sebastian quietly. "'I am, Don. Then I entreat you. Tell me if, to the best of your own convictions, this your story is in substance really true. It is so passing wonderful. Did you get it from an unquestionable source? Bear with me if I seem to press. Also bear with all of us, Sir Sailor, for we all join in Don Sebastian's suit, cried the company, with exceeding interest. Is there a copy of the Holy Evangelist at the Golden Inn, gentlemen? <laughs> Nay, said Don Sebastian, but I know a worthy priest nearby, who will quickly procure one for me. I go for it, but are you well advised? This may grow too serious. Will you be so good as to bring the priest also, Don? Though there are no auto de fes in Lima now, said one of the company to another, I fear our sailor friend runs risk of the archiepiscopy. Let us withdraw more out of the moonlight. I see no need of this. Excuse me for running after you, Don Sebastian, but may I also beg that you will be particular in procuring the largest-sized evangelists you can. This is the priest, and he brings you the evangelists, said Don Sebastian gravely, returning with a tall and solemn figure. Let me remove my hat. Now, venerable priest, further into the light, and hold the holy book before me, that I may touch it. So help me heaven, and on my honor, the story I have told you, gentlemen, is in substance, and its great items, true. I know it to be true. It happened on this ball. I trod the ship. I knew the crew. I have seen and talked with Steelkilt since the death of Radney. End of chapter 54 Moby Dick, Chapters 55 to 58. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick, by Herman Melville, Chapters 55 to 58. 
Chapter 55 Of the Monstrous Pictures of Whales I shall ere long paint to you, as well as one can without canvas, something like the true form of the whale as he actually appears to the eye of the whaleman, when in his own absolute body the whale is moored alongside the whale-ship, so that he can be fairly stepped upon there. It may be worth while, therefore, previously to advert to those curious imaginary portraits of him which, even down to the present day, confidently challenge the faith of the landsman. It is time to set the world right in this matter, by proving such pictures of the whale all wrong. It may be that the primal source of all those pictorial delusions will be found among the oldest Hindu, Egyptian, and Grecian sculptures, for ever since those inventive but unscrupulous times when, on the marble panellings of temples, the pedestals of statues, and on shields, medallions, cups, and coins, the dolphin was drawn in scales of chain armour like Saladin's, and a helmeted head like St. George's, ever since then has something of the same sort of license prevailed, not only in most popular pictures of the whale, but in many scientific presentations of him. Now, by all odds, the most ancient extant portrait, anyways purporting to be the whales, is to be found in the famous cavern pagoda of Elephanta in India. The Brahmins maintain that in the almost endless sculptures of that immemorial pagoda, all the trades and pursuits, every conceivable avocation of man, were prefigured ages before any of them actually came into being. No wonder, then, that in some sort our noble profession of whaling should have been there shadowed forth. The Hindu whale referred to occurs in a separate department of the wall, depicting the incarnation of Vishnu in the form of Leviathan, learnedly known as the Matse Avatar. But, though this sculpture is half man and half whale, so as only to give the tail of the latter, yet that small section of him is all wrong. It looks more like the tapering tail of an anaconda than the broad palms of the true whale's majestic flukes. But go to the old galleries and look now at a great Christian painter's portrait of this fish, for he succeeds no better than the antediluvian Hindu. It is Guido's picture of Persis rescuing Andromeda from the sea monster or whale. Where did Guido get the model of such a strange creature as that? Nor does Hogarth, in painting the same scene in his own Persis descending, make out one whit better. The huge corpulence of that Hogarthian monster undulates on the surface, scarcely drawing one inch of water. It has a sort of howdah on its back, and its distended, tusked mouth into which the billows are rolling might be taken for the traitor's gate leading from the Thames by water into the tower. Then there are the Prodromus whales of old Scotch Sibald, and Jonah's whale as depicted in the prints of old Bibles and the cuts of old primers. What shall be said of these? As for the bookbinder's whale, winding like a vine stalk round the stock of a descending anchor, as stamped and gilded on the backs and title pages of many books, both old and new, that is a very picturesque but purely fabulous creature imitated, I take it, from like figures on antique vases. Though universally denominated a dolphin, I nevertheless call this bookbinder's fish an attempt at a whale, because it was so intended when the device was first introduced. It was introduced by an old Italian publisher somewhere about the fifteenth century, during the revival of learning, and in those days, and even down to a comparatively late period, Dolphins were popularly supposed to be a species of the Leviathan. In the vignettes and other embellishments of some ancient books, you will at times meet with very curious touches at the whale, where all manner of spouts, jets d'eau, hot springs and cold, Saratoga and Baden-Baden, come bubbling up from his unexhausted brain. 
in the title page of the original edition of the Advancement of Learning, you will find some curious whales. But quitting all these unprofessional attempts, let us glance at those pictures of Leviathan purporting to be sober, scientific delineations by those who know. In old Harris's collection of voyages, there are some plates of whales extracted from a Dutch book of voyages, A.D. 1671, entitled, A Whaling Voyage to Spitsbergen in the Ship Jonas and the Whale, Peter Peterson of Friesland, Master. In one of those plates, the whales, like great rafts of logs, are represented lying among ice isles, with white bears running over their living backs. In another play, the prodigious blunder is made of representing the whale with perpendicular flukes. Then again, there is an imposing quarto, written by one Captain Colnett, a post-captain in the English Navy, entitled, A Voyage Round Cape Horn into the South Seas for the Purpose of Extending the Spermaceti Whale Fisheries. In this book is an outline purporting to be a, quote, picture of a visitor or spermaceti whale drawn by scale from one killed on the coast of Mexico, August 1793, and hoisted on deck. I doubt not the captain had this veracious picture taken for the benefit of his marines. To mention but one thing about it, let me say that it has an eye which, applied according to the accompanying scale to a full-grown sperm whale, would make the eye of that whale a bow window some five feet long. Ah, my gallant captain, why did you not give us Jonah looking out of that eye? Nor are the most conscientious compilations of natural history for the benefit of the young and tender, free from the same heinousness of mistake. Look at that popular work, Goldsmith's Animated Nature. In the abridged London edition of 1807, there are plates of an alleged whale and a narwhale. I do not wish to seem inelegant, but this unsightly whale looks much like an amputated sow, and as for the narwhale, one glimpse at it is enough to amaze one, that in this nineteenth century such a hippogriff could be palmed for genuine upon any intelligent public of schoolboys. Then again, in 1825, Bernard Germain, Count de la Cepede, a great naturalist, published a scientific, systematized whale-book, wherein are several pictures of the different species of the Leviathan. All these are not only incorrect, but the picture of the Mysticetus, or Greenland whale, that is to say the right whale, even Scoresby, a long-experienced man as touching that species, declares not to have its counterpart in nature. But placing of the cap sheaf to all this blundering business was reserved for the scientific Frederick Cuvier, brother to the famous Baron. In 1836, he published A Natural History of Whales, in which he gives what he calls a picture of the sperm whale. Before showing that picture to any Nantucketer, you had best provide for your summary retreat from Nantucket. In a word, Frederick Cuvier's sperm whale is not a sperm whale, but a squash. Of course, he never had the benefit of a whaling voyage, such men seldom have, but whence he derived that picture, who can tell? Perhaps he got it, as his scientific predecessor in the same field, Desmarais, got one of his authentic abortions, that is, from a Chinese drawing. And what sort of lively lads with the pencil those Chinese are, many queer cups and saucers inform us. As for the sign-painters' whales seen in the streets hanging over the shops of oil-dealers, what shall be said of them? They are generally Richard the Third whales with dromedary humps, and very savage, breakfasting on three or four sailor tarts, that is, whale-boats full of mariners, their deformities floundering in seas of blood and blue paint. But these manifold mistakes in depicting the whale are not so very surprising after all. Consider, most of these scientific drawings have been taken from the stranded fish, 
and these are about as correct as a drawing of a wrecked ship with broken back would correctly represent the noble animal itself in all its undashed pride of hull and spars. Though elephants have stood for their full lengths, the living leviathan has never yet fairly floated himself for his portrait. The living whale, in all his full majesty and significance, is only to be seen at sea in unfathomable waters, and afloat the vast bulk of him is out of sight, like a launched line of battleship, and out of that element it is a thing eternally impossible for mortal man to hoist him bodily into the air, so as to preserve all his mighty swells and undulations. And, not to speak of the highly presumable difference of contour between a young sucking whale and a full-grown Platonian leviathan, yet even in the case of one of those young sucking whales hoisted to a ship's deck, such is then the outlandish, eel-like, limbered, varying shape of him that his precise expression the devil himself could not catch. But it may be fancied that from the naked skeleton of the stranded whale, accurate hints may be derived touching his true form. Not at all. For it is one of the more curious things about this leviathan, that his skeleton gives very little idea of his general shape, though Jeremy Bentham's skeleton, which hangs for candelabra in the library of one of his executors, correctly conveys the idea of a burly-browed utilitarian old gentleman, with all Jeremy's other leading personal characteristics, yet nothing of this kind could be inferred from any leviathan's articulated bones. In fact, as the great hunter says, the mere skeleton of the whale bears the same relation to the fully invested and padded animal as the insect does to the chrysalis that so roundingly envelops it. This peculiarity is strikingly evinced in the head, as in some parts of this book will incidentally be shown. It is also very curiously displayed in the side fin, the bones of which almost exactly answer to the bones of the human hand, minus only the thumb. This fin has four regular bone fingers, the index, middle, ring, and little finger, but all these are permanently lodged in their fleshy covering, as the human fingers in an artificial covering. However recklessly the whale may sometimes serve us, said humorous Stubb one day, he can never be truly said to handle us without mittens. For all these reasons, then, any way you may look at it, you must needs conclude that the great leviathan is that one creature in the world which must remain unpainted to the last. True, one portrait may hit the mark much nearer than another, but none can hit it with any very considerable degree of exactness. So there is no earthly way of finding out precisely what the whale really looks like, and the only mode in which you can derive even a tolerable idea of his living contour is by going a-whaling yourself. But by so doing you run no small risk of being eternally stove and sunk by him. Wherefore it seems to me you had best not be too fastidious in your curiosity touching this leviathan. CHAPTER 56 of the less erroneous pictures of whales, and the true pictures of whaling scenes. In connection with the monstrous pictures of whales, I am strongly tempted here to enter upon those still more monstrous stories of them, which are to be found in certain books, both ancient and modern, especially in Pliny, Purchas, Hakluyt, Harris, Cuvier, etc. But I pass that matter by. I know of only four published outlines of the great sperm whale, Colnett's, Huggins's, Frederick Cuvier's, and Beale's. In the previous chapter, Colnett and Cuvier have been referred to. Huggins's is far better than theirs, but by great odds, Beale's is the best. All Beale's drawings of this whale are good, excepting the middle figure in the picture of three whales in various attitudes, capping his second chapter. His frontispiece, Boats Attacking Sperm Whales, though no doubt calculated to excite the civil skepticism of some parlor men, is admirably correct and lifelike in its general effect. 
Some of the sperm whale drawings in J. Ross Brown are pretty correct in contour, but they are wretchedly engraved. This is not his fault, though. Of the right whale, the best outline pictures are in Scoresby, but they are drawn on too small a scale to convey a desirable impression. He has but one picture of whaling scenes, and this is a sad deficiency, because it is by such pictures only, when at all well done, that you can derive anything like a truthful idea of the living whale as seen by his living hunters. But, taken for all in all, by far the finest, though in some details not the most correct, presentations of whales and whaling scenes to be anywhere found, are two large French engravings, well executed, and taken from paintings by one garnery. Respectively, they represent attacks on the sperm and right whale. In the first engraving, a noble sperm whale is depicted in full majesty of might, just risen beneath the boat from the profundities of the ocean, and bearing high in the air upon his back the terrific wreck of the stoven planks. The prow of the boat is partially unbroken, and is drawn just balancing upon the monster's spine, and standing in that prow, for that one single incomputable flash of time, you behold an oarsman, half shrouded by the incensed boiling spout of the whale, and in the act of leaping as if from a precipice. The action of the whole thing is wonderfully good and true. The half-emptied line-tub floats on the whitened sea, the wooden poles of the spilled harpoons obliquely bob in it, the heads of the swimming crew are scattered about the whale in contrasting expressions of affright, while in the black stormy distance the ship is bearing down upon the scene. Serious fault might be found with the anatomical details of this whale, but let that pass, since for the life of me I could not draw so good a one. In the second engraving, the boat is in the act of drawing alongside the barnacled flank of a large running right whale, that rolls his black weedy bulk in the sea like some mossy rock-slide from the Patagonian cliffs. His jets are erect, full, and black like soot, so that from so abounding a smoke in the chimney you would think that there must be a brave supper cooking in the great bowels below. Sea fowls are pecking at the small crabs, shellfish, and other sea candies and macaroni which the right whale sometimes carries on his pestilent back, and all the while the thick-lipped leviathan is rushing through the deep, leaving tons of tumultuous white curds in his wake, and causing the slight boat to rock in the swells like a skiff caught nigh the paddle-wheels of an ocean steamer. Thus the foreground is all raging commotion, but behind, in admirable artistic contrast, is the glassy level of a sea becalmed, the drooping unstarched sails of the powerless ship, and the inert mass of a dead whale, a conquered fortress with the flag of capture lazily hanging from the whale-pole inserted into his spout-hole. Who Garnery, the painter, is or was, I know not, but my life for it, he was either practically conversant with his subject, or else marvellously tutored by some experienced whaleman. The French are the lads for painting action. Go and gaze upon all the paintings of Europe, and where will you find such a gallery of living and breathing commotion on canvas, as in that triumphal hall at Versailles, where the beholder fights his way pell-mell through the consecutive great battles of France, where every sword seems a flash of the northern lights, and the successive armed kings and emperors dash by, like a charge of crowned centaurs. Not wholly unworthy of a place in that gallery are these sea-battle pieces of garnery. The natural aptitude of the French for seizing the picturesqueness of things seems to be peculiarly evinced in what paintings and engravings they have of their whaling scenes, with not one-tenth of England's experience in the fishery, and not the thousandth part of that of the Americans, they have nevertheless furnished both nations with the only finished sketches at all capable of conveying the real spirit of the whale-hunt. 
For the most part, the English and American whale draughtsmen seem entirely content with presenting the mechanical outline of things, such as the vacant profile of the whale, which, so far as picturesqueness of effect is concerned, is about tantamount to sketching the profile of a pyramid. Even Scoresby, the justly renowned right whaleman, after giving us a stiff, full length of the Greenland whale, and three or four delicate miniatures of narwhals and porpoises, treats us to a series of classical engravings of boat-hooks, chopping-knives, and grapnels, and, with the microscopic diligence of a Lewenhock, submits to the inspection of a shivering world ninety-six facsimiles of magnified arctic snow-crystals. I mean no disparagement to the excellent voyager. I honor him for a veteran." but in so important a matter, it was certainly an oversight not to have procured for every crystal a sworn affidavit taken before a Greenland justice of the peace. In addition to those fine engravings from Garnery, there are two other French engravings worthy of note, by someone who subscribes himself H. Duran. One of them, though not precisely adapted to our present purpose, nevertheless deserves mention on other accounts. It is a quiet noon scene among the isles of the Pacific. A French whaler anchored inshore in a calm, and lazily taking water on board, the loosened sails of the ship, and the long leaves of the palms in the background, both drooping together in the breezeless air. The effect is very fine, when considered with reference to its presenting the hardy fishermen under one of their few aspects of oriental repose. The other engraving is quite a different affair. The ship hove to on the open seas, and in the very heart of the leviathanic life, with a right whale alongside, the vessel in the act of cutting in, hove over to the monster as if to a quay, and a boat, hurriedly pushing off from this scene of activity, is about giving chase to whales in the distance. The harpoons and lances lie leveled for use, Three oarsmen are just setting the mast in its hole, while from a sudden roll of the sea, the little craft stands half erect out of the water, like a rearing horse. From the ship, the smoke of the torments of the boiling whale is going up like the smoke over a village of smithies, and to windward, a black cloud, rising up with earnest of squalls and rains, seems to quicken the activity of the excited seamen. Chapter 57. Of whales in paint, in teeth, in wood, in sheet-iron, in stone, in mountains, in stars. On Tower Hill, as you go down to the London docks, you may have seen a crippled beggar, or kedger, as the sailors say, holding a painted board before him, representing the tragic scene in which he lost his leg. There are three whales and three boats, and one of the boats, presumed to contain the missing leg in all its original integrity, is being crunched by the jaws of the foremost whale. Any time these ten years, they tell me, has that man held up that picture, and exhibited that stump to an incredulous world. But the time of his justification has now come. His three whales are as good whales as were ever published in Wapping, at any rate, and his stump as unquestionable a stump as any you will find in the western clearings. But, though forever mounted on that stump, never a stump speech does the poor whaleman make, but, with downcast eyes, stands ruefully contemplating his own amputation. Throughout the Pacific, and also in Nantucket and New Bedford and Sag Harbor, you will come across lively sketches of whales and whaling scenes, graven by the fishermen themselves on sperm-whale teeth, or ladies' busks wrought out of the right whale-bone, or other like scrimshander articles, as the whalemen call the numerous little ingenious contrivances they elaborately carve out of the rough material in their hours of ocean leisure. Some of them have little boxes of dentistical-looking implements, specially intended for the scrimshandering business, but in general they toil with their jackknives alone, 
and with that almost omnipotent tool of the sailor, they will turn you out anything you please, in the way of a mariner's fancy. Long exile from Christendom and civilization inevitably restores a man to that condition in which God placed him, i.e. what is called savagery. Your true whale-hunter is as much a savage as an Iroquois. I myself am a savage, owing no allegiance but to the king of the cannibals, and ready at any moment to rebel against him. Now one of the peculiar characteristics of the savage, in his domestic hours, is his wonderful patience of industry. An ancient Hawaiian war-club or spear-paddle, in its full multiplicity and elaboration of carving, is as great a trophy of human perseverance as a Latin lexicon. For with but a bit of broken sea-shell or a shark's tooth, that miraculous intricacy of wooden network has been achieved, and it has cost steady years of steady application. As with the Hawaiian savage, so with the whale-sailor savage. With the same marvellous patience, and with the same single shark's tooth of his one poor jackknife, he will carve you a bit of bone sculpture, not quite as workmanlike, but as close-packed in its maziness of design as the Greek savage Achilles' shield, and full of barbaric spirit and suggestiveness as the prince of that fine old Dutch savage, Albrecht Dürer. Wooden whales, or whales cut in profile out of the small dark slabs of the noble South Sea warwood, are frequently met with in the forecastles of American whalers. Some of them are done with much accuracy. At some old gable-roofed country houses you will see brass whales, hung by the tail for knockers to the roadside door. When the porter is sleepy, the anvil-headed whale would be best. But these knocking whales are seldom remarkable as faithful essays. On the spires of some old-fashioned churches you will see sheet-iron whales, placed there for weathercocks, but they are so elevated, and besides that are to all intents and purposes so labelled with hands off, you cannot examine them closely enough to decide upon their merit. In bony, ribby regions of the earth, where at the base of high broken cliffs masses of rock lie strewn in fantastic groupings upon the plain, you will often discover images as of the petrified forms of the leviathan partly merged in grass, which of a windy day breaks against them in a surf of green surges. Then again, in mountainous countries, where the traveller is continually girdled by amphitheatrical heights, here and there, from some lucky point of view, you will catch passing glimpses of the profiles of whales defined along the undulating ridges, but you must be a thorough whaleman to see these sights, and not only that, but if you wish to return to such a sight again, you must be sure and take the exact intersecting latitude and longitude of your first standpoint, else so chance-like are such observations of the hills, that your precise previous standpoint would require a laborious rediscovery, like the Saloma Islands, which still remain incognita, though once high-ruffed Medana trod them, and old Figuera chronicled them. Nor, when expandingly lifted by your subject, can you fail to trace out great whales in the starry heavens, and boats in pursuit of them, as when, long filled with thoughts of war, the eastern nations saw armies locked in battle among the clouds. Thus at the north have I chased Leviathan round and round the pole, with the revolutions of the bright points that first defined him to me. And, beneath the effulgent Antarctic skies, I have boarded the Argo Navis, and joined the chase against the starry Cetus, far beyond the utmost stretch of Hydrus and the flying fish. With a frigate's anchors for my bridle bits, and fasces of harpoons for spurs, would I could mount that whale, and leap the topmost skies, to see whether the fabled heavens, with all their countless tents, really lie encamped beyond my mortal sight. Chapter 58 Brit 
Steering north-eastward from the Crozettes, we fell in with vast meadows of Brit, the minute yellow substance upon which the right whale largely feeds. For leagues and leagues it undulated round us, so that we seemed to be sailing through boundless fields of ripe and golden wheat. On the second day, numbers of right whales were seen, who, secure from the attack of a sperm whaler like the Pequod, with open jaws sluggishly swam through the Brit, which, adhering to the fringing fibres of that wondrous Venetian blind in their mouths, was in that manner separated from the water that escaped at the lip. As morning mowers, who side by side slowly and seethingly advance their scythes through the long wet grass of marshy meads, even so these monsters swam, making a strange grassy cutting sound, and leaving behind them endless swaths of blue upon the yellow sea. Footnote. That part of the sea known among whalemen as the Brazil Banks does not bear that name as the banks of Newfoundland do, because of their being shallows and soundings there, but because of this remarkable meadow-like appearance, caused by the vast drifts of Brit continually floating in those latitudes where the right whale is often chased. End of footnote. But it was only the sound they made as they parted the Brit, which at all reminded one of mowers. Seen from the mastheads, especially when they paused and were stationary for a while, their vast black forms looked more like lifeless masses of rock than anything else. And, as in the great hunting countries of India, the stranger at a distance will sometimes pass on the plains recumbent elephants without knowing them to be such, taking them for bare, blackened elevations of the soil, even so, often, for him who, for the first time, beholds this species of leviathans on the sea. And even when recognized at last, their immense magnitude renders it very hard really to believe that such bulky masses of overgrowth can possibly be instinct in all parts with the same sort of life that lives in a dog or a horse. Indeed, in other respects, you can hardly regard any creatures of the deep with the same feelings that you do of those of the shore. For though some old naturalists have maintained that all creatures of the land are of their kind in the sea, and though taking a broad general view of the thing this may very well be, yet coming to specialties, where, for example, does the ocean furnish any fish that in disposition answers to the sagacious kindness of the dog? The accursed shark alone can in any generic respect be said to bear comparative analogy to him. But though to landsmen in general the native inhabitants of the seas have ever been regarded with emotions unspeakably unsocial and repelling, though we know the sea to be an everlasting terra incognita, so that Columbus sailed over numberless unknown worlds to discover his one superficial western one, though by vast odds the most terrific of all mortal disasters have immemorially and indiscriminately befallen tens and hundreds of thousands of those who have gone upon the waters, though but a moment's consideration will teach that, however baby man may brag of his science and skill, and however much, in a flattering future, that science and skill may augment, yet forever and forever, to the crack of doom, the sea will insult and murder him, and pulverize the stateliest, stiffest frigate he can make, nevertheless, by the continual repetition of these very impressions, man has lost that sense of the full awfulness of the sea which aboriginally belongs to it. The first boat we read of floated on an ocean that with Portuguese vengeance had whelmed a whole world without leaving so much as a widow, that same ocean rolls now, that same ocean destroyed the wrecked ships of last year. Yea, foolish mortals, Noah's flood is not yet subsided, two-thirds of the fair world it yet covers. Wherein differ the sea and the land, that a miracle upon one is not a miracle upon the other? 
preternatural terrors rested upon the Hebrews, when under the feet of Korah and his company the live ground opened and swallowed them up forever. Yet not a modern sun ever sets, but in precisely the same manner the live sea swallows up ships and crews. But not only is the sea such a foe to man who is an alien to it, but it is also a fiend to its own offspring, worse than the Persian host who murdered his own guests, sparing not the creatures which itself hath spawned. Like a savage tigress that, tossing in the jungle, overlays her own cubs, so the sea dashes even the mightiest whales against the rocks, and leaves them there side by side with the split wrecks of ships. No mercy, no power, but its own controls it. Panting and snorting like a mad battle-steed that has lost its rider, the masterless ocean overruns the globe. Consider the subtleness of the sea, how its most dreaded creatures glide under water, unapparent for the most part, and treacherously hidden beneath the loveliest tints of azure. Consider also the devilish brilliance and beauty of many of its most remorseless tribes, as the dainty embellished shape of many species of sharks. Consider once more the universal cannibalism of the sea, all whose creatures prey upon each other, carrying on eternal war since the world began. Consider all this, and then turn to this green, gentle, and most docile earth. Consider them both, the sea and the land. And do you not find a strange analogy to something in yourself? For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all the horrors of the half-known life. God keep thee. Push not off from that isle. Thou canst never return. End of chapters 55 to 58 Moby Dick, chapters 59 to 63 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 59 to 63. Chapter 59. Squid. Slowly wading through the meadows of Brit, the Pequod still held on her way northeastward towards the island of Java, a gentle air impelling her keel, so that in the surrounding serenity, her three tall, tapering masts mildly waved to that languid breeze, as three mild palms on a plain. And still, at wide intervals in the silvery night, the lonely, alluring jet would be seen. But one transparent blue morning, when a stillness almost preternatural spread over the sea, however unattended with any stagnant calm, when the long burnished sun glade on the waters seemed a golden finger laid across them, enjoining some secrecy, when the slippered waves whispered together as they softly ran on, in this profound hush of the visible sphere, a strange spectre was seen by Dagoo from the main masthead. In the distance a great white mass lazily rose, and, rising higher and higher, and disentangling itself from the azure, at last gleamed before our prow like a snow-slide, new slid from the hills. Thus glistening for a moment, as slowly it subsided and sank, then once more arose, and silently gleamed. It seemed not a whale. And yet is this Moby Dick, thought Dagoo? Again the phantom went down, but on reappearing once more, with a stiletto-like cry that startled every man from his nod, the negro yelled out, There! There again! There she breaches! Right ahead! The white whale! The white whale! 
Upon this the seamen rush to the yard-arms, as in swarming times the bees rush to the boughs. Bareheaded in the sultry sun, Ahab stood on the bowsprit, and with one hand pushed far behind in readiness to wave his orders to the helmsman, cast his eager glance in the direction indicated aloft by the outstretched motionless arm of Dagoo. Whether the flitting attendance of one still and solitary jet had gradually worked upon Ahab, so that he was now prepared to connect the ideas of mildness and repose with the first sight of the particular whale he pursued, however this was, or whether his eagerness betrayed him, whichever way it might have been, no sooner did he distinctly perceive the white mass than with a quick intensity he instantly gave orders for lowering. The four boats were soon on the water, Ahab's in advance, and all swiftly pulling towards their prey. Soon it went down, and while, with oars suspended, we were awaiting its reappearance, lo, in the same spot where it sank, once more it slowly rose. Almost forgetting for a moment all thoughts of Moby Dick, we gazed at the most wondrous phenomenon which the secret seas have hitherto revealed to mankind— a vast pulpy mass, furlongs in length and breadth, of a glancing cream color, lay floating on the water, innumerable long arms radiating from its center, and curling and twisting like a nest of anacondas, as if blindly to clutch at any hapless object within reach. No perceptible face or front did it have, no conceivable token of either sensation or instinct but undulated there on the billows, an unearthly, formless, chance-like apparition of life. As, with a low sucking sound, it slowly disappeared again, Starbuck, still gazing at the agitated waters where it had sunk, with a wild voice exclaimed, Almost rather had I seen Moby Dick and fought him, than to have seen thee, thou white ghost. "'What was it, sir?' said Flask. "'The great live squid, which, they say, few whale-ships ever beheld, and returned to their ports to tell of it.' But Ahab said nothing. Turning his boat, he sailed back to the vessel, the rest as silently following. Whatever superstitions the sperm-whalemen in general have connected with the sight of this object— Certain it is, that a glimpse of it being so very unusual, that circumstance has gone far to invest it with portentousness. So rarely is it beheld, that though one and all of them declare it to be the largest animated thing in the ocean, yet very few of them have any but the most vague ideas concerning its true nature and form. Notwithstanding, they believe it to furnish the sperm whale his only food, for though other species of whales find their food above water, and may be seen by man in the act of feeding, the spermaceti whale obtains his whole food in unknown zones below the surface, and only by inference is it that any one can tell of what precisely that food consists. At times, when closely pursued, he will disgorge what are supposed to be the detached arms of the squid, some of them, thus exhibited, exceeding twenty and thirty feet in length. They fancy that the monster to which these arms belonged ordinarily clings by them to the bed of the oceans, and that the sperm whale, unlike other species, is supplied with teeth in order to attack and tear it. There seems some ground to imagine that the great kraken of Bishop Pontopidan may ultimately resolve itself into squid. The manner in which the bishop describes it, as alternately rising and sinking, with some other particulars he narrates, in all this the two correspond. But much abatement is necessary with respect to the incredible bulk he assigns it. By some naturalists who have vaguely heard rumors of the mysterious creature here spoken of, it is included among the class of cuttlefish, to which, indeed, in certain external respects it would seem to belong, but only as the anak of the tribe. CHAPTER 60. THE LINE 
With reference to the whaling scene shortly to be described, as well as for the better understanding of all similar scenes elsewhere presented, I have here to speak of the magical, sometimes horrible, whale line. The line originally used in the fishery was of the best hemp, slightly vapored with tar, not impregnated with it, as in the case of ordinary ropes. For while tar, as ordinarily used, makes the hemp more pliable to the rope-maker, and also renders the rope itself more convenient to the sailor for common ship use, yet not only would the ordinary quantity too much stiffen the whale-line for the close coiling to which it must be subjected, but, as most seamen are beginning to learn, tar, in general, by no means adds to the rope's durability or strength, however much it may give it compactness and gloss. Of late years the manila rope has, in the American fishery, almost entirely superseded hemp as a material for whale lines, for though not so durable as hemp, it is stronger and far more soft and elastic, and, I will add, since there is an aesthetics in all things, is much more handsome and becoming to the boat than hemp. Hemp is a dusky, dark fellow, a sort of Indian, but Manila is as a golden-haired Circassian to behold. The whale line is only two-thirds of an inch in thickness. At first sight you would not think it so strong as it really is, by experiment, its one and fifty yarns will each suspend a weight of one hundred and twenty pounds, so that the whole rope will bear a strain nearly equal to three tons. In length, the common sperm whale line measures something over two hundred fathoms. Towards the stern of the boat it is spirally coiled away in the tub, not like the worm pipe of a still, though, but so as to form one round, cheese-shaped mass of densely bedded sheaves or layers of concentric spiralizations, without any hollow but the heart, or minute vertical tube formed at the axis of the cheese. As the least tangle or kink in the coiling would, in running out, infallibly take somebody's arm, leg, or entire body off, the utmost precaution is used in stowing the line in its tub. Some harpooners will consume almost an entire morning in this business, carrying the line high aloft and then reeving it downward through a block towards the tub, so as, in the act of coiling, to free it from all possible wrinkles and twists. In the English boats, two tubs are used instead of one, the same line being continuously coiled in both tubs, there is some advantage in this, because these twin tubs, being so small, they fit more readily into the boat, and do not strain it so much. Whereas the American tub, nearly three feet in diameter, and of proportionate depth, makes a rather bulky freight for a craft whose planks are but one half inch in thickness, for the bottom of the whale-boat is like critical ice, which will bear up under a considerable distributed weight, but not very much of a concentrated one. When the painted canvas cover is clapped on the American line tub, the boat looks as if it were pulling off with a prodigious great wedding cake to present to the whales. Both ends of the line are exposed, the lower end terminating in an eye splice or loop coming up from the bottom against the side of the tub, and hanging over its edge completely disengaged from everything. This arrangement of the lower end is necessary on two accounts. First, in order to facilitate the fastening to it of an additional line from a neighboring boat, in case the stricken whale should sound so deep as to threaten to carry off the entire line originally attached to the harpoon. In these instances, the whale, of course, is shifted like a mug of ale, as it were, from one boat to the other though the first boat always hovers at hand to assist its consort. Second, this arrangement is indispensable for common safety's sake, for were the lower end of the line in any way attached to the boat, and were the whale then to run the line out to the end, almost in a single smoking minute as he sometimes does, he would not stop there, for the doomed boat would infallibly be dragged down after him into the profundity of the sea 
and in that case no town crier would ever find her again. Before lowering the boat for the chase, the upper end of the line is taken aft from the tub, and passing round the loggerhead there, is again carried forward the entire length of the boat, resting crosswise upon the loom or handle of every man's oar, so that it jogs against his wrist in rowing, and also passing between the men, as they alternately sit at the opposite gunwales, to the leaded chocks or grooves in the extreme pointed prow of the boat, where a wooden pin or skewer the size of a common quill prevents it from slipping out. From the chocks it hangs in a slight festoon over the bows, and is then passed inside the boat again, and some ten or twenty fathoms, called box-line, being coiled upon the box in the bows, it continues its way to the gunwale still a little further aft, and is then attached to the short warp, the rope which is immediately connected with the harpoon. But previous to that connection, the short warp goes through sundry mystifications too tedious to detail. Thus the whale-line folds the whole boat in its complicated coils, twisting and writhing around it in almost every direction. All the oarsmen are involved in its perilous contortions, so that to the timid eye of the landsman they seem as Indian jugglers, with the deadliest snakes sportively festooning their limbs. Nor can any son of mortal woman for the first time seat himself amid those hempen intricacies, and while straining his utmost at the oar, bethink him that at any unknown instant the harpoon may be darted, and all these horrible contortions be put into play like ringed lightnings. He cannot be thus circumstanced without a shudder that makes the very marrow in his bones to quiver in him like a shaken jelly. Yet habit, strange thing, what cannot habit accomplish? Gayer sallies, more merry mirth, better jokes, and brighter repartees you never heard over your mahogany than you will hear over the half-inch white cedar of the whale-boat, when thus hung in hangman's nooses, and, like the six burghers of Calais before King Edward, the six men composing the crew pull into the jaws of death with a halter around every neck, as you may say. Perhaps a very little thought will now enable you to account for those repeated wailing disasters, some few of which are casually chronicled, of this man or that man being taken out of the boat by the line, and lost. For when the line is darting out, to be seated then in the boat is like being seated in the midst of the manifold whizzings of a steam-engine in full play, when every flying beam and shaft and wheel is grazing you. It is worse, for you cannot sit motionless in the heart of these perils, because the boat is rocking like a cradle, and you are pitched one way and the other, without the slightest warning, and only by a certain self-adjusting buoyancy and simultaneousness of volition and action can you escape being made a mazeppa of, and run away with where the all-seeing sun himself could never pierce you out. Again, as the profound calm, which only apparently precedes and prophesies of the storm, is perhaps more awful than the storm itself, for indeed the calm is but the wrapper and envelope of the storm, and contains it in itself, as the seemingly harmless rifle holds the fatal powder and the ball and the explosion, so the graceful repose of the line, as it silently serpentines about the oarsman before being brought into actual play, this is a thing which carries more of true terror than any other aspect of this dangerous affair. But why say more? All men live enveloped in whale lines, all are born with halters round their necks, but it is only when caught in the swift, sudden turn of death that mortals realize the silent, subtle, ever-present perils of life. And if you be a philosopher, though seated in a whale-boat, you would not at heart feel one whit more of terror than though seated before your evening fire with a poker and not a harpoon by your side. Chapter 61. 
Stub Kills a Whale. If, to Starbuck, the apparition of the squid was a thing of portents, to Queequeg it was quite a different object. When you see him quid, said the savage, honing his harpoon in the bow of his hoisted boat, then you quick see him parm whale. The next day was exceedingly still and sultry, and with nothing special to engage them, the Pequod's crew could hardly resist the spell of sleep induced by such a vacant sea. For this part of the Indian Ocean through which we were voyaging is not what whalemen call a lively ground, that is, it affords fewer glimpses of porpoises, dolphins, flying fish, and other vivacious denizens of more stirring waters than those off the Rio de la Plata or the inshore ground off Peru. It was my turn to stand at the foremast head, and, with my shoulders leaning against the slackened royal shrouds, to and fro I idly swayed in what seemed an enchanted air. No resolution could withstand it. In that dreamy mood, losing all consciousness, at last my soul went out of my body, though my body still continued to sway as a pendulum will, long after the power which first moved it is withdrawn. Ere forgetfulness altogether came over me, I had noticed that the seamen at the main and mizzen mastheads were already drowsy so that at last all three of us lifelessly swung from the spars, and for every swing that we made there was a nod from below from the slumbering helmsman. The waves, too, nodded their indolent crests, and across the wide trance of the sea, east nodded to west, and the sun over all. Suddenly bubbles seemed bursting beneath my closed eyes, like vices my hands grasped the shrouds, some invisible, gracious agency preserved me. With a shock I came back to life. And lo, close under our lee, not forty fathoms off, a gigantic sperm whale lay rolling in the water like the capsized hull of a frigate, his broad, glossy back of an Ethiopian hue, glistening in the sun's rays like a mirror. But lazily undulating in the trough of the sea, and ever and anon tranquilly spouting his vapory jet, the whale looked like a portly burgher smoking his pipe of a warm afternoon. But that pipe, poor whale, was thy last. As if struck by some enchanter's wand, the sleepy ship and every sleeper in it all at once started into wakefulness, and more than a score of voices from all parts of the vessel, simultaneously with the three notes from aloft, shouted forth the accustomed cry, as the great fish slowly and regularly spouted the sparkling brine into the air. "'Clear away the boats! Luff!' cried Ahab, and, obeying his own order, he dashed the helm down before the helmsman could handle the spokes. The sudden exclamations of the crew must have alarmed the whale, and ere the boats were down, majestically turning, he swam away to the leeward, but with such a steady tranquillity, and making so few ripples as he swam, that, thinking after all he might not as yet be alarmed, Ahab gave orders that not an oar should be used, and no man must speak but in whispers. So, seated like Ontario Indians on the gunwales of the boats, we swiftly but silently paddled along, the calm not admitting of the noiseless sails being set. Presently, as we thus glided in chase, the monster perpendicularly flitted his tail forty feet into the air, and then sank out of sight like a tower swallowed up. "'There go flukes!' was the cry, an announcement immediately followed by Stubbs producing his match and igniting his pipe, for now a respite was granted. After the full interval of his sounding had elapsed, the whale rose again, and, being now in advance of the smoker's boat, and much nearer to it than any of the others, Stubb counted upon the honour of the capture. It was obvious now that the whale had at length become aware of his pursuers. All silence of cautiousness was therefore no longer of use. Paddles were dropped, and oars came loudly into play. And still puffing at his pipe, Stubb cheered on his crew to the assault. Yes, a mighty change had come over the fish. 
all alive to his jeopardy, he was going head out, that part obliquely projecting from the mad yeast which he brewed. Footnote. It will be seen in some other place of what a very light substance the entire interior of the sperm whale's enormous head consists. Though apparently the most massive, it is by far the most buoyant part about him, so that with ease he elevates it in the air, and invariably does so when going at his utmost speed. Besides, such is the breadth of the upper part of the front of his head, and such the tapering cut-water formation of the lower part, that by obliquely elevating his head, he thereby may be said to transform himself from a bluff-bowed sluggish galliot into a sharp-pointed New York pilot boat. End of footnote. Starter! Starter, my men! Don't hurry yourselves. Take plenty of time. But starter! Starter like thunderclaps, that's all! cried Stubb, spluttering out the smoke as he spoke. Starter now! Give him the long and strong stroke, Tashtego. Starter, Tash, my boy. Starter all. But keep cool, keep cool. Cucumbers is the word. Easy, easy. Only starter like grim death and grinning devils, and raise the buried dead perpendicular out of their graves, boys. That's all. Starter. Woohoo! Why he! screamed the gayheader in reply raising some old war-whoop to the skies, as every oarsman in the strained boat involuntarily bounced forward with the one tremendous leading stroke which the eager Indian gave. But his wild screams were answered by others quite as wild. Kee-hee! Kee-hee! yelled Dagoo, straining forwards and backwards on his seat like a pacing tiger in his cage. Kala! Kulu! howled Queequeg as if smacking his lips over a mouthful of grenadier's steak. And thus, with oars and yells, the keels cut the sea. Meanwhile, Stubb, retaining his place in the van, still encouraged his men to the onset, all the while puffing the smoke from his mouth. Like desperadoes they tugged and they strained, till the welcome cry was heard. Stand up, Tashtego! Give it to him! The harpoon was hurled. Stern all! The oarsmen backed water. The same moment something went hot and hissing along every one of their wrists. It was the magical line. An instant before, Stubb had swiftly caught two additional turns with it round the loggerhead, whence, by reason of its increased rapid circlings, a hempen blue smoke now jetted up and mingled with the steady fumes from his pipe. As the line passed round and round the loggerhead, so also, just before reaching that point, it blisteringly passed through and through both of Stubb's hands, from which the hand-cloths or squares of quilted canvas sometimes worn at these times had accidentally dropped. It was like holding an enemy's sharp, two-edged sword by the blade, and that enemy all the time striving to wrest it out of your clutch. "'Wet the line! Wet the line!' cried Stubb to the tub oarsman, him seated by the tub, who, snatching off his hat, dashed seawater into it. Footnote. Partly to show the indispensableness of this act, it may here be stated that in the old Dutch fishery a mop was used to dash the running line with water. In many other ships a wooden piggin or baler is set apart for that purpose— your hat, however, is the most convenient. End of footnote. More turns were taken, so that the line began holding its place. The boat now flew through the boiling water, like a shark, all fins. Stubb and Tashtego here changed places, stem for stern, a staggering business, truly, in that rocking commotion. From the vibrating line extending the entire length of the upper part of the boat, and from its now being more tight than a harp-string, you would have thought the craft had two keels, one cleaving the water, the other the air, as the boat churned on through both opposing elements at once. A continual cascade played at the bows, a ceaseless whirling eddy in her wake, and at the slightest motion from within, but even of a little finger, the vibrating, cracking craft 
canted over her spasmodic gunwale into the sea. Thus they rushed, each man with might and main clinging to his seat, to prevent being tossed to the foam, and the tall form of Tashtego at the steering oar crouching almost double in order to bring down his center of gravity. Whole Atlantics and Pacific seemed past as they shot on their way, till at length the whale somewhat slackened his flight. "'Haul in! Haul in!' cried Stubb to the bowsman, and facing round towards the whale all hands began pulling the boat up to him, while yet the boat was being towed on. Soon ranging up by his flank, Stubb, firmly planting his knee in the clumsy cleat, darted dart after dart into the flying fish. At the word of command, the boat alternately sterning out of the way of the whale's horrible wallow, and then ranging up for another fling. The red tide now poured from all sides of the monster, like brooks down a hill. His tormented body rolled not in brine but in blood, which bubbled and seethed for furlongs behind in their wake. The slanting sun playing upon this crimson pond in the sea sent back its reflection into every face, so that they all glowed to each other like red men. And all the while jet after jet of white smoke was agonizingly shot from the spiracle of the whale, and vehement puff after puff from the mouth of the excited headsman, as at every dart hauling in upon his crooked lance, by the line attached to it, Stubb straightened it again and again, by a few rapid blows against the gunwale, and then again and again sent it into the whale. "'Pull up! Pull up!' he now cried to the bowsman, as the waning whale relaxed in his wrath. "'Pull up! Close to!' and the boat ranged along the fish's flank. When reaching far over the bow, Stubb slowly churned his long, sharp lance into the fish, and kept it there, carefully churning and churning, as if cautiously seeking to feel after some gold watch that the whale might have swallowed, and which he was fearful of breaking, ere he could hook it out. But that gold watch he sought was the innermost life of the fish. And now it is struck, for, starting from his trance into that unspeakable thing called his flurry, the monster horribly wallowed in his blood, overwrapped himself in impenetrable, mad, boiling spray, so that the imperiled craft, instantly dropping astern, had much ado blindly to struggle out from that frenzied twilight into the clear air of day. And now, abating in his flurry, the whale once more rolled out into view, surging from side to side, spasmodically dilating and contracting his spout-hole, with sharp, cracking, agonized respirations. At last, gush after gush of clotted red gore, as if it had been the purple lees of red wine, shot into the frighted air, and, falling back again, ran dripping down his motionless flanks into the sea. His heart had burst. "'He is dead, Mr. Stubb,' said Tashtego. "'Yes, both pipes smoked out.' and withdrawing his own from his mouth, Stubb scattered the dead ashes over the water, and, for a moment, stood thoughtfully eyeing the vast corpse he had made. CHAPTER 62 THE DART A word concerning an incident in the last chapter. According to the invariable usage of the fishery, the whale-boat pushes off from the ship, with the headsman or whale-killer as temporary steersman, and the harpooner or whale-fastener pulling the foremost oar, the one known as the harpooner oar. Now, it needs a strong, nervous arm to strike the first iron into the fish, for often, in what is called a long dart, the heavy implement has to be flung to the distance of twenty or thirty feet, but however prolonged and exhausting the chase, the harpooner is expected to pull his oar meanwhile to the uttermost. Indeed, he is expected to set an example of superhuman activity to the rest, not only by incredible rowing, but by repeated loud and intrepid exclamations. 
and what it is to keep shouting at the top of one's compass, while all the other muscles are strained and half-started, what that is none know but those who have tried it. For one, I cannot bawl very heartily and work very recklessly at one at the same time. In this straining, bawling state, then, with his back to the fish, all at once the exhausted harpooner hears the exciting cry, Stand up and give it to him. He now has to drop and secure his oar, turn round on his centre halfway, seize his harpoon from the crotch, and, with what little strength may remain, he essays to pitch it somehow into the whale. No wonder, taking the whole fleet of whalemen in a body, that out of fifty fair chances for a dart, not five are successful. No wonder that so many hapless harpooners are madly cursed and disrated. No wonder that some of them actually burst their blood vessels in the boat. No wonder that some sperm whalemen are absent four years with four barrels. No wonder that to many ship owners whaling is but a losing concern, for it is the harpooner that makes the voyage, and if you take the breath out of his body, how can you expect to find it there when most wanted? Again, if the dart be successful, then at the second critical instant, that is, when the whale starts to run, the boat-header and harpooner likewise start to running fore and aft, to the imminent jeopardy of themselves and every one else. It is then they change places, and the headsman, the chief officer of the little craft, takes his proper station in the bows of the boat. Now, I care not who maintains the contrary, but all this is both foolish and unnecessary. The headsman should stay in the bows from first to last. He should both dart the harpoon and the lance, and no rowing whatever should be expected of him, except under circumstances obvious to any fisherman. I know that this would sometimes involve a slight loss of speed in the chase, but long experience in various whalemen of more than one nation has convinced me that in the vast majority of failures in the fishery, it has not by any means been so much the speed of the whale as the before described exhaustion of the harpooner that has caused them. To ensure the greatest efficiency in the dart, the harpooners of this world must start to their feet from out of idleness and not from out of toil. Chapter 63 the crotch. Out of the trunk the branches grow, out of them the twigs. So, in productive subjects, grow the chapters. The crotch alluded to on a previous page deserves independent mention. It is a notched stick of a peculiar form, some two feet in length, which is perpendicularly inserted into the starboard gunwale near the bow, for the purpose of furnishing a rest for the wooden extremity of the harpoon, whose other naked, barbed end slopingly projects from the prow. Thereby the weapon is instantly at hand to its hurler, who snatches it up as readily from its rest as a backwoodsman swings his rifle from the wall. It is customary to have two harpoons reposing in the crotch, respectively called the first and second irons. But these two harpoons, each by its own cord, are both connected with the line, the object being this, to dart them both if possible, one instantly after the other, into the same whale, so that if, in the coming drag, one should draw out, the other may still retain a hold. It is a doubling of the chances. But it very often happens that, owing to the instantaneous, violent, convulsive running of the whale upon receiving the first iron, it becomes impossible for the harpooner, however lightning-like in his movements, to pitch the second iron into him. Nevertheless, as the second iron is already connected with the line, and the line is running, hence that weapon must at all events be anticipatingly tossed out of the boat, somehow and somewhere, else the most terrible jeopardy would involve all hands. Tumbled into the water it accordingly is in such cases, the spare coils of box-line, mentioned in a preceding chapter, making this feat in most instances prudently practicable. 
but this critical act is not always unattended with the saddest and most fatal casualties. Furthermore, you must know that when the second iron is thrown overboard, it thenceforth becomes a dangling, sharp-edged terror, skittishly curvetting about both boat and whale, entangling the lines or cutting them, and making a prodigious sensation in all directions. Nor, in general, is it possible to secure it again, until the whale is fairly captured, and a corpse. Consider, now, how it must be, in the case of four boats, all engaging one unusually strong, active, and knowing whale, when, owing to these qualities in him, as well as to the thousand concurring accidents of such an audacious enterprise, eight or ten loose second irons may be simultaneously dangling about him, for, of course, each boat is supplied with several harpoons to bend on to the line, should the first one be ineffectually darted without recovery. All these particulars are faithfully narrated here, as they will not fail to elucidate several most important, however intricate, passages in scenes hereafter to be painted. End of chapters 59 to 63 Moby Dick, chapters 64 to 67. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 64 to 67. Chapter 64. Stubbs' Supper. Stubb's whale had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm, so, forming a tandem of three boats, we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Pequod. And now, as we eighteen men, with our thirty-six arms and one hundred and eighty thumbs and fingers, slowly toiled hour after hour upon that inert sluggish corpse in the sea, and it seemed hardly to budge at all except at long intervals, good evidence was hereby furnished of the enormousness of the mass we moved. For upon the great canal of Hang Ho, or whatever they call it, in China, four or five laborers on the footpath will draw a bulky freighted junk at the rate of a mile an hour. But this grand argosy we towed heavily forged along, as if laden with pig-lead in bulk." Darkness came on, but three lights up and down in the Pequod's main rigging dimly guided our way, till drawing nearer we saw Ahab dropping one of several more lanterns over the bulwarks. Vacantly eyeing the heaving whale for a moment, he issued the usual orders for securing it for the night, and then handing his lantern to a seaman, went his way into the cabin, and did not come forward again until morning. Though in overseeing the pursuit of this whale, Captain Ahab had evinced his customary activity, to call it so, yet now that the creature was dead, some vague dissatisfaction, or impatience, or despair seemed working in him, as if the sight of that dead body reminded him that Moby Dick was yet to be slain. And, though a thousand other whales were brought to his ship, all that would not one jot advance his grand monomaniac object. Very soon you would have thought from the sound of the Pequod's decks that all hands were preparing to cast anchor in the deep, for heavy chains are being dragged along the deck, and thrust rattling out of the portholes. But by those clanking links the vast corpse itself, not the ship, is to be moored, tied by the head to the stern, and by the tail to the bows, the whale now lies with its black hull close to the vessels, and seen through the darkness of the night, which obscured the spars and rigging aloft, the two, ship and whale, seemed yoked together like colossal bullocks, whereof one reclines while the other remains standing. Footnote. A little item may as well be related here. The strongest and most reliable hold which the ship has upon the whale, when moored alongside, is by the flukes or tail, 
and as from its greater density that part is relatively heavier than any other, excepting the side fins, its flexibility, even in death, causes it to sink low beneath the surface, so that with the hand you cannot get at it from the boat in order to put the chain around it. But this difficulty is ingeniously overcome. A small, strong line is prepared, with a wooden float at its outer end, and a weight in its middle, while the other end is secured to the ship. By adroit management the wooden float is made to rise on the other side of the mass, so that now, having girdled the whale, the chain is readily made to follow suit, and, being slipped along the body, is at last locked fast round the smallest part of the tail, at the point of junction with its broad flukes or lobes. End of footnote. If moody Ahab was now all quiescence, at least so far as could be known on deck, Stubb, his second mate, flushed with conquest, betrayed an unusual but still good-natured excitement. Such an unwanted bustle was he in, that the stead Starbuck, his official superior, quietly resigned to him for the time the sole management of affairs. One small helping cause of all this liveliness in Stubb was soon made strangely manifest. Stubb was a high liver. He was somewhat intemperately fond of the whale, as a flavorish thing to his palate. A stake! A stake! Ere I sleep! You, Dagu, overboard you go, and cut me one from his small! Here, be it known, that though these wild fishermen do not, as a general thing, according to the great military maxim, make the enemy defray the current expenses of the war, at least before receiving the proceeds of the voyage, yet now and then you find some of these Nantucketers who have a genuine relish for that particular part of the sperm whale designated by Stubb, comprising the tapering extremity of the body. About midnight that steak was cut and cooked, and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil, Stubb stoutly stood up to his spermaceti supper at the capstan head, as if that capstan were a sideboard. Nor was Stubb the only banqueter on whale's flesh that night. Mingling their mumblings with his own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks, swarming round the dead leviathan, smackingly feasted on its fatness. The few sleepers below in their bunks were often startled by the sharp slapping of their tails against the hull, within a few inches of the sleepers' hearts. Peering over the side you could just see them, as before you heard them, wallowing in the sullen, black waters, and turning over on their backs as they scooped out huge, globular pieces of the whale of the bigness of a human head. This particular feat of the shark seems all but miraculous. How, at such an apparently unassailable surface, they contrive to gouge out such symmetrical mouthfuls, remains a part of the universal problem of all things. The mark that they thus leave in the whale may best be likened to a hollow made by a carpenter in countersinking for a screw. Though, amid all the smoking horror and diabolism of a sea-fight, sharks will be seen longingly gazing up to the ship's decks, like hungry dogs round a table where red meat is being carved, ready to bolt down every killed man that is tossed to them, and though, while the valiant butchers over the deck-table are thus cannibally carving each other's live meat with carving knives all gilded and tasseled, the sharks, also, with their jewel-hilted mouths, are quarrelsomely carving away under the table at the dead meat, and though, were you to turn the whole affair upside down, it would still be pretty much the same thing, that is to say, a shocking, sharkish business enough for all parties, and though sharks also are the invariable outriders of all slave ships crossing the Atlantic, symmetrically trotting alongside to be handy in case a parcel is to be carried anywhere, or a dead slave to be decently buried, and though one or two other like instances might be set down, touching the set terms, places, and occasions when sharks do most socially congregate and most hilariously feast, yet there is no conceivable time or occasion when you will find them in such countless numbers, 
and in gayer or more jovial spirits than around a dead sperm whale moored by night to a whale ship at sea if you have never seen that sight then suspend your decision about the propriety of devil worship and the expediency of conciliating the devil but as yet stubb heeded not the mumblings of the banquet that was going on so nigh him no more than the sharks heeded the smacking of his own epicurean lips cook cook where's that old fleece he cried at length widening his legs still further as if to form a more secure base for his supper and at the same time darting his fork into the dish as if stabbing with his lance cook you cook sail this way cook the old black not in any very high glee at having been previously roused from his warm hammock at a most unseasonable hour came shambling along from his galley for like many old blacks there was something the matter with his knee pans which he did not keep well scoured like his other pans this old fleece as they called him came shuffling and limping along assisting his step with his tongs which after a clumsy fashion were made of straightened iron hoops this old ebony floundered along and in obedience to the word of command came to a dead stop on the opposite side of stubb's sideboard when with both hands folded before him and resting on his two-legged cane he bowed his arched back still further over at the same time sideways inclining his head so as to bring his best ear into play cook said stubb rapidly lifting a rather reddish morsel to his mouth don't you think this steak is rather overdone you've been beating this steak too much cook it's too tender don't i always say that to be good a whale steak must be tough there are those sharks now over the side don't you see they prefer it tough and rare what a shindy they are kicking up cook go and talk to em tell em they are welcome to help themselves civilly and in moderation but they must keep quiet blast me if i can hear my own voice away cook and deliver my message here take this lantern snatching one from his sideboard now then go and preach to em sullenly taking the offered lantern old fleece limped across the deck to the bulwarks and then with one hand dropping his light low over the sea so as to get a good view of his congregation with the other hand he solemnly flourished his tongs and leaning far over the side in a mumbling voice began addressing the sharks while stubb softly crawling behind overheard all that was said fellow critters i's ordered here to say dat you must stop dat damn noise there you hear stop dat damn smackin of de lips massa stubb say dat you can fill your damn bellies up to de hatchings but by gore you must stop dat damn racket cook here interposed stubb accompanying the word with a sudden slap on the shoulder cook why damn your eyes you mustn't swear that way when you're preaching that's no way to convert sinners cook who dat then preach to him yourself sullenly turning to go no cook go on go on well then beloved fellow critters right exclaimed stubb approvingly coax em to it try that and fleece continued though you is all sharks and by nature very voracious yet i say to you fellow critters dat dat voraciousness top dat damn slappin of de tail how you tink to hear s'pose you keep up such de damn slappin and bitin dere cook cried stubb collaring him i won't have that swearing talk to em gentlemanly once more the sermon proceeded your voraciousness fellow critters i don't blame you so much for that is nature and can't be helped but to govern that wicked nature that is the pint you is sharks sartin but if you govern the shark in you why then you be angel for all angel is nothing more than the shark well governed now look here brethren just try once to be civil a helpin yourselves from dat whale 
Don't be tearing to blubber out o' your neighbor's mouth, I say. Is not one shark dood right as tudder to dat whale? And by gore, none of you has the right to dat whale. Dat whale belong to someone else. I know some of you has berry brig mouth, brigger than others. But den de big mouth sometimes had the small bellies, so that the brigness of de mouth is not to swallow with, but to bit off de blubber for the small fry of sharks that can't get into the scrounge to help themselves. Well done, old fleece, cried Stubb. That's Christianity. Go on. No use going on. De damn willins will keep a scourging and a slapping each other, Massa Stubb. They don't hear one word. No use of preaching to such damn gluttons as you call em, till their bellies is full, and their bellies is bottomless. And when they do get em full, they won't hear you then, for then they sink in the sea, go fast asleep on de coral, and can't hear nothing at all, no more, forever and ever. Upon my soul I am about of the same opinion. So give the benediction, Fleece, and I'll away to my supper. Upon this, Fleece, holding both hands over the fishy mob, raised his shrill voice and cried, Cursed fellow critters, kick up the damnedest row as ever you can, fill your damn bellies till they burst, and then die. Now cook, said Stubb, resuming his supper at the capstan. Stand just where you stood before there, over against me, and pay particular attention. All attention, said Fleece, again stooping over his tongs in the desired position. Well, said Stubb, helping himself freely meanwhile, I shall now go back to the subject of this steak. In the first place, how old are you, Cook? What dat to do with the take? said the old black testily. Silence! How old are you, Cook? About ninety, they say, he gloomily muttered. And you have lived in this world hard upon one hundred years, Cook, and don't know yet how to cook a whale steak, rapidly bolting another mouthful at the last word, so that morsel seemed a continuation of the question. Where were you born, Cook? Hind a hatchway, in ferry boat, going over to Roanoke. Born in a ferry boat? That's queer, too. But I want to know what country you were born in, Cook. "'Didn't I say to Roanoke country?' he cried sharply. "'No, you didn't, Cook. "'But I'll tell you what I'm coming to, Cook. "'You must go home and be born over again. "'You don't know how to cook a whale steak yet.' "'Bress my soul if I cook another one,' he growled, "'angrily turning round to depart. "'Come back here, Cook. "'Here, hand me those tongs. Now take that bit of steak there, and tell me if you think that steak cooked as it should be. Take it, I say, holding the tongs toward him. Take it, and taste it. Faintly smacking his withered lips over it for a moment, the old negro muttered, Best cooked take I ever taste. Juicy, very juicy. Cook, said Stubb, squaring himself once more, do you belong to the church? "'Passed one once in Cape Town,' said the old man sullenly. "'And you have once in your life passed a holy church in Cape Town, "'where you doubtless overheard a holy parson "'addressing his hearers as his beloved fellow creatures, have you, Cook? "'And yet you come here and tell me such a dreadful lie as you did just now, eh?' said Stubb. "'Where do you expect to go to, Cook?' "'Go to bed very soon.' he mumbled, half turning as he spoke. Avast! Heave to! I mean, when you die, Cook. It's an awful question. Now what's your answer? When this old brack man dies, said the negro slowly, changing his whole air and demeanor, he himself won't go nowhere, but some blessed angel will come and fetch him. Fetch him? How? In a coach and four, as they fetched Elijah? And fetch him where? Up there, said Fleece, holding his tongs straight over his head, and keeping it there very solemnly. So then, you expect to go up into our main top, do you, Cook, when you are dead? 
But don't you know the higher you climb, the colder it gets? Main top, eh? Didn't say that at all, said Fleece, again in the sulks. You said up there, didn't you? And now look yourself and see where your tongs are pointing. But perhaps you expect to get into heaven by crawling through the lubber's hole, Cook. But no, no, Cook, you don't get there except you go the regular way, round by the rigging. It's a ticklish business, but it must be done, or else it's no go. But none of us are in heaven yet. Drop your tongs, Cook, and hear my orders, do you hear? Hold your hat in one hand, and clap the other atop your heart, when I'm giving my orders, Cook. What? That your heart, there? That's your gizzard! Aloft, aloft! That's it, now you have it. Hold it there now, and pay attention. All attention, said the old black, with both hands placed as desired, vainly wriggling his grizzled head as if to get both ears in front at one and the same time. Well then, cook, you see this whale steak of yours was so very bad that I have put it out of sight as soon as possible. You see that, don't you? Well, for the future, when you cook another whale steak for my private table here, the capstan, I'll tell you what to do, so as not to spoil it by overdoing. Hold the steak in one hand, and show a live coal to it with the other. That done, dish it, do you hear? And now tomorrow, cook, when we are cutting in the fish, be sure you stand by to get the tips of his fins, have them put in pickle. As for the ends of the flukes, have them soused, cook. There, now you may go. But Fleece had hardly got three paces off when he was recalled. Cook, give me cutlets for supper tomorrow night in the mid-watch. Do you hear? Away you sail, then. Hello! Stop! Make a bow before you go. Avast! Heaving again! Whale balls for breakfast, don't forget! Wish, by gore, whale eat him, stead of him eat whale. I'm breast if he ain't more of shark than massa shark hisself, muttered the old man, limping away, with which sage ejaculation he went to his hammock. Chapter 65 the whale as a dish. That mortal man should feed upon the creature that feeds his lamp, and, like Stubb, eat him by his own light, as you may say, this seems so outlandish a thing that one must needs go a little into the history and philosophy of it. It is upon record that three centuries ago the tongue of the right whale was esteemed a great delicacy in France, and commanded large prices there. Also, that in Henry the Eighth's time, a certain cook of the court obtained a handsome reward for inventing an admirable sauce to be eaten with barbecued porpoises, which, you remember, are a species of whale. Porpoises, indeed, are to this day considered fine eating. The meat is made into balls about the size of billiard balls, and being well seasoned and spiced, might be taken for turtle balls or veal balls. The old monks of Dunfermline were very fond of them. They had a great porpoise grant from the crown. The fact is that, among his hunters at least, the whale would by all hands be considered a noble dish, were there not so much of him. But when you come to sit down before a meat pie nearly one hundred feet long, it takes away your appetite. Only the most unprejudiced of men, like Stubb, nowadays partake of cooked whales. But the Eskimos are not so fastidious. We all know how they live upon whales, and have rare old vintages of prime old train oil. Zogranda, one of their most famous doctors, recommends strips of blubber for infants as being exceedingly juicy and nourishing. And this reminds me that certain Englishmen, who long ago were accidentally left in Greenland by a whaling vessel, that these men actually lived for several months on the moldy scraps of whales, which had been left ashore after trying out the blubber. Among the Dutch whalemen these scraps are called fritters, which indeed they greatly resemble, being brown and crisp, and smelling something like old Amsterdam housewives' doughnuts or oily cooks when fresh. 
they have such an edible look that the most self-denying stranger can hardly keep his hands off. But what further depreciates the whale as a civilized dish is his exceeding richness. He is the great prize ox of the sea, too fat to be delicately good. Look at his hump, which would be as fine eating as the buffalo's, which is esteemed a rare dish, were it not such a solid pyramid of fat. But the spermaceti itself, how bland and creamy that is, like the transparent half-jellied white meat of a coconut in the third month of its growth, yet far too rich to supply a substitute for butter. Nevertheless, many whalemen have a method of absorbing it into some other substance, and then partaking of it. In the long try-watches of the night it is a common thing for the seamen to dip their ship-biscuit into the huge oil-pots and let them fry there a while. Many a good supper have I thus made. In the case of a small sperm-whale, the brains are accounted a fine dish. The casket of the skull is broken into with an axe, and the two plump, whitish lobes being withdrawn, precisely resembling two large puddings, they are then mixed with flour and cooked into a most delectable mess, in flavor somewhat resembling calves' heads, which is quite a dish among some epicures. And every one knows that some young bucks among the epicures, by continually dining upon calves' brains, by and by get to have a little brains of their own, so as to be able to tell a calf's head from their own heads, which indeed requires uncommon discrimination. And that is the reason why a young buck with an intelligent-looking calf's head before him is somehow one of the saddest sights you can see. The head looks a sort of reproachfully at him, with an et tu brute expression. It is not perhaps entirely because the whale is so excessively unctuous that landsmen seem to regard the eating of him with abhorrence. That appears to result in some way from the consideration before mentioned, i.e., that a man should eat a newly murdered thing of the sea, and eat it too by its own light. But no doubt the first man that ever murdered an ox was regarded as a murderer. Perhaps he was hung, and if he had been put on his trial by oxen, he certainly would have been, and he certainly deserved it, if any murderer does. Go to the meat market of a Saturday night and see the crowds of live bipeds staring up at the long rows of dead quadrupeds. Does not that sight take a tooth out of the cannibal's jaw? Cannibals? Who is not a cannibal? I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the Fiji that salted down a lean missionary in his cellar against a coming famine, it will be more tolerable for that provident Fiji, I say, in the day of judgment, than for thee, civilized and enlightened gourmand, who nailest geese to the ground and feastest on their bloated livers in thy pâté de foie gras. But Stubb, he eats the whale by its own light, does he? And that is adding insult to injury, is it? Look at your knife-handle there, my civilized and enlightened gourmand, dining off that roast beef. What is that handle made of? What but the bones of the brother of the very ox you are eating? And what do you pick your teeth with after devouring that fat goose? With a feather of the same fowl, and with what quill did the secretary of the Society for the Suppression of Cruelty to Ganders formally indict his circulars? It is only within the last month or two that that society passed a resolution to patronize nothing but steel pens. Chapter 66 The Shark Massacre when, in the southern fishery, a captured sperm whale, after long and weary toil, is brought alongside late at night, it is not, as a general thing at least, customary to proceed at once to the business of cutting him in, for that business is an exceedingly laborious one, is not very soon completed, and requires all hands to set about it. Therefore the common usage is to take in all sail, lash the helm a lee, and then send every one below to his hammock till daylight, with the reservation that until that time anchor watches shall be kept, 
that is two and two for an hour each couple the crew in rotation shall mount the deck to see that all goes well but sometimes especially upon the line in the pacific this plan will not answer at all because such incalculable hosts of sharks gather round the moored carcass that were he left so for six hours say on a stretch little more than the skeleton would be visible by morning in most other parts of the ocean however where these fish do not so largely abound their wondrous veracity can be at times considerably diminished by vigorously stirring them up with sharp whaling spades a procedure notwithstanding which in some instances only seems to tickle them into still greater activity but it was not thus in the present case with the pequod sharks though to be sure any man unaccustomed to such sights to have looked over her side that night would have almost thought the whole round sea was one huge cheese and those sharks the maggots in it nevertheless upon stubb setting the anchor watch after his supper was concluded and when accordingly queequeg and a forecastle seaman came on deck no small excitement was created among the sharks for immediately suspending the cutting stages over the side and lowering three lanterns so that they cast long gleams of light over the turbid seas these two mariners darting their long whaling spades kept up an incessant murdering of the sharks by striking the keen steel deep into their skulls seemingly their only vital part footnote the whaling spade used for cutting in is made of the very best steel is about the bigness of a man's spread hand and in general shape corresponds to the garden implement after which it is named only its sides are perfectly flat and its upper end considerably narrower than the lower this weapon is always kept as sharp as possible and when being used is occasionally honed just like a razor in its socket a stiff pole from twenty to thirty feet long is inserted for a handle End of footnote. But in the foamy confusion of their mixed and struggling hosts, the marksmen could not always hit their mark, and this brought about new revelations of the incredible ferocity of the foe. They viciously snapped, not only at each other's disembowelments, but, like flexible bows, bent round and bit their own, till those entrails seemed swallowed over and over again by the same mouth, to be oppositely voided by the gaping wound nor was this all it was unsafe to meddle with the corpses and ghosts of these creatures a sort of generic or pantheistic vitality seemed to lurk in their very joints and bones after what might be called the individual life had departed killed and hoisted on deck for the sake of his skin one of these sharks almost took poor queequeg's hand off when he tried to shut down the dead lid of his murderous jaw Queequeg no care what God made him shark, said the savage, agonizingly lifting his hand up and down, whether Fiji God or Nantucket God, but to God what made shark must be one damn engine. Chapter 67 Cutting In It was a Saturday night, and such a Sabbath as followed ex officio professors of sabbath breaking are all whalemen the ivory pequod was turned into what seemed a shamble every sailor a butcher you would have thought we were offering up ten thousand red oxen to the sea gods in the first place the enormous cutting tackles among other ponderous things comprising a cluster of blocks generally painted green and which no single man can possibly lift this vast bunch of grapes was swayed up to the main top and firmly lashed to the lower masthead the strongest point anywhere above a ship's deck the end of the hawser-like rope winding through these intricacies was then conducted to the windlass and the huge lower block of the tackles was swung over the whale to this block the great blubber hook weighing some one hundred pounds was attached and now suspended in stages over the side starbuck and stubb the mates armed with their long spades began cutting a hole in the body for the insertion of the hook just above the nearest of the two side fins 
This done, a broad semicircular line is cut round the hole, the hook is inserted, and the main body of the crew, striking up a wild chorus, now commence heaving in one dense crowd at the windlass, when instantly the entire ship careens over on her side, every bolt in her starts like the nail-heads of an old house in frosty weather, she trembles, quivers, and nods her frighted mastheads to the sky. More and more she leans over to the whale, while every gasping heave of the windlass is answered by a helping heave from the billows, till at last a swift startling snap is heard. With a great swash the ship rolls upward and backwards from the whale, and the triumphant tackle rises into sight, dragging after it the disengaged semicircular end of the first strip of blubber. Now, as the blubber envelops the whale precisely as the rind does an orange, so it is stripped off from the body precisely as an orange is sometimes stripped by spiralizing it. For the strain constantly kept up by the windlass continually keeps the whale rolling over and over in the water, and as the blubber in one strip uniformly peels off along the line called the scarf, simultaneously cut by the spades of Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, and just as fast as it is thus peeled off, and indeed by that very act itself, it is all the time being hoisted higher and higher aloft, till its upper end grazes the main top. The men at the windlass then cease heaving, and for a moment or two the prodigious blood-dripping mass sways to and fro as if let down from the sky, and every one present must take good heed to dodge it when it swings, else it may box his ears and pitch him headlong overboard. One of the attending harpooners now advances with a long keen weapon called a boarding sword and, watching his chance, he dexterously slices out a considerable hole in the lower part of the swaying mass. Into this hole, the end of the second alternating great tackle is then hooked, so as to retain a hold upon the blubber, in order to prepare for what follows. Whereupon this accomplished swordsman, warning all hands to stand off, once more makes a scientific dash at the mass, and with a few sidelong, desperate, lunging slicings, severs it completely in twain, so that while the short lower part is still fast, the long upper strip, called a blanket piece, swings clear, and is all ready for lowering. The heavers forward now resume their song, and while the one tackle is peeling and hoisting a second strip from the whale, the other is slowly slackened away, and down goes the first strip through the main hatchway right beneath, into an unfurnished parlour called the Blubber Room. Into this twilight apartment, sundry nimble hands keep coiling away the long blanket piece as if it were a great live mass of pleated serpents. And thus the work proceeds, the two tackles hoisting and lowering simultaneously, both whale and windlass heaving, the heavers singing, the blubber room gentlemen coiling, the mates scarfing, the ships straining, and all hands swearing occasionally, by way of assuaging the general friction. End of chapter 64 to 67 Moby Dick Chapter 68 to 71. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapter 68 to 71. Chapter 68 The Blanket. I have given no small attention to that not unvexed subject, the skin of the whale. I have had controversies about it with experienced whalemen afloat, and learned naturalists ashore. My original opinion remains unchanged, but it is only an opinion. The question is, what and where is the skin of the whale? Already you know what his blubber is. That blubber is something of the consistence of firm, close-grained beef, 
but tougher, more elastic and compact, and ranges from eight or ten to twelve and fifteen inches in thickness. Now, however preposterous it may at first seem to talk of any creature's skin as being of that sort of consistence and thickness, yet in point of fact these are no arguments against such a presumption, because you cannot raise any other dense enveloping layer from the whale's body but that same blubber, and the outermost enveloping layer of any animal, if reasonably dense, what can that be but the skin? True, from the unmarred dead body of the whale, you may scrape off with your hand an infinitely thin, transparent substance, somewhat resembling the thinnest shreds of isinglass, only it is almost as flexible and soft as satin, that is, previous to being dried, when it not only contracts and thickens, but becomes rather hard and brittle. I have several such dried bits, which I use for marks in my whale-books. It is transparent, as I said before, and being laid upon the printed page, I have sometimes pleased myself with fancying it exerted a magnifying influence. At any rate, it is pleasant to read about whales through their own spectacles, as you may say. But what I am driving at here is this. The same infinitely thin isinglass substance, which, I admit, invests the entire body of the whale, is not so much to be regarded as the skin of the creature, as the skin of the skin, so to speak. For it were simply ridiculous to say that the proper skin of the tremendous whale is thinner and more tender than the skin of a newborn child. But no more of this. Assuming the blubber to be the skin of the whale, then, when this skin, as in the case of a very large sperm whale, will yield the bulk of one hundred barrels of oil, and when it is considered that, in quantity, or rather weight, that oil, in its express state, is only three-fourths, and not the entire substance of the coat, some idea may hence be had of the enormousness of that animated mass, a mere part of whose mere integument yields such a lake of liquid as that. Reckoning ten barrels to the ton, you have ten tons for the net weight of only three-quarters of the stuff of the whale's skin. In life, the visible surface of the sperm whale is not the least among the many marvels he presents. Almost invariably, it is all over obliquely crossed and recrossed with numberless straight marks in thick array, something like those in the finest Italian line engravings. But these marks do not seem to be impressed upon the isinglass substance above mentioned, but seem to be seen through it, as if they were engraved upon the body itself. Nor is this all. In some instances, to the quick, observant eye, those linear marks, as in a veritable engraving, but afford the ground for far other delineations. These are hieroglyphical, that is, if you call those mysterious ciphers on the walls of the pyramids hieroglyphics, then that is the proper word to use in the present connection. By my retentive memory of the hieroglyphics upon one sperm whale in particular, I was much struck with a plate representing the old Indian characters chiseled on the famous hieroglyphic palisades on the banks of the upper Mississippi. Like those mystic rocks, too, the mystic-marked whale remains undecipherable. This allusion to the Indian rocks reminds me of another thing. Besides all the other phenomena which the exterior of the sperm whale presents, he not seldom displays the back, and more especially his flanks, effaced in great part of the regular linear appearance by reason of numerous rude scratches, altogether of an irregular, random aspect. I should say that those New England rocks on the sea-coast, which Agassiz imagines to bear the marks of violent scraping contact with vast floating icebergs, I should say that those rocks must not a little resemble the sperm whale in this particular. It also seems to me that such scratches in the whale are probably made by hostile contact with other whales, for I have most remarked them in the large, full-grown bulls of the species. A word or two more concerning this matter of the skin or blubber of the whale. 
It has already been said that it is stripped from him in long pieces called blanket pieces. Like most sea terms, this one is very happy and significant, for the whale is indeed wrapped up in his blubber as in a real blanket or counterpane, or still better, an Indian poncho slipped over his head and skirting his extremity. It is by reason of this cosy blanketing of his body that the whale is enabled to keep himself comfortable in all weathers, in all seas, times, and tides. What would become of a Greenland whale, say, in those shuddering icy seas of the north, if unsupplied with his cosy surtout? True, other fish are found exceedingly brisk in those hyperborean waters, but these, be it observed, are your cold-blooded, lungless fish, whose very bellies are refrigerators, creatures that warm themselves under the lee of an iceberg, as a traveller in winter would bask before an inn-fire whereas, like man, the whale has lungs and warm blood. Freeze his blood, and he dies. How wonderful it is, then, except after explanation, that this great monster, to whom corporeal warmth is as indispensable as it is to man, how wonderful that he should be found at home, immersed to his lips for life in those arctic waters, where, when seamen fall overboard, they are sometimes found months afterward, perpendicularly frozen into the hearts of fields of ice, as a fly is found glued in amber. But more surprising it is to know, as has been proved by experiment, that the blood of a polar whale is warmer than that of a Borneo negro in summer. It does seem to me that herein we see the rare virtue of a strong individual vitality, and the rare virtue of thick walls, and the rare virtue of interior spaciousness. Oh, man, admire and model thyself after the whale. Do thou, too, remain warm among ice. Do thou, too, live in this world without being of it. Be cool at the equator. Keep thy blood fluid at the pole. Like the great dome of St. Peter's, and like the great whale, retain, O oh man, in all seasons, a temperature of thine own. But how easy, and how hopeless, to teach these fine things! Of erections, how few are domed like St. Peter's! Of creatures, how few vast as the whale! Chapter 69 The Funeral Haul in the chains! Let the carcass go astern! The vast tackles have now done their duty. The peeled white body of the beheaded whale flashes like a marble sepulchre. Though changed in hue, it has not perceptibly lost anything in bulk. It is still colossal. Slowly it floats more and more away, the water round it torn and splashed by the insatiate sharks, and the air above vexed with rapacious flights of screaming fowls, whose beaks are like so many insulting poniards in the whale. The vast, white, headless phantom floats further and further from the ship, and every rod that it so floats, what seems square roods of sharks and cubic roods of fowls augment the murderous din. For hours and hours from the almost stationary ship that hideous sight is seen. Beneath the unclouded and mild azure sky, upon the fair face of the pleasant sea, Wafted by the joyous breezes, that great mass of death floats on and on, till lost in infinite perspectives. There's a most doleful and most mocking funeral. The sea vultures all in pious mourning, the air sharks all punctiliously in black or speckled. In life but few of them would have helped the whale, I ween, if peradventure he had needed it but upon the banquet of his funeral they most piously do pounce. O oh, horrible vulturism of earth, from which not the mightiest whale is free! Nor is this the end. Desecrated as the body is, a vengeful ghost survives and hovers over it to scare. Espied by some timid man-of-war or blundering discovery vessel from afar, when the distance obscuring the swarming fowls nevertheless still shows the white mass floating in the sun, and the white spray heaving high against it, 
straightway the whale's unharming corpse with trembling fingers is set down in the log shoals rocks and breakers hereabouts beware and for years afterwards perhaps ships shun the place leaping over it as silly sheep leap over a vacuum because their leader originally leaped there when a stick was held there's your law of precedence there's your utility of traditions there's the story of your obstinate survival of old beliefs never bottomed on the earth and not now even hovering in the air there's orthodoxy thus while in life the great whale's body may have been a real terror to his foes in his death his ghost becomes a powerless panic to the world are you a believer in ghosts my friend there are other ghosts than the cock lane one and far deeper men than dr johnson who believe in them chapter seventy the sphinx it should not have been omitted that previous to completely stripping the body of the leviathan he was beheaded now the beheading of the sperm whale is a scientific anatomical feat upon which experienced whale surgeons very much pride themselves and not without reason consider that the whale has nothing that can properly be called a neck on the contrary where his head and body seem to join there in that very place is the thickest part of him remember also that the surgeon must operate from above some eight or ten feet intervening between him and his subject and that subject almost hidden in a discoloured rolling and oftentimes tumultuous and bursting sea bear in mind too that under these untoward circumstances he has to cut many feet deep in the flesh and in that subterraneous matter without so much as getting one single peep into the ever contracting gash thus made he must skilfully steer clear of all adjacent interdicted parts and exactly divide the spine at a critical point hard by its insertion into the skull do you not marvel then at stubb's boast that he demanded but ten minutes to behead a sperm whale when first severed the head is dropped astern and held there by a cable till the body is stripped that done if it belong to a small whale it is hoisted on deck to be deliberately disposed of but with a full-grown leviathan this is impossible for the sperm whale's head embraces nearly one-third of his entire bulk and completely to suspend such a burden as that even by the immense tackles of a whaler this were as vain a thing as to attempt weighing a dutch barn in jeweller's scales the pequod's whale being decapitated and the body stripped the head was hoisted against the ship's side about halfway out of the sea so that it might yet in great part be buoyed up by its native element and there with the strained craft steeply leaning over to it by reason of the enormous downward drag from the lower masthead and every yard-arm on that side projecting like a crane over the waves, there that blood-dripping head hung to the Pequod's waist, like the giant Holofernes from the girdle of Judith. When this last task was accomplished it was noon, and the seamen went below to their dinner. Silence reigned over the before tumultuous but now deserted deck. An intense copper calm, like a universal yellow lotus, was more and more unfolding its noiseless, measureless leaves upon the sea. A short space elapsed, and up into this noiselessness came Ahab, alone from his cabin. Taking a few turns on the quarter-deck, he paused to gaze over the side. Then, slowly getting into the main chains, he took Stubb's long spade, still remaining there after the whale's decapitation and striking it into the lower part of the half-suspended mass placed its other end crutchwise under one arm and so stood leaning over with eyes attentively fixed on this head it was a black and hooded head and hanging there in the midst of so intense a calm it seemed the sphinxes in the desert speak thou vast and venerable head muttered ahab which, though ungarnished with a beard, yet here and there looks hoary with mosses. 
Speak, mighty head, and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. Of all divers thou hast dived the deepest. That head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid this world's foundations. Where unrecorded names and navies rust, and untold hopes and anchors rot, where in her murderous hold this frigate earth is ballasted with bones of millions of the drowned, there in that awful waterland, there was thy most familiar home. Thou hast been where bell or diver never went, hast slept by many a sailor's side where sleepless mothers would give their lives to lay them down. Thou sawest the locked lovers when leaping from their flaming ship, Heart to heart they sank beneath the exulting wave, True to each other when heaven seemed false to them. Thou sawest the murdered mate when tossed by pirates from the midnight deck, For hours he fell into the deeper midnight of the insatiate maw, And his murderers still sailed on unharmed, While swift lightnings shivered the neighboring ship That would have borne a righteous husband to outstretched longing arms. O oh, head, thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham, and not one syllable is thine. Sail ho! cried a triumphant voice from the main masthead. Ay, well now, that's cheering, cried Ahab, suddenly erecting himself while whole thunderclouds swept aside from his brow. That lively cry upon this deadly calm might almost convert a better man. Where away? Three points on the starboard bow, sir, and bringing down her breeze to us. Better and better, man. Would now St. Paul would come along that way, and to my breezelessness bring his breeze. O oh, nature, and O oh, soul of man, how far beyond all utterances are your linked analogies! Not the smallest atom stirs or lives on matter, but has its cunning duplicate in mind. Chapter 71 The Jeroboam Story Hand in hand, ship and breeze blew on, but the breeze came faster than the ship, and soon the Pequod began to rock. By and by, through the glass, the stranger's boats and manned mastheads proved her a whale-ship, but as she was so far to windward and shooting by, apparently making a passage to some other ground, the Pequod could not hope to reach her, so the signal was set to see what response would be made. Here be it said that, like the vessels of military marines, the ships of the American whale fleet have each a private signal, all which signals being collected in a book with the names of the respective vessels attached, and every captain provided with it. Thereby the whale commanders are enabled to recognize each other upon the ocean, even at considerable distances and with no small facility. The Pequod's signal was at last responded to by the strangers setting her own, which proved the ship to be the Jeroboam of Nantucket. Squaring her yards, she bore down, ranged a beam under the Pequod's lee, and lowered a boat. It soon drew nigh, but as the side ladder was being rigged by Starbuck's order to accommodate the visiting captain, the stranger in question waved his hand from the boat's stern, in token of that proceeding being entirely unnecessary. It turned out that the Jeroboam had a malignant epidemic on board, and that Mayhew, her captain, was fearful of infecting the Pequod's company. For though himself and boat's crew remained untainted, and though his ship was half a rifle shot off, and an incorruptible sea and air rolling and flowing between, yet conscientiously adhering to the timid quarantine of the land, he peremptorily refused to come into direct contact with the Pequod. But this did by no means prevent all communications. Preserving an interval of some few yards between itself and the ship, the Jeroboam's boat, by the occasional use of its oars, contrived to keep parallel to the Pequod, as she heavily forged through the sea, for by this time it blew very fresh, with her main topsail aback. 
though indeed, at times, by the sudden onset of a large rolling wave, the boat would be pushed some way ahead, but would be soon skillfully brought to her proper bearings again. Subject to this, and other the like interruptions now and then, a conversation was sustained between the two parties, but at intervals not without still another interruption of a very different sort. Pulling an oar in the Jeroboam's boat was a man of singular appearance, even in that wild whaling life where individual notabilities make up all totalities. He was a small, short, youngish man, sprinkled all over his face with freckles, and wearing redundant yellow hair. A long-skirted, cabalistically cut coat of a faded walnut tinge enveloped him, the overlapping sleeves of which were rolled up on his wrists. A deep, settled, fanatic delirium was in his eyes. So soon as this figure had been first descried, Stubb had exclaimed, "'That's he! That's he! The long-togged scaramouche the town hose company told us of!' Stubb here alluded to a strange story told of the Jeroboam, and a certain man among her crew, some time previous when the Pequod spoke the town ho. According to this account, and what was subsequently learned, it seemed that the scaramouche in question had gained a wonderful ascendancy over almost everybody in the Jeroboam. His story was this. He had originally been nurtured among the crazy society of Neskyuna Shakers, where he had been a great prophet, in their cracked secret meetings, having several times descended from heaven by way of a trap-door, announcing the speedy opening of the seventh vial, which he carried in his vest pocket, but which, instead of containing gunpowder, was supposed to be charged with laudanum. A strange apostolic whim having seized him, he had left Neskyuna for Nantucket, where, with that cunning peculiar to craziness, he assumed a steady, common-sense exterior, and offered himself as a green-hand candidate for the Jeroboam's whaling voyage. They engaged him, but straight away upon the ship's getting out of sight of land, his insanity broke out in a freshet. He announced himself as the archangel Gabriel, and commanded the captain to jump overboard. He published his manifesto, whereby he set himself forth as the deliverer of the isles of the sea, and vicar-general of all Oceanica. The unflinching earnestness with which he declared these things, the dark, daring play of his sleepless, excited imagination, and all the preternatural terrors of real delirium, united to invest this Gabriel in the minds of the majority of the ignorant crew with an atmosphere of sacredness. Moreover, they were afraid of him. As such a man, however, was not of much practical use in the ship, especially as he refused to work except when he pleased, the incredulous captain would fain have been rid of him, but apprised that that individual's intention was to land him in the first convenient port, the archangel forthwith opened all his seals and vials, devoting the ship and all hands to unconditional perdition, in case this intention was carried out. So strongly did he work upon his disciples among the crew, that at last in a body they went to the captain and told him, if Gabriel was sent from the ship, not a man of them would remain. He was therefore forced to relinquish his plan. Nor would they permit Gabriel to be any way maltreated, say or do what he would, so that it came to pass that Gabriel had the complete freedom of the ship, the consequence of all this was that the archangel cared little or nothing for the captain and mates, and since the epidemic had broken out, he carried a higher hand than ever, declaring that the plague, as he called it, was at his sole command, nor should it be stayed but according to his good pleasure. The sailors, mostly poor devils, cringed, and some of them fawned before him in obedience to his instructions, sometimes rendering him personal homage as to a god. Such things may seem incredible, but however wondrous, they are true. Nor is the history of fanatics half so striking in respect to the measureless self-deception of the fanatic himself, as his measureless power of deceiving and bedeviling so many others. But it is time to return to the Pequod. 
I fear not thy epidemic, man, said Ahab from the bulwarks to Captain Mayhew, who stood in the boat's stern. Come on board. But now Gabriel started to his feet. Think, think of the fevers, yellow and bilious. Beware of the horrible plague. Gabriel, Gabriel, cried Captain Mayhew, thou must either... But that instant a headlong wave shot the boat far ahead, and its seethings drowned all speech. "'Hast thou seen the white whale?' demanded Ahab, when the boat drifted back. "'Think, think of thy whale-boat, stoven and sunk! Beware of the horrible tale! "'I tell thee again, Gabriel, that—' But again the boat tore ahead as if dragged by fiends. Nothing was said for some moments, while a succession of riotous waves rolled by, which, by one of those occasional caprices of the seas, were tumbling, not heaving it. Meantime the hoisted sperm-whale's head jogged about very violently, and Gabriel was seen eyeing it with rather more apprehensiveness than his archangel nature seemed to warrant. When this interlude was over, Captain Mayhew began a dark story concerning Moby Dick, not, however, without frequent interruptions from Gabriel, whenever his name was mentioned, and the crazy sea that seemed leagued with him. It seemed that the Jeroboam had not long left home, when, upon speaking a whale-ship, her people were reliably apprised of the existence of Moby Dick, and the havoc he had made. Greedily sucking in this intelligence, Gabriel solemnly warned the captain against attacking the white whale, in case the monster should be seen, in his gibbering insanity, pronouncing the white whale to be no less a being than the shaker God incarnated, the shakers receiving the Bible. But when some year or two afterward Moby Dick was fairly sighted from the mastheads, Macy, the chief mate, burned with ardor to encounter him and the captain himself being not unwilling to let him have the opportunity, despite all the archangel's denunciations and forewarnings, Macy succeeded in persuading five men to man his boat. With them he pushed off, and, after much weary pulling, and many perilous, unsuccessful onsets, he at last succeeded in getting one iron fast. Meantime Gabriel, ascending to the main royal masthead, was tossing one arm in frantic gestures, and hurling forth prophecies of speedy doom to the sacrilegious assailants of his divinity. Now, while Macy, the mate, was standing up in his boat's bow, and with all the reckless energy of his tribe was venting his wild exclamations upon the whale, and essaying to get a fair chance for his poised lance, Lo, a broad white shadow rose from the sea, by its quick fanning motion temporarily taking the breath out of the bodies of the oarsmen. Next instant the luckless mate, so full of furious life, was smitten bodily into the air, and, making a long arc in his descent, fell into the sea at a distance of about fifty yards. Not a chip of the boat was harmed, nor a hair of any oarsman's head but the mate forever sank. It is well to parenthesize here that, of the fatal accidents in the sperm-whale fishery, this kind is perhaps almost as frequent as any. Sometimes nothing is injured but the man who is thus annihilated. Oftener the boat's bow is knocked off, or the thigh-board, in which the headsman stands, is torn from its place and accompanies the body. But strangest of all is the circumstance, that in more instances than one, when the body has been recovered, not a single mark of violence is discernible, the man being stark dead. The whole calamity, with the falling form of Macy, was plainly descried from the ship. Raising a piercing shriek, The vile! The vile! Gabriel called off the terror-stricken crew from the further hunting of the whale. This terrible event clothed the archangel with added influence, because his credulous disciples believed that he had specifically foreannounced it, instead of only making a general prophecy, which any one might have done, and so have chanced to hit one of many marks in the wide margin allowed. He became a nameless terror to the ship. 
Mayhew having concluded his narration, Ahab put such questions to him that the stranger captain could not forbear inquiring whether he intended to hunt the white whale if opportunity should offer. To which Ahab answered, Aye. Straightway then, Gabriel once more started to his feet, glaring upon the old man, and vehemently exclaimed with downward pointed finger, Think! Think of the blasphemer! Dead and down there! Beware of the blasphemer's end! Ahab stolidly turned aside, then said to Mayhew, Captain, I have just bethought me of my letter-bag. There is a letter for one of thy officers, if I mistake it not. Starbuck, look over the bag. Every whale-ship takes out a goodly number of letters for various ships, whose delivery to the persons to whom they may be addressed depends upon the mere chance of encountering them in the four oceans. Thus most letters never reach their mark, and many are only received after attaining an age of two or three years or more. Soon Starbuck returned with a letter in his hand. It was sorely tumbled, damp, and covered with a dull, spotted green mould, in consequence of being kept in a dark locker of the cabin. Of such a letter Death himself might well have been the postboy. "'Canst not read it?' cried Ahab. "'Give it me, man.' "'Aye, aye. It's but a dim scrawl. What's this?' As he was studying it out, Starbuck took a long cutting-spade pole, and with his knife, slightly split the end to insert the letter there, and in that way hand it to the boat, without its coming any closer to the ship. Meantime, Ahab, holding the letter, muttered, Mr. Harry, Harry is, yes, Mr. Harry, a woman's penny hand, the man's wife, I'll wager. Aye, Mr. Harry Macy, ship Jeroboam. Why, it's Macy, and he's dead. "'Poor fellow, poor fellow, and from his wife,' sighed Mayhew. "'But let me have it.' "'Nay, keep it thyself,' cried Gabriel to Ahab. "'Thou art soon going that way.' "'Curses throttle thee!' yelled Ahab. "'Captain Mayhew, stand by now to receive it.' And, taking the fatal missive from Starbuck's hands, he caught it in the slit of the pole, and reached it over towards the boat. But as he did so, the oarsman expectantly desisted from rowing. The boat drifted a little towards the ship's stern, so that, as if by magic, the letter suddenly ranged along with Gabriel's eager hand. He clutched it in an instant, seized the boat-knife, and, impaling the letter on it, sent it thus loaded back into the ship. It fell at Ahab's feet. Then Gabriel shrieked out to his comrades to give way with their oars, and in that manner the mutinous boat rapidly shot away from the Pequod. As, after this interlude, the seamen resumed their work upon the jacket of the whale, many strange things were hinted in reference to this wild affair. End of chapter 68 to 71《Moby Dick》Chapters 72 and 73 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills.《Moby Dick》by Herman Melville Chapters 72 and 73 Chapter 72 The Monkey Rope in the tumultuous business of cutting in and attending to a whale, there is much running backwards and forwards among the crew. Now hands are wanted here, and then again hands are wanted there. There is no staying in any one place, for at one and the same time everything has to be done everywhere. It is much the same with him who endeavors the description of the scene. We must now retrace our way a little. It was mentioned that upon first breaking ground in the whale's back, the blubber hook was inserted into the original hole there cut by the spades of the mates. But how did so clumsy and weighty a mass as that same hook get fixed in that hole? 
It was inserted there by my particular friend Queequeg, whose duty it was, as harpooner, to descend upon the monster's back for the special purpose referred to. But in very many cases, circumstances require that the harpooner shall remain on the whale till the whole tensing or stripping operation is concluded. The whale, be it observed, lies almost entirely submerged, excepting the immediate parts operated upon. So, down there, some ten feet below the level of the deck, the poor harpooner flounders about, half on the whale and half in the water, as the vast mass revolves like a treadmill beneath him. On the occasion in question, Queequeg figured in the Highland costume, a shirt and socks, in which, to my eyes at least, he appeared to uncommon advantage, and no one had a better chance to observe him, as will presently be seen. Being the savage's bowsman, that is, the person who pulled the bow oar in his boat, the second one from forward, it was my cheerful duty to attend upon him while taking that hard scrabble scramble upon the dead whale's back. You have seen Italian organ boys holding a dancing ape by a long cord. Just so, from the ship's steep side, did I hold Queequeg down there in the sea, by what is technically called in the fishery a monkey rope attached to a strong strip of canvas belted round his waist. It was a humorously perilous business for both of us, for before we proceed further, it must be said that the monkey rope was fast at both ends, fast to Queequeg's broad canvas belt, and fast to my narrow leather one, so that, for better or for worse, we two, for the time, were wedded, and should poor Queequeg sink to rise no more, then both usage and honour demanded that instead of cutting the cord, it should drag me down in his wake. So then, an elongated Siamese ligature united us. Queequeg was my own inseparable twin brother, nor could I any way get rid of the dangerous liabilities which the hempen bond entailed. So strongly and metaphysically did I conceive of my situation then, that while earnestly watching his motions, I seemed distinctly to perceive that my own individuality was now merged in a joint-stock company of two, that my free will had received a mortal wound, and that another's mistake or misfortune might plunge innocent me into unmerited disaster and death. Therefore, I saw that here was a sort of interregnum in providence, for its even-handed equity never could have so gross an injustice. And yet, still further pondering, while I jerked him now and then from between the whale and the ship, which would threaten to jam him, still further pondering, I say, I saw that this situation of mind was the precise situation of every mortal that breathes, only, in most cases, he, one way or other, has this Siamese connection with a plurality of other mortals. If your banker breaks, you snap. If your apothecary by mistake sends you poison in your pills, you die. True, you may say that, by exceeding caution, you may possibly escape these and multitudinous other evil chances of life but handle Queequeg's monkey rope heedfully as I would, sometimes he jerked it so, that I came very near sliding overboard. Nor could I possibly forget that, do what I would, I had only the management of one end of it. Footnote. The monkey rope is found in all whalers, but it was only in the Pequod that the monkey and his holder were ever tied together, this improvement upon the original usage was introduced by no less a man than Stubb, in order to afford the imperiled harpooner the strongest possible guarantee for the faithfulness and vigilance of his monkey rope holder. End of footnote. I have hinted that I would often jerk poor Queequeg from between the whale and the ship, where he would occasionally fall from the incessant rolling and swaying of both, but this was not the only jamming jeopardy he was exposed to. Unappalled by the massacre made upon them during the night, the sharks, now freshly and more keenly allured by the before-pent blood which began to flow from the carcass, the rabid creatures swarmed round it like bees in a beehive. And right in among those sharks was Queequeg, who often pushed them aside with his floundering feet, 
a thing altogether incredible, were it not that, attracted by such prey as a dead whale, the otherwise miscellaneous carnivorous sharks will seldom touch a man. Nevertheless, it may well be believed that, since they have such a ravenous finger in the pie, it is deemed but wise to look sharp to them. Accordingly, besides the monkey rope with which I now and then jerked the poor fellow from too close a vicinity to the maw of what seemed a peculiarly ferocious shark, he was provided with still another protection. Suspended over the side in one of the stages, Tashtego and Dagu continually flourished over his head a couple of keen whale spades, wherewith they slaughtered as many sharks as they could reach. This procedure of theirs, to be sure, was very disinterested and benevolent of them. They meant Queequeg's best happiness, I admit, but in their hasty zeal to befriend him, and from the circumstance that both he and the sharks were at times half hidden by the blood-muddled water, those indiscreet spades of theirs would come nearer amputating a leg than a tail. But poor Queequeg, I suppose, straining and gasping there with that great iron hook, Poor Queequeg, I suppose, only prayed to his yojo, and gave up his life into the hands of his gods. Well, well, my dear comrade and twin brother, thought I, as I drew in and then slacked off the rope to every swell of the sea, what matters it, after all? Are you not the precious image of each and all of us men in this wailing world? That unsounded ocean you gasp in is life, those sharks your foes, those spades your friends, and what between sharks and spades, you are in a sad pickle and peril, poor lad. But courage, there is good cheer in store for you, Queequeg. For now, as with blue lips and bloodshot eyes, the exhausted savage at last climbs up the chains, and stands all dripping and involuntarily trembling over the side, the steward advances, and with a benevolent, consolatory glance, hands him, what, some hot cognac? No. Hands him, ye god, hands him a cup of tepid ginger and water. Ginger? Do I smell ginger? Suspiciously asked Stubb, coming near. Yes, this must be ginger, peering into the as yet untasted cup. Then, standing as if incredulous for a while, he calmly walked toward the astonished steward, slowly saying, Ginger! Ginger! And will you have the goodness to tell me, Mr. Doughboy, where lies the virtue of ginger? Ginger! Is ginger the sort of fuel you use, Doughboy, to kindle a fire in this shivering cannibal? Ginger! What the devil is ginger? Sea coal? Firewood? Lucifer matches? Tinder? Gunpowder? What the devil is ginger, I say, that you offer this cup to our poor Queequeg here? There is some sneaking temperance society movement about this business, he suddenly added, now approaching Starbuck, who had just come from forward. Will you look at that canakin, sir? Smell of it, if you please. Then, watching the mate's countenance, he added, The steward, Mr. Starbuck, had the face to offer that calamal and jollop to Queequeg there, this instant off the whale. Is the steward an apothecary, sir? And may I ask whether this is the sort of bitters by which he blows back the life into a half-drowned man? I trust not, said Starbuck. It is poor stuff enough. Aye, aye, steward, cried Stubb. We'll teach you to drug it, Harpooner. None of your apothecary's medicine here. You want to poison us, do you? You have got out insurance on our lives, and want to murder us all and pocket the proceeds, do you? It was not me, cried Doughboy. It was Aunt Charity that brought the ginger on board, and bade me never give the harpooners any spirits, but only this ginger jub, so she called it. Ginger jub, you gingery rascal, take that, and run along with you to the lockers, and get something better. I hope I do no wrong, Mr. Starbuck. It is the captain's orders, grog for the harpooner on a whale. Enough, replied Starbuck. Only don't hit him again, but, oh, I never hurt when I hit, except when I hit a whale or something of that sort. And this fellow's a weasel. Uh, what were you about saying, sir? Only this. Go down with him and get what thou wantest thyself. 
When Stubb reappeared, he came with a dark flask in one hand and a sort of tea caddy in the other. The first contained strong spirits and was handed to Queequeg, the second was Aunt Charity's gift, and that was freely given to the waves. Chapter 73 Stubb and Flask Kill a Right Whale, and then have a talk over him. It must be borne in mind that all this time we have a sperm whale's prodigious head hanging to the Pequod's side, but we must let it continue hanging there for a while, till we can get a chance to attend to it. For the present other matters press, and the best we can do now for the head is to pray heaven the tackles may hold. Now, during the past night and forenoon, the Pequod had gradually drifted into a sea which, by its occasional patches of yellow brit, gave unusual tokens of the vicinity of right whales, a species of the leviathan that but few supposed to be at this particular time lurking anywhere near. And though all hands commonly disdained the capture of those inferior creatures, and though the Pequod was not commissioned to cruise for them at all, and though she had passed numbers of them near the Crozettes without lowering a boat, yet now that a sperm whale had been brought alongside and beheaded, to the surprise of all, the announcement was made that a right whale should be captured that day if opportunity offered. Nor was this long wanting. Tall spouts were seen to leeward, and two boats, stubs and flasks, were detached in pursuit. Pulling further and further away, they at last became almost invisible to the men at the masthead. But suddenly in the distance they saw a great heap of tumultuous white water, and soon after news came from aloft that one or both the boats must be fast. An interval passed, and the boats were in plain sight, in the act of being dragged right towards the ship by the towing whale. So close did the monster come to the hull, that at first it seemed as if he meant it malice, but suddenly going down in a maelstrom, within three rods of the planks, he wholly disappeared from view, as if diving under the keel. Cut! Cut! was the cry from the ship to the boats, which for one instant seemed on the point of being brought with a deadly dash against the vessel's side. But having plenty of line yet in the tubs, and the whale not sounding very rapidly, they paid out abundance of rope, and at the same time pulled with all their might so as to get ahead of the ship. For a few minutes the struggle was intensely critical, for while they still slacked out the tightened line in one direction, and still plied their oars in another, the contending strain threatened to take them under. But it was only a few feet advance they sought to gain, and they stuck to it till they did gain it, when instantly a swift tremor was felt running like lightning along the keel, as the strained line scraping beneath the ship suddenly rose to view under her bows, snapping and quivering, and so flinging off its drippings that the drops fell like bits of broken glass on the water, while the whale beyond also rose to sight, and once more the boats were free to fly. But the fagged whale abated his speed, and blindly altering his course, went round the stern of the ship, towing the two boats after him, so that they performed a complete circuit. Meanwhile, they hauled more and more upon their lines, till, close flanking him on both sides, Stubb answered Flask with lance for lance, and thus round and round the Pequod the battle went, while the multitudes of sharks that had before swum round the sperm whale's body rushed to the fresh blood that was spilled, thirstily drinking at every new gash, as the eager Israelites did, at the new bursting fountains that poured from the smitten rock. At last his spout grew thick, and with a frightful roll and vomit, he turned upon his back a corpse. While the two headsmen were engaged in making fast cords to his flukes, and in other ways getting the mass in readiness for towing, some conversation ensued between them. "'I wonder what the old man wants with this lump of foul lard,' said Stubb, not without some disgust, at the thought of having to do with so ignoble a leviathan. "'Wants with it,' said Flask, coiling some spare line in the boat's bow. "'Did you never hear that the ship, which but once has a sperm whale's head hoisted on her starboard side, and at the same time a right whale's head on the larboard, 
Did you never hear, Stubb, that that ship can never afterwards capsize? Why not? I don't know, but I heard that gamboge ghost of a Fadala saying so, and he seems to know all about ship's charms, but I sometimes think he'll charm the ship to no good at last. I don't half like that chap, Stubb. Did you ever notice how that tusk of his is a sort of carved into a snake's head, Stubb? Sink him. I never look at him at all. But if ever I get a chance of a dark night, and he's standing hard by the bulwarks, and no one by, look down there, Flask, pointing into the sea with a peculiar motion of both hands. Aye, will I? Flask, I take that Fadala to be the devil in disguise. Do you believe that cock-and-bull story about his having been stowed away on board ship? He's the devil, I say. The reason why you don't see his tail is because he tucks it up out of sight. He carries it coiled away in his pocket, I guess. Blast him! Now that I think of it, he's always wanting oakum to stuff into the toes of his boots. He sleeps in his boots, don't he? He hasn't got any hammock, but I've seen him lay of nights in a coil of rigging. No doubt. And it's because of his cursed tail. He coils it down, do you see, in the eye of the rigging. What's the old man have so much to do with him for? Striking up a swap or a bargain, I suppose. Bargain? About what? Why, do you see, the old man is hard bent after that white whale, and the devil there is trying to come round him and get him to swap away his silver watch, or his soul, or something of that sort, and then he'll surrender Moby Dick. Pooh, Stubb, you are skylarking. How can Fadala do that? I don't know, Flask. But the devil is a curious chap, and a wicked one, I tell you. Why, they say is how he went a-sauntering into the old flagship once, switching his tail about devilish easy and gentlemanlike, and inquiring if the old governor was at home. Well, he was at home, and asked the devil what he wanted. The devil, switching his hoofs, up and says, I want John. What for? says the old governor. What business is that of yours? says the devil, getting mad. I want to use him. Take him, says the governor. And by the Lord, Flask, if the devil didn't give John the Asiatic cholera before he got through with him, I'll eat this whale in one mouthful. But look sharp. Ain't you already there? Well, then pull ahead, and let's get the whale alongside. I think I remember some such story as you were telling, said Flask, when at last the two boats were slowly advancing with their burden towards the ship. But I can't remember where. Three Spaniards? Adventures of those three bloody-minded solados? Did you read it there, Flask? I guess you did. No, never saw such a book. Heard of it, though. But now tell me, Stubb, do you suppose that that devil you were speaking of just now was the same you say is now on board the Pequod? Am I the same man that helped kill this whale? Doesn't the devil live forever? Who ever heard that the devil was dead? Did you ever see any parson wearing a mourning for the devil? And if the devil has a latch-key to get into the admiral's cabin, don't you suppose he can crawl into a porthole? Tell me that, Mr. Flask. How old do you suppose Fadala is, Stubb? Do you see that mainmast there? Pointing to the ship. Well, that's the figure one. Now take all the hoops in the Pequod's hold, and string along in a row with that mast for aughts. Do you see... Well, that wouldn't begin to be Fadala's age. Nor all the coopers in creation couldn't show hoops enough to make aughts enough. But see here, Stubb, I thought you a little boasted just now that you meant to give Fadala a sea toss if you got a good chance. Now, if he's so old as all those hoops of yours come to, and if he is going to live forever, what good will it do to pitch him overboard? Tell me that. Give him a good ducking, anyhow. But he'd crawl back. Duck him again, and keep ducking him. Suppose he should take it into his head to duck you, though. Yes, and drown you. What then? I should like to see him try it. I'd give him such a pair of black eyes that he wouldn't dare show his face in the admiral's cabin again for a long while, let alone down in the orlop there where he lives, and hereabouts on the upper decks where he sneaks so much. Damn the devil, Flask! So you suppose I'm afraid of the devil? Who's afraid of him? except the old governor who dares and catch him and put him in double darbies as he deserves, but lets him go about kidnapping people. Aye, 
and signed a bond with him, that all the people the devil kidnapped he'd roast for him. There's a governor. Do you suppose Fadala wants to kidnap Captain Ahab? Do I suppose it? You'll know it before long, Flask. But I am going now to keep a sharp lookout on him. And if I see anything very suspicious going on, I'll just take him by the nape of the neck and say, Look here, Beelzebub, you don't do it. And if he makes any fuss, by the Lord, I'll make a grab into his pocket for his tail, take it to the capstan, and give him such a wrenching and heaving that his tail will come short off at the stump, do you see? And then, I rather guess, when he finds himself docked in that queer fashion, he'll sneak off without the poor satisfaction of feeling his tail between his legs. And what will you do with the tail, Stubb? Do with it. Sell it for an ox-whip when we get home. What else? Now, do you mean what you say, and have been saying all along, Stubb? Mean or not mean, here we are at the ship. The boats were here hailed, to tow the whale on the larboard side, where fluke-chains and other necessaries were already prepared for securing him. Didn't I tell you so? said Flask. Yes, you'll soon see this right whale's head hoisted up opposite that parmacetes. In good time, Flask's saying proved true. As before, the Pequod steeply leaned over towards the sperm whale's head. Now, by the counterpoise of both heads, she regained her even keel. Though sorely strained, you may well believe. So, when on one side you hoist in Locke's head, you go over that way, but now on the other side hoist in Kant's, and you come back again, but in very poor plight. Thus some minds forever keep trimming boat. Oh, you foolish! Throw all these thunderheads overboard, and then you will float light and right. In disposing of the body of a right whale, when brought alongside the ship, the same preliminary proceedings commonly take place as in the case of a sperm whale. Only in the latter instance the head is cut off whole but in the former the lips and tongue are separately removed and hoisted on deck, with all the well-known black bone attached to what is called the crown-piece. But nothing like this in the present case had been done. The carcasses of both whales had dropped astern, and the head-laden ship not a little resembled a mule carrying a pair of overburdening panniers. Meantime, Fadala was calmly eyeing the right whale's head, and ever and anon glancing from the deep wrinkles there to the lines in his own hand. And Ahab chanced so to stand that the Parsi occupied his shadow, while if the Parsi's shadow was there at all, it seemed only to blend with and lengthen Ahab's. As the crew toiled on, Laplandish speculations were bandied among them concerning all these passing things. End of chapters 72 and 73. Moby Dick, chapters 74 to 77. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wells. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 74 to 77. Chapter 74 The Sperm Whale's Head, Contrasted View Here now are two great whales laying their heads together. Let us join them, and lay together our own. Of the grand order of folio leviathans, the sperm whale and the right whale are by far the most noteworthy. They are the only whales regularly hunted by man. To the Nantucketer they present the two extremes of all the known varieties of the whale. As the external difference between them is mainly observable in their heads, and as a head of each is this moment hanging from the Pequod's side, and as we may freely go from one to the other by merely stepping across the deck, where, I should like to know, will you obtain a better chance to study practical cetology than here? In the first place, you are struck by the general contrast between these heads. Both are massive enough, in all conscience, 
but there is a certain mathematical symmetry in the sperm whales which the right whales sadly lacks there is more character in the sperm whale's head as you behold it you involuntarily yield the immense superiority to him in point of pervading dignity in the present instance too this dignity is heightened by the pepper and salt colour of his head at the summit giving token of advanced age and large experience in short he is what the fishermen technically call a grey-headed whale let us now note what is least dissimilar in these heads namely the two most important organs the eye and the ear far back on the side of the head and low down near the angle of either whale's jaw if you narrowly search you will at last see a lashless eye which you would fancy to be a young colt's eye so out of all proportion is it to the magnitude of the head now from this peculiar sideway position of the whale's eyes it is plain that he can never see an object which is exactly a head no more than he can one exactly astern in a word the position of the whale's eyes corresponds to that of a man's ears and you may fancy for yourself how it would fare with you did you sideways survey objects through your ears you would find that you could only command some thirty degrees of vision in advance of the straight side-line of sight and about thirty more behind it if your bitterest foe were walking straight towards you with dagger uplifted in broad day you would not be able to see him any more than if he were stealing upon you from behind in a word you would have two backs so to speak but at the same time also two fronts side fronts for what is it that makes the front of a man what indeed but his eyes moreover while in most other animals that i can now think of the eyes are so planted as imperceptibly to blend their visual power so as to produce one picture and not two to the brain the peculiar position of the whale's eyes effectually divided as they are by many cubic feet of solid head which towers between them like a great mountain separating two lakes and valleys this of course must wholly separate the impressions which each independent organ imparts the whale therefore must see one distinct picture on this side and another distinct picture on that side while all between must be profound darkness and nothingness to him man may in effect be said to look out on the world from a sentry-box with two joined sashes for his window but for the whale these two sashes are separately inserted making two distinct windows but sadly impairing the view this peculiarity of the whale's eyes is a thing always to be borne in mind in the fishery and to be remembered by the reader in some subsequent scenes a curious and most puzzling question might be started concerning this visual matter as touching the leviathan but i must be content with a hint so long as a man's eyes are open in the light the act of seeing is involuntary that is he cannot help mechanically seeing whatever objects are before him nevertheless any one's experience will teach him that though he can take in an undiscriminating sweep of things at one glance it is quite impossible for him attentively and completely to examine any two things however large or however small at one and the same instant of time never mind if they lie side by side and touch each other but if you now come to separate these two objects and surround each by a circle of profound darkness then in order to see one of them in such a manner as to bring your mind to bear on it the other will be utterly excluded from your contemporary consciousness how is it then with the whale true both his eyes in themselves must simultaneously act but is his brain so much more comprehensive combining and subtle than man's that he can at the same moment of time attentively examine two distinct prospects one on one side of him and the other in an exactly opposite direction if he can then is it a marvellous thing in him as if a man were able to simultaneously go through the demonstrations of two distinct problems in euclid nor strictly investigated is there any incongruity in this comparison it may be but an idle whim but it has always seemed to me 
that the extraordinary vacillations of movement displayed by some whales when beset by three or four boats, the timidity and liability to queer frights so common to such whales, I think that all this indirectly proceeds from the helpless perplexity of volition in which their divided and diametrically opposite powers of vision must involve them. But the ear of the whale is full as curious as the eye. If you are an entire stranger to their race, you might hunt over these two heads for hours and never discover that organ. The ear has no external leaf whatever, and into the hole itself you can hardly insert a quill, so wondrously minute is it. It is lodged a little behind the eye. With respect to their ears, this important difference is to be observed between the sperm whale and the right, while the ear of the former has an external opening, that of the latter is entirely and evenly covered over with a membrane, so as to be quite imperceptible from without. Is it not curious that so vast a being as the whale should see the world through so small an eye, and hear the thunder through an ear which is smaller than a hare's? But if the eye were broad as the lens of Herschel's great telescope, and his ears capacious as the porches of cathedrals, would that make him any longer of sight or sharper of hearing? Not at all. Why, then, do you try to enlarge your mind? Subtilize it. Let us now, with whatever levers and steam engines we have at hand, cant over the sperm whale's head, that it may lie bottom up, then, ascending by a ladder to the summit, have a peep down the mouth. And were it not that the body is now completely separated from it, with a lantern we might descend into the great Kentucky mammoth cave of the stomach. But let us hold on here by this tooth and look about us where we are. What a really beautiful and chaste-looking mouth, from floor to ceiling, lined, or rather papered, with a glistening white membrane, glossy as bridal satins. But come out now and look at this portentous lower jaw, which seems like the long narrow lid of an immense snuff-box, with the hinge at one end instead of one side. If you pry it up so as to get it overhead, and expose its rows of teeth, it seems a terrific portcullis, and such, alas, it proves to many a poor wight in the fishery, upon whom these spikes fall with impaling force. But far more terrible is it to behold, when fathoms down in the sea, you see some sulky whale floating there suspended with his prodigious jaw some fifteen feet long, hanging straight down at right angles with his body, for all the world like a ship's jib-boom. This whale is not dead, he is only dispirited, out of sorts perhaps, hypochondriac and so supine that the hinges of his jaw have relaxed, leaving him there in that ungainly sort of plight, a reproach to all his tribe, who must, no doubt, imprecate lock-jaws upon him. In most cases this lower jaw, being easily unhinged by a practised artist, is disengaged and hoisted on deck for the purpose of extracting the ivory teeth, and furnishing a supply of that hard white whalebone with which the fishermen fashion all sorts of curious articles, including canes, umbrella stocks, and handles to riding whips. With a long, weary hoist the jaw is dragged on board, as if it were an anchor, and when the proper time comes, some few days after the other work, Queequeg, Dagu, and Tashtego, all being accomplished dentists, are set to drawing teeth. With a keen cutting spade, Queequeg lances the gums, then the jaw is lashed down to ring bolts, and a tackle being rigged from aloft, they drag out these teeth, as Michigan oxen drag stumps of old oaks out of wild woodlands. There are generally forty-two teeth in all, in old whales much worn down, but undecayed, nor filled after our artificial fashion. The jaw is afterwards sawn into slabs, and piled away like joists for building houses. Chapter 75 The Right Whale's Head Contrasted View Crossing the deck, let us now have a good long look at the right whale's head. 
As in general shape the noble sperm whale's head may be compared to a Roman war chariot, especially in front where it is so broadly rounded, so at a broad view the right whale's head bears a rather inelegant resemblance to a gigantic galliot toed shoe. Two hundred years ago an old Dutch voyager likened its shape to that of a shoemaker's last, and in this same last or shoe that old woman of the nursery tale with her swarming brood might very comfortably be lodged, she and all her progeny. But as you come nearer to this great head, it begins to assume different aspects, according to your point of view. If you stand on its summit and look at these two F-shaped spout-holes, you would take the whole head for an enormous base viol, and these spiracles the apertures in its sounding-board. Then again, if you fix your eyes upon this strange, crested, comb-like incrustation on the top of the mass, this green barnacled thing, which the Greenlanders call the crown, and the southern fishers the bonnet of the right whale, fixing your eyes solely on this, you would take the head for a trunk of some huge oak, with a bird's nest in its crotch. At any rate, when you watch those live crabs that nestle here on this bonnet, such an idea will be almost sure to occur to you, unless indeed your fancy has been fixed by the technical term crown also bestowed upon it, in which case you will take great interest in thinking how this mighty monster is actually a diademed king of the sea, whose green crown has been put together for him in this marvellous manner. But if this whale be a king, he is a very sulky-looking fellow to grace a diadem. Look at that hanging lower lip, what a huge sulk and pout is there! A sulk and pout by carpenter's measurement, about twenty feet long and five feet deep. A sulk and pout that will yield you some five hundred gallons of oil and more. A great pity now that this unfortunate whale should be hair-lipped. The fissure is about a foot across. Probably the mother, during an important interval, was sailing down the Peruvian coast when earthquakes caused the beach to gape. Over this lip, as over a slippery threshold, we now slide into the mouth. Upon my word, were I at Mackinaw, I should take this to be the inside of an Indian wigwam. Good Lord! Is this the road that Jonah went? The roof is about twelve feet high, and runs to a pretty sharp angle, as if there were a regular ridge-pole there, while these ribbed, arched, hairy sides present us with those wondrous, half-vertical, scimitar-shaped slats of whalebone, say three hundred on a side, which, depending from the upper part of the head or crown-bone, form those Venetian blinds which have elsewhere been cursorily mentioned. The edges of these bones are fringed with hairy fibres, through which the right whale strains the water, and in whose intricacies he retains the small fish when open-mouthed he goes through the seas of Brit in feeding time. In the central blinds of bone, as they stand in their natural order, there are certain curious marks, curves, hollows, and ridges, whereby some whalemen calculate the creature's age, as the age of an oak by its circular rings. Though the certainty of this criterion is far from demonstrable, yet it has the savour of analogical probability. At any rate, if we yield to it, we must grant a far greater age to the right whale than at first glance will seem reasonable. In old times there seem to have prevailed the most curious fancies concerning these blinds, one voyager in purchase calls them the wondrous whiskers inside of the whale's mouth, another hog's bristles, a third old gentleman in Hakluyt uses the following elegant language, quote, There are about two hundred and fifty fins growing on each side of his upper chop, which arch over his tongue on each side of his mouth. End quote. Footnote. This reminds us that the right whale really has a sort of whisker, or rather a moustache, consisting of a few scattered white hairs on the upper part of the outer end of the lower jaw. Sometimes these tufts impart a rather brigandish expression to his otherwise solemn countenance. End of footnote. As everyone knows, these same hog's bristles, fins, 
whiskers, blinds, or whatever you please, furnish to the ladies their busks and other stiffening contrivances. But in this particular the demand has long been on the decline. It was in Queen Anne's time that the bone was in its glory, the farthingale being then all the fashion. And as those ancient dams moved about gaily, though in the jaws of the whale, as you may say, even so in a shower, with like thoughtlessness, do we nowadays fly under the same jaws for protection, the umbrella being a tent spread over the same bone. But now forget all about blinds and whiskers for a moment, and standing in the right whale's mouth, look around you afresh. Seeing all these colonnades of bone so methodically ranged about, would you not think you were inside of the great Harlem organ, and gazing upon its thousand pipes? For a carpet to the organ we have a rug of the softest turkey, the tongue, which is glued, as it were, to the floor of the mouth. It is very fat and tender, and apt to tear in pieces in hoisting it on deck. This particular tongue now before us, at a passing glance I should say it was a six-barreler, that is, it will yield you about that amount of oil. Ere this you must have plainly seen the truth of what I started with, that the sperm whale and the right whale have almost entirely different heads. To sum up, then, in the right whales there is no great well of sperm, no ivory teeth at all, no long slender mandible of a lower jaw like the sperm whales nor in the sperm whale are there any of those blinds of bone, no huge lower lip, and scarcely anything of a tongue. Again, the right whale has two external spout-holes, the sperm whale only one. Look your last now on these venerable hooded heads, while they yet lie together, for one will soon sink unrecorded in the sea, and the other will not be very long in following. Can you catch the expression of the sperm whales there? It is the same he died with, only some of the longer wrinkles in the forehead now seem faded away. I think his broad brow to be full of a prairie-like placidity, born of a speculative indifference as to death. But mark the other head's expression. See that amazing lower lip pressed by accident against the vessel's side, so as firmly to embrace the jaw. Does not this whole head seem to speak of an enormous practical resolution in facing death? This right whale I take to have been a stoic. The sperm whale, a Platonian, who might have taken up Spinoza in his latter years. Chapter 76 The Battering Ram Ere quitting for the nonce the sperm whale's head, I would have you, as a sensible physiologist simply, particularly remark its front aspect, in all its compacted collectedness. I would have you investigate it now, with the sole view of forming to yourself some unexaggerated, intelligent estimate of whatever battering ram power may be lodged there. Here is a vital point, for you must either satisfactorily settle this matter with yourself, or forever remain an infidel as to one of the most appalling, but not the less true events, perhaps anywhere to be found in all recorded history. You observe that in the ordinary swimming position of the sperm whale, the front of his head presents an almost wholly vertical plane to the water. You observe that the lower part of that front slopes considerably backwards, so as to furnish more of a retreat for the long socket which receives the boom-like lower jaw. You observe that the mouth is entirely under the head, much in the same way indeed as though your own mouth were entirely under your chin. Moreover, you observe that the whale has no external nose, and that what nose he has, his spout-hole, is on the top of his head. You observe that his eyes and ears are at the sides of his head, nearly one-third of his entire length from the front. Wherefore, you must now have perceived that the front of the sperm whale's head is a dead blind wall, without a single organ or tender prominence of any sort whatsoever. Furthermore, you are now to consider that only in the extreme lower backward sloping part of the front of the head is there the slightest vestige of bone. 
and not till you get near twenty feet from the forehead do you come to the full cranial development. So that this whole enormous boneless mass is as one wad. Finally, though, as will soon be revealed, its contents partly comprise the most delicate oil, yet you are now to be apprised of the nature of the substance which so impregnably invests all that apparent effeminacy. In some previous place I have described to you how the blubber wraps the body of the whale, as the rind wraps an orange, just so with the head, but with this difference, about the head this envelope, though not so thick, is of a boneless toughness, inestimable by any man who has not handled it. The severest pointed harpoon, the sharpest lance darted by the strongest human arm, impotently rebounds from it. It is as though the forehead of the sperm whale were paved with horses' hoofs. I do not think that any sensation lurks in it. Bethink yourself also of another thing. When two large, loaded Indiamen chance to crowd and crush towards each other in the docks, what do the sailors do? They do not suspend between them, at the point of coming contact, any merely hard substance like iron or wood. No, they hold there a large round wad of tow and cork, enveloped in the thickest and toughest of ox-hide. That, bravely and uninjured, takes the jam which would have snapped all their oaken handspikes and iron crowbars. By itself this sufficiently illustrates the obvious fact I drive at. But supplementary to this, it has hypothetically occurred to me that as ordinary fish possess what is called a swimming bladder in them, capable at will of distension or contraction, and as the sperm whale, as far as I know, has no such provision in him, considering, too, the otherwise inexplicable manner in which he now depresses his head altogether beneath the surface, and anon swims with it high elevated out of the water, considering the unobstructed elasticity of its envelope, considering the unique interior of his head, it has hypothetically occurred to me, I say, that those mystical lung-celled honeycombs there may possibly have some hitherto unknown and unsuspected connection with the outer air, so as to be susceptible to atmospheric distension and contraction. If this be so, fancy the irresistibleness of that might to which the most impalpable and destructive of all elements contributes. Now, Mark, unerringly impelling this dead, impregnable, uninjurable wall, and this most buoyant thing within, there swims behind it all a mass of tremendous life, only to be adequately estimated as piled wood is, by the cord, and all obedient to one volition as the smallest insect. So that when I shall hereafter detail to you all the specialties and concentrations of potency everywhere lurking in this expansive monster, when I shall show you some of his more inconsiderable braining feats, I trust you will have renounced all ignorant incredulity, and be ready to abide by this, that though the sperm whale stove a passage through the isthmus of Darien, and mixed the Atlantic with the Pacific, you would not elevate one hair of your eyebrow. For unless you own the whale, you are but a provincial and sentimentalist in truth. But clear truth is a thing for salamander giants only to encounter. How small the chances for the provincials, then! What befell the weakling youth lifting the dread goddess's veil at Lais? Chapter 77 The Great Heidelberg Tun Now comes the bailing of the case. But to comprehend it aright, you must know something of the curious internal structure of the thing operated upon. Regarding the sperm whale's head as a solid oblong, you may, on an inclined plane, sideways divide it into two coins, whereof the lower is the bony structure forming the cranium and jaws, and the upper an unctuous mass wholly free from bones, its broad forward end forming the expanded vertical apparent forehead of the whale, at the middle of the forehead, horizontally subdivide this upper coin, and then you have two almost equal parts, which before were naturally divided by an internal wall of a thick tendinous substance. 
Footnote. Quoin is not a Euclidean term. It belongs to the pure nautical mathematics. I know not that it has been defined before. A quoin is a solid which differs from a wedge in having its sharp end formed by the steep inclination of one side instead of the mutual tapering of both sides. End of footnote. The lower subdivided part, called the junk, is one immense honeycomb of oil, formed by the crossing and recrossing into ten thousand infiltrated cells of tough elastic white fibers throughout its whole extent. The upper part, known as the case, may be regarded as the great Heidelberg ton of the sperm whale. And as that famous great tierce is mystically carved in front, so the whale's vast, pleated forehead forms innumerable strange devices for the emblematical adornment of his wondrous ton. Moreover, as that of Heidelberg was always replenished with the most excellent of wines from the Rhenish valleys, so the ton of the whale contains by far the most precious of all his oily vintages, namely the highly prized spermaceti, in its absolutely pure, limpid, and odoriferous state. Nor is this precious substance found unalloyed in any other part of the creature. Though in life it remains perfectly fluid, yet upon exposure to the air after death, it soon begins to concrete, sending forth beautiful crystalline shoots, as when the first thin, delicate ice is just forming in water. A large whale's case generally yields about five hundred gallons of sperm, though, from unavoidable circumstances, considerable of it is spilled, leaks and dribbles away, or is otherwise irrevocably lost in the ticklish business of securing what you can. I know not with what fine and costly material the Heidelberg ton was coated within, but in superlative richness that coating could not possibly have compared with the silken pearl-colored membrane, like the lining of a fine pelisse, forming the inner surface of the sperm whale's case. It will have been seen that the Heidelberg ton of the sperm whale embraces the entire length of the entire top of the head, and since, as has been elsewhere set forth, the head embraces one-third of the whole length of the creature, then setting that length down at eighty feet for a good-sized whale, you have more than twenty-six feet for the depth of the ton, when it is lengthwise hoisted up and down against the ship's side. As in decapitating the whale, the operator's instrument is brought close to the spot where an entrance is subsequently forced into the spermaceti magazine. He has, therefore, to be uncommonly heedful, lest a careless, untimely stroke should invade the sanctuary, and wastingly let out its invaluable contents. It is this decapitated end of the head, also, which is at last elevated out of the water, and retained in that position by the enormous cutting tackles, whose hempen combinations on one side make quite a wilderness of ropes in that quarter. Thus much being said, attend now, I pray you, to that marvellous and, in this particular instance, almost fatal operation, whereby the sperm whale's great Heidelberg ton is tapped. End of chapters 74 to 77 Moby Dick Chapter seventy eight to eighty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters seventy eight to eighty. Chapter seventy eight. Cistern and Buckets. Nimble as a cat, Tashtego mounts aloft, and without altering his erect posture, runs straight out upon the overhanging mainyard arm, to the part where it exactly projects over the hoisted ton. He has carried with him a light tackle called a whip, consisting of only two parts, travelling through a single sheaved block. Securing this block so that it hangs down from the yard arm, he swings one end of the rope, till it is caught and firmly held by a hand on deck. 
Then, hand over hand, down the other part, the Indian drops through the air, till, dexterously, he lands on the summit of the head. There, still high elevated above the rest of the company, to whom he vivaciously cries, he seems some Turkish muezzin calling the good people to prayers from the top of a tower. A short-handled sharp spade being sent up to him, he diligently searches for the proper place to begin breaking in to the ton. In this business he proceeds very heedfully, like a treasure hunter in some old house, sounding the walls to find where the gold is masoned in. By the time this cautious search is over, a stout iron-bound bucket, precisely like a well-bucket, has been attached to one end of the whip, while the other end, being stretched across the deck, is there held by two or three alert hands. These last now hoist the bucket within grasp of the Indian, to whom another person has reached up a very long pole. Inserting this pole into the bucket, Tashtego downward guides the bucket into the ton, till it entirely disappears. Then, giving the word to the seamen at the whip, up comes the bucket again, all bubbling like a dairymaid's pail of new milk. Carefully lowered from its height, the full freighted vessel is caught by an appointed hand, and quickly emptied into a large tub. Then, remounting aloft, it again goes through the same round, until the deep cistern will yield no more. Towards the end, Tashtego has to ram his long pole harder and harder, and deeper and deeper into the ton, until some twenty feet of the pole have gone down. Now, the people of the Pequod had been bailing some time in this way. Several tubs had been filled with the fragrant sperm, when all at once a queer accident happened. Whether it was that Tashtego, that wild Indian, was so heedless and reckless as to let go for a moment his one-handed hold on the great cabled tackles suspending the head, or whether the place where he stood was so treacherous and oozy, or whether the evil one himself would have it fall out so, without stating his particular reasons, how it was exactly there is no telling now, but on a sudden, as the eightieth or ninetieth bucket came suckingly up, my God, poor Tashtego, like the twin reciprocating bucket in a veritable well, dropped head foremost down into this great ton of Heidelberg, and with a horrible oily gurgling went clean out of sight. Man overboard, cried Dagu, who amid the general consternation first came to his senses. Swing the bucket this way! and, putting one foot into it, so as the better to secure his slippery handhold on the whip itself, the hoisters ran him high to the top of the head, almost before Tashtego could have reached its interior bottom. Meantime there was a terrible tumult. Looking over the side, they saw the before lifeless head throbbing and heaving just below the surface of the sea, as if that moment seized with some momentous idea— whereas it was only the poor Indian unconsciously revealing by those struggles the perilous depth to which he had sunk. At this instant, while Dagu on the summit of the head was clearing the whip, which had somehow got foul of the great cutting tackles, a sharp cracking noise was heard, and to the unspeakable horror of all, one of the two enormous hooks suspending the head tore out, and with a vast vibration the enormous mass sideways swung, till the drunk ship reeled and shook as if smitten by an iceberg. The one remaining hook, upon which the entire strain now depended, seemed every instant to be on the point of giving way, an event still more likely from the violent motions of the head. "'Come down! Come down!' yelled the seamen to Dagu, but with one hand holding on to the heavy tackles, so that if the head should drop he would still remain suspended, the negro, having cleared the foul line, rammed down the bucket into the now collapsed well, meaning that the buried harpooner should grasp it, and so be hoisted out. "'In heaven's name, man!' cried Stubb. "'Are you ramming home a cartridge there? Avast! How will that help him? Jamming that iron-bound bucket on top of his head! Avast, will ye? "'Stand clear of the tackle!' cried a voice like the bursting of a rocket. Almost in the same instant, with a thunder-boom, the enormous mass dropped into the sea, like Niagara's table-rock into the whirlpool. The suddenly relieved hull rolled away from it, 
to far down her glittering copper, and all caught their breath as half swinging, now over the sailors' heads, and now over the water, Dagoo, through a thick mist of spray, was dimly beheld clinging to the pendulous tackles, while poor buried alive Tashtego was sinking utterly down to the bottom of the sea. But hardly had the blinding vapor cleared away, when a naked figure with a boarding sword in his hand was for one swift moment seen hovering over the bulwarks. The next, a loud splash announced that my brave Queequeg had dived to the rescue. One packed rush was made to the side, and every eye counted every ripple, as moment followed moment, and no sign of either the sinker or the diver could be seen. Some hands now jumped into a boat alongside, and pushed a little off from the ship. "'Ha, ha!' cried Dagoo all at once, from his now quiet swinging perch overhead, and, looking further off from the side, we saw an arm thrust upright from the blue waves." a strange sight to see, as an arm thrust forth from the grass over a grave. "'Both! Both! It is both!' cried Dagoo again with a joyful shout. And soon after Queequeg was seen boldly striking out with one hand, and with the other clutching the long hair of the Indian. Drawn into the waiting boat, they were quickly brought to the deck, but Tashtego was long in coming too, and Queequeg did not look very brisk. Now how had this noble rescue been accomplished? Why, diving after the slowly descending head, Queequeg, with his keen sword, had made side lunges near its bottom, so as to scuttle a large hole there. Then, dropping his sword, had thrust his long arm far inwards and upwards, and so hauled out poor Tash by the head. He averred that upon first thrusting in for him, a leg was presented, but well knowing that that was not as it ought to be, and might occasion great trouble, he had thrust back the leg, and by a dexterous heave and toss, had wrought a somerset upon the Indian, so that with the next trial he came forth in the good old way, head foremost. As for the great head itself, that was doing as well as could be expected. And thus, through the courage and great skill in obstetrics of Queequeg, the deliverance, or rather delivery, of Tashtego, was successfully accomplished, in the teeth, too, of the most untoward and apparently hopeless impediments, which is a lesson by no means to be forgotten. Midwifery should be taught in the same course with fencing and boxing, riding and rowing. I know that this queer adventure of the gay headers will be sure to seem incredible to some landsmen, though they themselves have either seen or heard of someone's falling into a cistern ashore, an accident which not seldom happens, and with much less reason, too, than the Indians, considering the exceeding slipperiness of the curb of the sperm whale's well. But, peradventure, it may be sagaciously urged, how is this? We thought the tissued infiltrated head of the sperm whale was the lightest and most corky part about him, and yet thou makest it sink in an element of far greater specific gravity than itself. We have thee there. Not at all, but I have ye. For at the time poor Tash fell in, the case had been nearly emptied of its lighter contents, leaving little but the dense tendinous wall of the well, a double-welded hammered substance, as I have before said, much heavier than the sea-water, and a lump of which sinks in it like lead almost. But the tendency to rapid sinking in this substance was in the present instance materially counteracted by the other parts of the head remaining undetached from it, so that it sank very slowly and deliberately indeed, affording Queequeg a fair chance for performing his agile obstetrics on the run, as you may say. Yes, it was a running delivery, so it was. Now, had Tashtego perished in that head, it had been a very precious perishing. Smothered in the very whitest and daintiest of fragrant spermaceti, coffined, hearsed, and tombed in the secret inner chamber and sanctum sanctorum of the whale, only one sweeter end can readily be recalled, the delicious death of an Ohio honey-hunter, who, seeking honey in the crotch of a hollow tree, found such an exceeding store of it that, leaning too far over, it sucked him in, so that he died embalmed. 
how many, think ye, have likewise fallen into Plato's honey head, and sweetly perished there? Chapter 79 The Prairie To scan the lines of his face, or feel the bumps on the head of this leviathan, this is a thing which no physiognomist or phrenologist has as yet undertaken. Such an enterprise would seem almost as hopeful as for Lavater to have scrutinized the wrinkles on the rock of Gibraltar, or for Gaul to have mounted a ladder and manipulated the dome of the Pantheon. Still in that famous work of his, Lavater not only treats of the various faces of men, but also attentively studies the faces of horses, birds, serpents, and fish, and dwells in detail upon the modifications of expression discernible therein. Nor have Gaul and his disciple Spurzheim failed to throw out some hints touching the phrenological characteristics of other beings than man. Therefore, though I am but ill qualified for a pioneer in the application of these two semi-sciences to the whale, I will do my endeavor. I try all things. I achieve what I can. Physiognomically regarded, the sperm whale is an anomalous creature. He has no proper nose, and since the nose is the central and most conspicuous of the features, and since it perhaps most modifies and finally controls their combined expression, hence it would seem that its entire absence, as an external appendage, must very largely affect the countenance of the whale. For, as in landscape gardening, a spire, cupola, monument, or tower of some sort is deemed almost indispensable to the completion of the scene, so no face can be physiognomically in keeping without the elevated open-work belfry of the nose. Dash the nose from Phidias's marble Jove, and what a sorry remainder! Nevertheless, Leviathan is of so mighty a magnitude, all his proportions are so stately, that the same deficiency which in the sculptured Jove were hideous, in him is no blemish at all, nay, it is an added grandeur. A nose to the whale would have been impertinent, as on your physiognomical voyage you sail round his vast head in your jolly-boat, your noble conceptions of him are never insulted by the reflection that he has a nose to be pulled. A pestilent conceit which so often will insist upon obtruding even when beholding the mightiest royal beetle on his throne. In some particulars, perhaps the most imposing physiognomical view to be had of the sperm whale is that of the full front of his head. This aspect is sublime. In thought, a fine human brow is like the east when troubled with the morning. In the repose of the pasture, the curled brow of the bull has a touch of the grand in it. Pushing heavy cannon up mountain defiles, the elephant's brow is majestic. Human or animal, the mystical brow is as that great golden seal affixed by the German emperors to their decrees. It signifies, God, done this day by my hand. But in most creatures, nay, in man himself, very often the brow is but a mere strip of alpine land lying along the snow line. Few are the foreheads which, like Shakespeare's or Melanchthon's, rise so high and descend so low that the eyes themselves seem clear, eternal, tideless mountain lakes, and all above them in the forehead's wrinkles you seem to track the antlered thoughts descending there to drink, as the highland hunters track the snow prints of the deer. But in the great sperm whale this high and mighty, godlike dignity inherent in the brow is so immensely amplified that gazing on it, in that full front view, you feel the deity and the dread powers more forcibly than in beholding any other object of living nature. For you see no one point precisely, not one distinct feature is revealed, no nose, eyes, ears, or mouth, no face, he has none proper, nothing but that one broad firmament of a forehead, pleated with riddles, dumbly lowering with the doom of boats and ships and men. Nor, in profile, does this wondrous brow diminish, though that way viewed its grandeur does not domineer upon you so. 
In profile, you plainly perceive that horizontal, semi-crescentic depression in the forehead's middle, which in man is Lavater's mark of genius. But how? Genius in the sperm whale? Has the sperm whale ever written a book, spoken a speech? No, his great genius is declared in his doing nothing particular to prove it. It is, moreover, declared in his pyramidical silence. And this reminds me that had the great sperm whale been known to the young Orient world, he would have been deified by their child Magian thoughts. They deified the crocodile of the Nile, because the crocodile is tongueless, and the sperm whale has no tongue, or at least it is so exceedingly small as to be incapable of protrusion. If hereafter any highly cultured, poetical nation shall lure back to their birthright the merry May-day gods of old, and livingly enthrone them again in the now egotistical sky, in the now unhaunted hill, then be sure, exalted to Jove's high seat, the great sperm whale shall lord it. Champollion deciphered the wrinkled granite hieroglyphics but there is no Champollion to decipher the Egypt of every man's and every being's face. Physiognomy, like every other human science, is but a passing fable. If, then, Sir William Jones, who read in thirty languages, could not read the simplest peasant's face in its profounder and more subtle meanings, how may unlettered Ishmael hope to read the awful Chaldee of the sperm whale's brow? I but put that brow before you. Read it, if you can. Chapter 80 The Nut If the sperm whale be physiognomically a sphinx, to the phrenologist his brain seems that geometrical circle which it is impossible to square. In the full-grown creature the skull will measure at least twenty feet in length, Unhinge the lower jaw, and the side view of this skull is as the side of a moderately inclined plane resting throughout on a level base. But in life, as we have elsewhere seen, this inclined plane is angularly filled up, and almost squared by the enormous superincumbent mass of the junk and sperm. At the high end of the skull forms a crater to bed that part of the mass, while under the long floor of this crater, in another cavity seldom exceeding ten inches in length, and as many in depth, reposes the mere handful of this monster's brain. The brain is at least twenty feet from his apparent forehead in life. It is hidden away behind its vast outworks, like the innermost citadel within the amplified fortifications of Quebec. So like a choice casket is it secreted in him, that I have known some whalemen who peremptorily deny that the sperm whale has any other brain than that palpable semblance of one formed by the cubic yards of his sperm magazine. Lying in strange folds, courses, and convolutions, to their apprehensions, it seems more in keeping with the idea of his general might to regard that mystic part of him as the seat of his intelligence." It is plain, then, that, phrenologically, the head of this leviathan, in the creature's living, intact state, is an entire delusion. As for his true brain, you can see no indications of it, nor feel any. The whale, like all things that are mighty, wears a false brow to the common world. If you unload his skull of its spermy heaps, and then take a rear view of its rear end, which is the high end, you will be struck by its resemblance to the human skull, beheld in the same situation and from the same point of view. Indeed, place this reversed skull, scaled down to the human magnitude, among a plate of men's skulls, and you would involuntarily confound it with them, and remarking the depressions on one part of its summit, in phrenological phrase you would say, This man had no self-esteem and no veneration and by those negations, considered along with the affirmative fact of his prodigious bulk and power, you can best form to yourself the truest, though not the most exhilarating conception, of what the most exalted potency is. But if, from the comparative dimensions of the whale's proper brain, you deem it incapable of being adequately charted, then I have another idea for you. 
If you attentively regard almost any quadruped spine, you will be struck by the resemblance of its vertebrae to a strung necklace of dwarfed skulls, all bearing rudimental resemblance to the skull proper. It is a German conceit that the vertebrae are absolutely undeveloped skulls. But the curious external resemblance, I take it the Germans were not the first men to perceive. A foreign friend once pointed it out to me, in the skeleton of a foe he had slain, and with the vertebrae of which he was inlaying, in a sort of basso relievo, the beaked prow of his canoe. Now, I consider that the phrenologists have omitted an important thing in not pushing their investigations from the cerebellum through the spinal canal, for I believe that much of a man's character will be found betokened in his backbone. I would rather feel your spine than your skull, whoever you are. A thin joist of a spine never yet upheld a full and noble soul. I rejoice in my spine, as in the firm, audacious staff of that flag which I fling half out to the world. Apply this spinal branch of phrenology to the sperm whale. His cranial cavity is continuous with the first neck vertebra, and in that vertebra the bottom of the spinal canal will measure ten inches across, being eight in height, and of a triangular figure with the base downwards. As it passes through the remaining vertebrae, the canal tapers in size, but for a considerable distance remains of large capacity. Now, of course, this canal is filled with much the same strangely fibrous substance, the spinal cord, as the brain, and directly communicates with the brain. And what is still more, for many feet after emerging from the brain's cavity, the spinal cord remains of an undecreasing girth, almost equal to that of the brain. Under all these circumstances, would it be unreasonable to survey and map out the whale's spine phrenologically? For viewed in this light, the wonderful comparative smallness of his brain proper is more than compensated by the wonderful comparative magnitude of his spinal cord. But leaving this hint to operate as it may with the phrenologist, I would merely assume the spinal theory for a moment, in reference to the sperm whale's hump. This august hump, if I mistake not, rises over one of the larger vertebrae, and is therefore in some sort the outer convex mould of it. From its relative situation, then, I should call this high hump the organ of firmness or indomitableness in the sperm whale, and that the great monster is indomitable, you will yet have reason to know. End of chapter 78 to 80. Moby Dick, chapters 81 to 82. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 81 and 82. Chapter 81. The Pequod Meets the Virgin. The predestinated day arrived, and we duly met the ship Jungfrau, Derek de Dare, master of Bremen. At one time the greatest whaling people in the world, the Dutch and Germans are now among the least, but here and there, at very wide intervals of latitude and longitude, you still occasionally meet with their flag in the Pacific. For some reason, the Jungfrau seemed quite eager to pay her respects, while yet some distance from the Pequod she rounded to, and dropping a boat, her captain was impelled toward us, impatiently standing in the bows instead of the stern. "'What has he in his hand there?' cried Starbuck, pointing to something wavingly held by the German. "'Impossible! A lamp-feeder!' "'Not that,' said Stubb. "'No, no! It's a coffee-pot, Mr. Starbuck. He's coming off to make us our coffee, is the Yarman. Don't you see that big tin can of there alongside of him? That's his boiling water. Oh, he's all right, is the Yarman.' "'Get along with you,' cried Flask. It's a lamp-feeder and an oil-can. He's out of oil and has come a-begging. 
However curious it may seem for an oil ship to be borrowing oil on the whale ground, and however much it may inadvertently contradict the old proverb about carrying coals to Newcastle, yet sometimes such a thing really happens. And in the present case, Captain Derek de Dare did indubitably conduct a lamp feeder, as Flask did declare. As he mounted the deck, Ahab abruptly accosted him, without at all heeding what he had in his hand. But in his broken lingo, the German soon evinced his complete ignorance of the white whale, immediately turning the conversation to his lamp feeder and oil can with some remarks touching his having to turn into his hammock at night in profound darkness, his last drop of Bremen oil being gone, and not a single flying fish yet captured to supply the deficiency, concluding by hinting that his ship was indeed what in the fishery is technically called a clean one, that is, an empty one, well deserving the name of Jungfrau, or the Virgin. His necessities supplied, Derek departed, but he had not gained his ship's side when whales were almost simultaneously raised from the mastheads of both vessels, and so eager for the chase was Derek, that without pausing to put his oil-can and lamp-feeder aboard, he slewed round his boat and made after the leviathan lamp-feeders. Now, the game having risen to the leeward, he and the other three German boats that soon followed him had considerably the start of the Pequod's keels. There were eight whales, an average pod. Aware of their danger, they were going all abreast with great speed straight before the wind, rubbing their flanks as closely as so many spans of horses in harness. They left a great wide wake, as though continually unrolling a great wide parchment upon the sea. Full in this rapid wake, and many fathoms in the rear, swam a huge humped old bull, which by his comparatively slow progress, as well as by the unusual yellowish incrustations overgrowing him, seemed afflicted with the jaundice, or some other infirmity. Whether this whale belonged to the pod in advance seemed questionable, for it is not customary for such venerable leviathans to be at all social. Nevertheless, he stuck to their wake, though indeed their backwater must have retarded him, because the white bone or swell at his broad muzzle was a dashed one, like the swell formed when two hostile currents meet. His spout was short, slow, and laborious, coming forth with a choking sort of gush, and spending itself in torn shreds, followed by strange subterranean commotions in him, which seemed to have egress at his other buried extremity, causing the waters behind him to up-bubble. "'Who's got some paragoric?' said Stubb. "'He has the stomach-ache, I'm afraid. Lord, think of having half an acre of stomach-ache. Adverse winds are holding mad Christmas in him, boys. It's the first foul wind I ever knew to blow from astern. But look, did ever whale yaw so before?' It must be he's lost his tiller. As an overladen Indiaman, bearing down the Hindustan coast with a deck-load of frightened horses, careens, berries, rolls, and wallows on her way, so did this old whale heave his aged bulk, and now and then, partly turning over on his cumbrous rib-ends, expose the cause of his devious wake in the unnatural stump of his starboard fin. Whether he had lost that fin in battle, or had been born without it, it were hard to say. "'Only wait a bit, old chap, and I'll give you a sling for that wounded arm,' cried Cruel Flask, pointing to the whale line near him. "'Mind he don't sling thee with it,' cried Starbuck. "'Give way, or the German will have him.' With one intent, all the combined rival boats were pointed for this one fish— because not only was he the largest and therefore the most valuable whale, but he was nearest to them, and the other whales were going with such great velocity, moreover, as almost to defy pursuit for the time. At this juncture the Pequod's keels had shot by the three German boats last lowered, but from the great start he had had Derrick's boat still led the chase, though every moment neared by his foreign rivals. The only thing they feared was that, from being already so nigh to his mark, he would be enabled to dart his iron before they could completely overtake and pass him, 
As for Derek, he seemed quite confident that this would be the case, and occasionally, with a deriding gesture, shook his lamp feeder at the other boats. "'The ungracious and ungrateful dog!' cried Starbuck. "'He mocks and dares me with the very poor box I filled for him not five minutes ago!' Then, in his old intense whisper, "'Give way, greyhounds! Dog to it!' "'I tell you what it is, men!' cried Stubb to his crew. "'It's against my religion to get mad, but I'd like to eat that villainous yarman. Pull, won't you? Are you going to let that rascal beat you? Do you love brandy? A hogshead of brandy, then, to the best man. Come, why don't some of you burst a blood vessel? Who's that been dropping an anchor overboard? We don't budge an inch. We're becalmed. Halloo, here's grass growing in the boat's bottom.' and by the lord the mast there budding this won't do boys look at that yarman the short and long of it is men will you spit fire or not oh see the suds he makes cried flask dancing up and down what a hump oh do pile on the beef lays like a log oh my lads do spring slapjacks and quahogs for supper you know my lads baked clams and muffins oh do do spring He's a hundred barreler. Don't lose him now. Oh, don't, don't. See that yarman. Oh, won't you pull for your duff, my lads. Such a sog, such a sogger. Don't you love sperm? There goes three thousand dollars, men. A bank, a whole bank, the Bank of England. Oh, do, do, do. What's that yarman about now? At this moment Derrick was in the act of pitching his lamp-feeder at the advancing boats, and also his oil-can, perhaps with the double view of retarding his rival's way, and at the same time economically accelerating his own by the momentary impetus of the backward toss. "'The unmannerly Dutch dogger!' cried Stubb. "'Pull now, men! Like fifty thousand line of battleship loads of red-haired devils! What do you say, Tashtego? Are you the man to snap your spine in two and twenty pieces for the honor of old Gayhead? What do you say? I say, pull like goddamn, cried the Indian. Fiercely, but evenly incited by the taunts of the German, the Pequod's three boats now began ranging almost abreast, and so disposed, momentarily neared him. In that fine, loose, chivalrous attitude of the headsman, when drawing near to his prey, the three mates stood up proudly, occasionally backing the after oarsman with an exhilarating cry of, There she slides now! Hurrah for the white ash breeze! Down with the yarman! Sail over him! But so decided an original start had Derrick had, that spite of all their gallantry he would have proved the victor in this race, had not a righteous judgment descended upon him in a crab which caught the blade of his midship oarsman. While this clumsy lubber was striving to free his white ash, and while, in consequence, Derrick's boat was nigh to capsizing, and he thundering away at his men in a mighty rage, that was a good time for Starbuck, Stubb, and Flask. With a shout, they took a mortal start forward, and slantingly ranged up on the German's quarter. An instant more, and all four boats were diagonally in the whale's immediate wake, while stretching from them on both sides was the foaming swell that he made. It was a terrific, most pitiable, and maddening sight. The whale was now going head out, and sending his spout before him in a continual tormented jet, while his one poor fin beat his side in an agony of fright. Now to this hand, now to that, he yawed in his faltering flight, and still at every billow that he broke he spasmodically sank in the sea, or sideways rolled towards the sky his one beating fin. So have I seen a bird with clipped wing making affrighted broken circles in the air, vainly striving to escape the piratical hawks. But the bird has a voice, and with plaintive cries will make known her fear. But the fear of this vast dumb brood of the sea was chained up and enchanted in him. He had no voice, save that choking respiration through his spiracle, and this made the sight of him unspeakably pitiable, while still, in his amazing bulk, portcullis jaw, and omnipotent tail, there was enough to appall the stoutest man who so pitied. 
seeing now that but a very few moments more would give the Pequod's boats the advantage, and rather than be thus foiled of his game, Derrick chose to hazard what to him must have seemed a most unusually long dart, ere the last chance would forever escape. But no sooner did his harpooner stand up for the stroke than all three tigers, Queequeg, Tashtego, and Dagoo, instinctively sprang to their feet, and standing in a diagonal row, simultaneously pointed their barbs, and darted over the head of the German harpooner their three Nantucket irons entered the whale. Blinding vapors of foam and white fire, the three boats, in the first fury of the whale's headlong rush, bumped the Germans aside with such force that both Derrick and his baffled harpooner were spilled out and sailed over by the three flying keels. "'Don't be afraid, my butter-boxes!' cried Stubb, casting a passing glance upon them as he shot by. "'You'll be picked up presently. All right. I saw some sharks astern, St. Bernard's dogs, you know, relieve distressed travellers.' Hurrah! This is the way to sail now, every keel a sunbeam. Hurrah! Here we go like three tin kettles at the tail of a mad cougar. This puts me in mind of fastening to an elephant in a tilbury on a plain. Makes the wheel spokes fly, boys, when you fasten to him that way. And there's danger of being pitched out, too, when you strike a hill. Hurrah! This is the way a fellow feels when he's going to Davy Jones all a rush down an endless inclined plain. Hurrah! This whale carries the everlasting mail. But the monster's run was a brief one. Giving a sudden gasp, he tumultuously sounded. With a grating rush, the three lines flew round the loggerheads with such force as to gouge deep grooves in them, while so fearful were the harpooners that this rapid sounding would soon exhaust the lines that, using all their dexterous might, they caught repeated smoking turns with the rope to hold on, till at last, owing to the perpendicular strain from the lead-lined chocks of the boats, whence the three ropes went straight down into the blue, the gunwales of the bows were almost even with the water, while the three sterns were tilted high in the air. And the whale soon ceasing to sound, for some time they remained in that attitude, fearful of expending more line, though the position was a little ticklish, but though boats have been taken down and lost in this way, yet it is this holding on, as it is called, this hooking up by the sharp barbs of his live flesh from the back, this it is that often torments the leviathan into soon rising again to meet the sharp lance of his foes. Yet not to speak of the peril of the thing, it is to be doubted whether this course is always the best, for it is but reasonable to presume that the longer the stricken whale stays under water, the more he is exhausted. Because, owing to the enormous surface of him, in a full-grown sperm whale something less than two thousand square feet, the pressure of the water is immense. We all know what an astonishing atmospheric weight we ourselves stand up under, even here above ground in the air. How vast, then, the burden of a whale, bearing on his back a column of two hundred fathoms of ocean. It must at least equal the weight of fifty atmospheres. One whaleman has estimated it at the weight of twenty line of battleships, with all their guns and stores and men on board. As the three boats lay there on that gently rolling sea, gazing down into its eternal blue noon, and as not a single groan or cry of any sort, nay, not so much as a ripple or a bubble, came up from its depths, what landsman would have thought that beneath all that silence and placidity the utmost monster of the seas was writhing and wrenching in agony? Not eight inches of perpendicular rope were visible at the bows. Seems it credible that by three such thin threads the great leviathan was suspended like the big weight to an eight-day clock? suspended and to what to three bits of board is this the creature of whom it was once so triumphantly said canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears the sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold the spear the dart nor the habergeon he esteemeth iron as straw the arrow cannot make him flee darts are counted as stubble he laugheth at the shaking of a spear this the creature, this he? Oh, that unfulfillment should follow the prophets! 
for with the strength of a thousand thighs in his tail, Leviathan had run his head under the mountains of the sea to hide him from the Pequod's fish spears. In that sloping afternoon sunlight, the shadows that the three boats sent down beneath the surface must have been long enough and broad enough to shade half Xerxes' army. Who can tell how appalling to the wounded whale must have been such huge phantoms flitting over his head? "'Stand by, men! He stirs!' cried Starbuck, as the three lines suddenly vibrated in the water, distinctly conducting upwards to them, as by magnetic wires, the life and death throbs of the whale, so that every oarsman felt them in his seat. The next moment, relieved in great part from the downward strain at the bows, the boats gave a sudden bounce upward, as a small ice-field will, when a dense herd of white bears are scared from it into the sea. "'Haul in! Haul in!' cried Starbuck again. "'He's rising!' The lines, of which hardly an instant before not one hand's breadth could have been gained, were now in long, quick coils flung back, all dripping into the boats, and soon the whale broke water within two ship's lengths of the hunters. His motions plainly denoted his extreme exhaustion. In most land animals there are certain valves or floodgates in many of their veins, whereby, when wounded, the blood is, in some degree at least, instantly shut off in certain directions. Not so with the whale, one of whose peculiarities it is to have an entire non-valvular structure of the blood vessels, so that when pierced even by so small a point as a harpoon, a deadly drain is at once begun upon his whole arterial system, and when this is heightened by the extraordinary pressure of water at a great distance below the surface, his life may be said to pour from him in incessant streams. Yet so vast is the quantity of blood in him, and so distant and numerous its interior fountains, that he will keep thus bleeding and bleeding for a considerable period, even as in a drought a river will flow, whose source is in the wellsprings of far-off and undiscernible hills, even now, when the boats pulled upon the whale, and perilously drew over his swaying flukes, and the lances were darted into him, they were followed by steady jets from the new-made wound, which kept continually playing, while the natural spout-hole in his head was only at intervals, however rapid, sending its affrighted moisture into the air. From this last vent no blood yet came, because no vital part of him had thus far been struck his life, as they significantly call it, was untouched. As the boats now more closely surrounded him, the whole upper part of his form, with much of it that is ordinarily submerged, was plainly revealed. His eyes, or rather the places where his eyes had been, were beheld. As strange misgrown masses gather in the knot-holes of the noblest oaks when prostrate, so from the points which the whale's eyes had once occupied now protruded blind bulbs, horribly pitiable to see. But pity there was none, for all his old age, and his one arm, and his blind eyes, he must die the death and be murdered in order to light the gay bridles and other merry-makings of men, and also to illuminate the solemn churches that preach unconditional inoffensiveness by all to all. Still rolling in his blood, at last he partially disclosed a strangely discolored bunch or protuberance the size of a bushel, low down on the flank. "'A nice spot!' cried Flask. "'Just let me prick him there once.' "'Avast!' cried Starbuck. "'There's no need of that.' But humane Starbuck was too late. At the instant of the dart, an ulcerous jet shot from this cruel wound, and goaded by it into more than sufferable anguish, the whale, now spouting thick blood with swift fury, blindly darted at the craft, bespattering them and their glorying crews all over with showers of gore, capsizing Flask's boat, and marring the bows. It was his death-stroke. For by this time so spent was he by loss of blood, that he helplessly rolled away from the wreck he had made, lay panting on his side, impotently flapped with his stumped fin, then over and over slowly revolved like a waning world, turned up the white secrets of his belly, lay like a log, and died. 
It was most piteous, that last expiring spout, as when by unseen hands the water is gradually drawn off from some mighty fountain, and with half-stifled melancholy gurglings the spray column lowers and lowers to the ground, so the last long dying spout of the whale. Soon, while the crews were awaiting the arrival of the ship, the body showed symptoms of sinking with all its treasures unrifled. Immediately, by Starbuck's orders, lines were secured to it at different points, so that ere long every boat was a boy, the sunken whale being suspended a few inches beneath them by the cords. By very heedful management, when the ship drew nigh, the whale was transferred to her side, and was strongly secured there by the stiffest fluke chains, for it was plain that unless artificially upheld, the body would at once sink to the bottom. It so chanced that almost upon first cutting into him with the spade, the entire length of a corroded harpoon was found embedded in his flesh, on the lower part of the bunch before described. But as the stumps of harpoons are frequently found in the dead bodies of captured whales, with the flesh perfectly healed around them, and no prominence of any kind to denote their place, therefore there must needs have been some other unknown reason in the present case fully to account for the ulceration alluded to. But still more curious was the fact of a lance head of stone being found in him, not far from the buried iron, the flesh perfectly firm about it. Who had darted that stone lance, and when? It might have been darted by some Norwest Indian long before America was discovered. What other marvels might have been rummaged out of this monstrous cabinet there is no telling, but a sudden stop was put to further discoveries by the ships being unprecedentedly dragged over sideways to the sea, owing to the body's immensely increasing tendency to sink. However, Starbuck, who had the ordering of affairs, hung on to it to the last, hung on to it so resolutely, indeed, that when, at length, the ship would have been capsized, if still persisting in locking arms with the body, then, when the command was given to break clear from it, such was the immovable strain upon the timber-heads to which the fluke chains and cables were fastened, that it was impossible to cast them off. Meantime, everything in the Pequod was a slant. To cross to the other side of the deck was like walking up the steep gabled roof of a house. The ship groaned and gasped. Many of the ivory inlayings of her bulwarks and cabins were started from their places by the unnatural dislocation. In vain, handspikes and crows were brought to bear upon the immovable fluke chains to pry them adrift from the timber heads, and so low had the whale now settled that the submerged ends could not be at all approached, while every moment whole tons of ponderosity seemed added to the sinking bulk, and the ship seemed on the point of going over. "'Hold on! Hold on, won't ye?' cried Stubb to the body. "'Don't be in such a devil of a hurry to sink. By thunder, men, we must do something or go for it. No use prying there. Avast, I say, with your handspikes, and run one of ye for a prayer book and a penknife, and cut the big chains.' "'Knife? Ay, ay, cried Queequeg, and seizing the carpenter's heavy hatchet, he leaned out of a porthole, and steel to iron, began slashing at the largest fluke chains. But a few strokes full of sparks were given, when the exceeding strain effected the rest. With a terrific snap, every fastening went adrift. The ship righted. The carcass sank. Now this occasional, inevitable sinking of the recently killed sperm whale is a very curious thing, nor has any fisherman yet adequately accounted for it. Usually the dead sperm whale floats with great buoyancy, with its side or belly considerably elevated above the surface. If the only whales that thus sank were old, meager, and broken-hearted creatures, their pads of lard diminished and all their bones heavy and rheumatic, then you might with some reason assert that this sinking is caused by an uncommon specific gravity in the fish so sinking, consequent upon this absence of buoyant matter in him. But it is not so, for young whales, in the highest health and swelling with noble aspirations, prematurely cut off in the warm flush and may of life, with all their panting lard about them, even these brawny buoyant heroes do sometimes sink. 
Be it said, however, that the sperm whale is far less liable to this accident than any other species. Where one of that sort go down, twenty right whales do. This difference in the species is no doubt imputable in no small degree to the greater quantity of bone in the right whale, his Venetian blinds alone sometimes weighing more than a ton. From this encumbrance the sperm whale is wholly free. But there are instances where, after the lapse of many hours or several days, the sunken whale again rises, more buoyant than in life. But the reasons of this are obvious. Gases are generated in him, he swells to a prodigious magnitude, becomes a sort of animal balloon. A line of battleship could hardly keep him under then. In the shore whaling, on soundings among the bays of New Zealand, when a right whale gives token of sinking, they fasten buoys to him, with plenty of rope, so that, when the body has gone down, they know where to look for it when it shall have ascended again. It was not long after the sinking of the body that a cry was heard from the Pequod's mastheads, announcing that the Jungfrau was again lowering her boats, though the only spout in sight was that of a finback, belonging to the species of uncapturable whales, because of its incredible power of swimming. Nevertheless, the finback spout is so similar to the sperm whales that by unskillful fishermen it is often mistaken for it. And consequently Derrick and all his host were now in valiant chase of this unnearable brute. The virgin crowding all sail made after her four young keels, and thus they all disappeared far to leeward, still in bold, hopeful chase. Oh, many are the finbacks, and many are the derricks, my friend. Chapter 82 The Honor and Glory of Whaling There are some enterprises in which a careful disorderliness is the true method. The more I dive into this matter of whaling, and push my researches up to the very springhead of it, so much the more am I impressed with its great honorableness and antiquity, and especially when I find so many great demigods and heroes, prophets of all sort, who one way or other have shed distinction upon it, I am transported with the reflection that I myself belong, though but subordinately, to so emblazoned a fraternity. The gallant Persis, son of Jupiter, was the first whaleman, and to the eternal honor of our calling be it said that the first whale attacked by our brotherhood was not killed with any sordid intent. Those were the nightly days of our profession, when we only bore arms to succor the distressed, not to fill men's lamp-feeders. Everyone knows the fine story of Persis and Andromeda, how the lovely Andromeda, the daughter of a king, was tied to a rock on the sea-coast and as Leviathan was in the very act of carrying her off, Persis, the prince of whalemen, intrepidly advancing, harpooned the monster, and delivered and married the maid. It was an admirable artistic exploit, rarely achieved by the best harpooners of the present day, inasmuch as this Leviathan was slain at the very first dart. And let no man doubt this archite story, for in the ancient Joppa, now Jaffa, on the Syrian coast, in one of the pagan temples, there stood for many ages the vast skeleton of a whale, which the city's legends and all the inhabitants asserted to be the identical bones of the monster that Persis slew. When the Romans took Joppa, the same skeleton was carried to Italy in triumph. What seems most singular and suggestively important in this story is this— it was from Joppa that Jonah set sail. Akin to the adventure of Persis and Andromeda, indeed by some supposed to be indirectly derived from it, is that famous story of St. George and the dragon, which dragon I maintain to have been a whale, for in many old chronicles whales and dragons are strangely jumbled together, and often stand for each other. Thou art as a lion of the waters, and as a dragon of the sea, saith Ezekiel, hereby plainly meaning a whale. In truth, some versions of the Bible use that word itself. Besides, it would much subtract from the glory of the exploit had St. George but encountered a crawling reptile of the land, instead of doing battle with the great monster of the deep. 
any man may kill a snake, but only a Persis, a St. George, a coffin, have the heart in them to march boldly up to a whale. Let not the modern paintings of this scene mislead us, for though the creature encountered by that valiant whaleman of old is vaguely represented of a griffin-like shape, and though the battle is depicted on land and the saint on horseback, yet, considering the great ignorance of those times, when the true form of the whale was unknown to artists, and considering that, as in Persis's case, St. George's whale might have crawled up out of the sea on the beach, and considering that the animal ridden by St. George might have been only a large seal or seahorse, bearing all this in mind, it will not appear altogether incompatible with the sacred legend and the ancientest drafts of the scene to hold this so-called dragon no other than the great Leviathan himself. In fact, placed before the strict and piercing truth, this whole story will fare like that fish, flesh, and foul idol of the Philistines, Dagon by name, who being planted before the Ark of Israel, his horse's head and both the palms of his hands fell off from him, and only the stump or fishy part of him remained. Thus, then, one of our own noble stamp, even a whaleman, is the tutelary guardian of England, and by good rights we harponeers of Nantucket should be enrolled in the most noble order of St. George. And therefore let not the knights of that honourable company, none of whom I venture to say have ever had to do with a whale like their great patron, let them never eye a Nantucketer with disdain, since even in our woollen frocks and tarred trousers we are much better entitled to St. George's decoration than they." Whether to admit Hercules among us or not, concerning this I long remained dubious. For though, according to the Greek mythologies, that antique Crockett and Kit Carson, that brawny doer of rejoicing good deeds, was swallowed down and thrown up by a whale, still whether that strictly makes a whaleman of him, that might be mooted. It nowhere appears that he ever actually harpooned his fish, unless indeed from the inside, Nevertheless, he may be deemed a sort of involuntary whaleman. At any rate, the whale caught him if he did not the whale. I claim him for one of our clan. But by the best contradictory authorities, this Grecian story of Hercules and the whale is considered to be derived from the still more ancient Hebrew story of Jonah and the whale, and vice versa. Certainly they are very similar. If I claim the demigod, then... Why not the prophet? Nor do heroes, saints, demigods, and prophets alone comprise the whole role of our order. Our grand master is still to be named, for like royal kings of old times, we find the headwaters of our fraternity in nothing short of the great gods themselves. That wondrous oriental story is now to be rehearsed from the Shaster, which gives us the dread Vishnu, one of the three persons of the godhead of the Hindus, gives us this divine Vishnu himself for our Lord. Vishnu, who, by the first of his ten earthly incarnations, has forever set apart and sanctified the whale. When Brahma, or the god of gods, saith the Shaster, resolved to recreate the world after one of its periodical dissolutions, he gave birth to Vishnu to preside over the work, but the Vedas, or mystical books, whose perusal would seem to have been indispensable to Vishnu before beginning the creation, and which therefore must have contained something in the shape of practical hints to young architects, these Vedas were lying at the bottom of the waters. So Vishnu became incarnate as a whale, and sounding down in him to the uttermost depths, rescued the sacred volumes. Was not this Vishnu a whaleman, then? even as a man who rides a horse, is called a horseman. Persis, St. George, Hercules, Jonah, and Vishnu. There's a member roll for you. What club but the whalemans can head off like that? End of chapters 81 and 82
Chapters 83 to 86. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 83 to 86. Chapter 83. Jonah Historically Regarded. Reference was made to the historical story of Jonah and the Whale in the preceding chapter. Now, some Nantucketers rather distrust this historical story of Jonah and the Whale, but then there were some skeptical Greeks and Romans who, standing out from the orthodox pagans of their times, equally doubted the story of Hercules and the Whale, and Arion and the Dolphin. And yet their doubting those traditions did not make those traditions one whit the less facts for all that. One old Sag Harbor whaleman's chief reason for questioning the Hebrew story was this. He had one of those quaint, old-fashioned Bibles, embellished with curious, unscientific plates, one of which represented Jonah's whale with two spouts in his head a peculiarity only true with respect to a species of the leviathan, the right whale, and varieties of that order, concerning which the fishermen have this saying, a penny roll would choke him, his swallow is so very small. But to this Bishop Jeb's anticipative answer is ready. It is not necessary, hence the bishop, that we consider Jonah as tombed in the whale's belly, but as temporarily lodged in some part of his mouth, and this seems reasonable enough in the good bishop, for truly the right whale's mouth would accommodate a couple of whist tables, and comfortably seat all the players. Possibly, too, Jonah might have ensconced himself in a hollow tooth, but on second thoughts the right whale is toothless. Another reason which Sag Harbor, he went by that name, urged for his want of faith in this matter of the prophet, was something obscurely in reference to his incarcerated body and the whale's gastric juices. But this objection likewise falls to the ground, because a German exegetist supposes that Jonah must have taken refuge in the floating body of a dead whale, even as the French soldiers in the Russian campaign turned their dead horses into tents and crawled into them. Besides, it has been divined by other continental commentators that when Jonah was thrown overboard from the Joppa ship, he straightway effected his escape to another vessel nearby, some vessel with a whale for a figurehead, and, I would add, possibly called the whale, as some craft nowadays are christened the shark, the gull, the eagle. Nor have there been wanting learned exegetists who have opined that the whale mentioned in the book of Jonah merely meant a life preserver, an inflated bag of wind which the endangered prophet swam to, and so was saved from a watery doom. Poor Sag Harbor, therefore, seems worsted all round. But he had still another reason for his want of faith. It was this, if I remember right. Jonah was swallowed by the whale in the Mediterranean Sea, and after three days he was vomited up somewhere within three days' journey of Nineveh, a city on the Tigris, very much more than three days' journey across from the nearest point of the Mediterranean coast. How is that? But was there no other way for the whale to land the prophet within that short distance of Nineveh? Yes, he might have carried him round by the way of the Cape of Good Hope but not to speak of the passage through the whole length of the Mediterranean, and another passage up the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, such a supposition would involve the complete circumnavigation of all Africa in three days, not to speak of the Tigris waters near the site of Nineveh being too shallow for any whale to swim in. Besides, this idea of Jonah's weathering the Cape of Good Hope at so early a day would wrest the honor of the discovery of that great headland from Bartholomew Diaz, its reputed discoverer, and so make modern history a liar. But all these foolish arguments of old Sag Harbor only evinced his foolish pride of reason, a thing still more reprehensible in him, seeing that he had but little learning except what he had picked up from the sun and the sea. I say it only shows his foolish, impious pride, 
and abominable devilish rebellion against the reverend clergy for by a portuguese catholic priest this very idea of jonah's going to nineveh via the cape of good hope was advanced as a signal magnification of the general miracle and so it was besides to this day the highly enlightened turks devoutly believe in the historical story of jonah and some three centuries ago an english traveller in old harris's voyages speaks of a turkish mosque built in honour of jonah in which mosque was a miraculous lamp that burnt without any oil chapter eighty four pitch poling to make them run easily and swiftly, the axles of carriages are anointed, and for much the same purpose some whalers perform an analogous operation upon their boat. They grease the bottom. Nor is it to be doubted that as such a procedure can do no harm, it may possibly be of no contemptible advantage, considering that oil and water are hostile, that oil is a sliding thing, and that the object in view is to make the boat slide bravely. Queequeg believes strongly in anointing his boat, and one morning, not long after the German ship Jungfrau disappeared, took more than customary pains in that occupation, crawling under its bottom where he hung over the side, and rubbing in the unctuousness as though diligently seeking to ensure a crop of hair from the craft's bald keel, he seemed to be working in obedience to some particular presentiment. Nor did it remain unwarranted by the event. Towards noon, whales were raised, but so soon as the ship sailed down to them, they turned and fled with swift precipitancy, a disordered flight as of Cleopatra's barges from Actium. Nevertheless, the boats pursued, and Stubbs was foremost, by great exertion, Tashtego at last succeeded in planting one iron, but the stricken whale, without at all sounding, still continued his horizontal flight, with added fleetness. Such unintermitted strainings upon the planted iron must sooner or later inevitably extract it. It became imperative to lance the flying whale, or be content to lose him. But to haul the boat up to his flank was impossible, he swam so fast and furious what then remained of all the wondrous devices and dexterities the sleights of hand and countless subtleties to which the veteran whaleman is so often forced none exceed that fine manoeuvre with the lance called pitch poling small sword or broadsword in all its exercises boasts nothing like it it is only indispensable with an inveterate running whale its grand fact and feature is the wonderful distance to which the long lance is accurately darted from a violently rocking, jerking boat, under extreme headway. Steel and wood included, the entire spear is some ten or twelve feet in length, the staff is much slighter than that of the harpoon, and also of lighter material, pine. It is furnished with a small rope called a warp, of considerable length by which it can be hauled back to the hand after darting but before going further it is important to mention here that though the harpoon may be pitch-poled in the same way with the lance yet it is seldom done and when done it is still less frequently successful on account of the greater weight and inferior length of the harpoon as compared with the lance which in effect become serious drawbacks as a general thing, therefore, you must first get fast to a whale before any pitch-poling comes into play. Look now at Stubb, a man who, from his humorous, deliberate coolness and equanimity in the direst emergencies, was specially qualified to excel in pitch-poling. Look at him. He stands upright in the tossed bow of the flying boat, wrapped in fleecy foam. The towing whale is forty feet ahead handling the long lance lightly, glancing twice or thrice along its length to see if it be exactly straight, Stubb whistlingly gathers up the coil of the warp in one hand, so as to secure its free end in his grasp, leaving the rest unobstructed. Then, holding the lance full before his waistband's middle, he levels it at the whale, when, covering him with it, 
he steadily depresses the butt end in his hand, thereby elevating the point till the weapon stands fairly balanced upon his palm, fifteen feet in the air. He minds you somewhat of a juggler, balancing a long staff on his chin. Next moment, with a rapid, nameless impulse, in a superb, lofty arch, the bright steel spans the foaming distance and quivers in the life-spot of the whale. Instead of sparkling water, he now spouts red blood. "'That drove the spigot out of him,' cried Stubb. "'Tis July's immortal fourth. All fountains must run wine to-day. Would now it were old New Orleans whiskey or old Ohio, or unspeakable old Monongahela. Then, Tashtego, lad, I'd have you hold a canakin to the jet, and we'd drink round of it. Yea, verily, hearts alive, we'd brew choice punch in the spread of his spout-hole there. From that live punch-bowl quaff the living stuff. Again and again, to such gamesome talk, the dexterous dart is repeated, the spear returning to its master like a greyhound held in skilful leash. The agonized whale goes into his flurry, the tow-line is slackened, and the pitch-poler, dropping astern, folds his hands and mutely watches the monster die. Chapter 85 The Fountain that for six thousand years, and no one knows how many millions of ages before, the great whale should have been spouting all over the sea, and sprinkling and mystifying the gardens of the deep, as with so many sprinkling or mystifying pots, and that for some centuries back thousands of hunters should have been close by the fountain of the whale, watching these sprinklings and spoutings, that all this should be, and yet that down to this blessed minute, fifteen and a quarter minutes past one o'clock p.m. of this sixteenth day of December, A.D. 1851, it should still remain a problem whether these spoutings are, after all, really water, or nothing but vapor, this is surely a noteworthy thing. Let us then look at this matter, along with some interesting items contingent. Everyone knows that by the peculiar cunning of their gills, the finny tribes in general breathe the air which at all times is combined with the element in which they swim. Hence a herring or cod might live a century, and never once raise its head above the surface. But owing to his marked internal structure which gives him regular lungs, like a human being's, the whale can only live by inhaling the disengaged air in the open atmosphere wherefore the necessity for his periodical visits to the upper world. But he cannot in any degree breathe through his mouth, for in his ordinary attitude the sperm whale's mouth is buried at least eight feet beneath the surface, and, what is still more, his windpipe has no connection with his mouth. No, he breathes through his spiracle alone, and this is on the top of his head. If I say that in any creature, breathing is only a function indispensable to vitality, inasmuch as it withdraws from the air a certain element, which being subsequently brought into contact with the blood, imparts to the blood its vivifying principle, I do not think I shall err, though I may possibly use some superfluous scientific words. Assume it, and it follows that if all the blood in a man could be aerated in one breath, he might then seal up his nostrils and not fetch another for a considerable time. That is to say, he would then live without breathing. Anomalous as it may seem, this is precisely the case with the whale, who systematically lives by intervals his full hour and more, when at the bottom, without drawing a single breath, or so much as in any way inhaling a particle of air, for, remember, he has no gills. How is this? Between his ribs and on each side of his spine, he is supplied with a remarkable, involved, cretin labyrinth of vermicelli-like vessels, which vessels, when he quits the surface, are completely distended with oxygenated blood, so that, for an hour or more, a thousand fathoms in the sea, he carries a surplus stock of vitality in him, just as the camel, crossing the waterless desert, carries a surplus supply of drink for future use in its four supplementary stomachs. The anatomical fact of this labyrinth is indisputable, 
and that the supposition founded upon it is reasonable and true, seems the more cogent to me when I consider the otherwise inexplicable obstinacy of that leviathan in having his spoutings out, as the fishermen phrase it. This is what I mean. If unmolested, upon rising to the surface, the sperm whale will continue there for a period of time exactly uniform with all his other unmolested risings. Say he stays eleven minutes and jets seventy times, that is, respires seventy breaths, then whenever he rises again, he will be sure to have his seventy breaths all over again, to a minute. Now if, after he fetches a few breaths, you alarm him, so that he sounds, he will be always dodging up again to make good his regular allowance of air, and not till those seventy breaths are told will he finally go down to stay out his full term below. Remark, however, that in different individuals these rates are different, but in any one they are alike. Now why should the whale thus insist upon having his spoutings out, unless it be to replenish his reservoir of air ere descending for good? How obvious is it, too, that this necessity for the whale's rising exposes him to all the fatal hazards of the chase. For not by hook or by net could this vast leviathan be caught when sailing a thousand fathoms beneath the sunlight. Not so much thy skill, then, O hunter, as the great necessities that strike the victory to thee. In man breathing is incessantly going on, one breath only serving for two or three pulsations, so that whatever other business he has to attend to, waking or sleeping, breathe he must, or die he will. But the sperm whale only breathes about one-seventh or Sunday of his time. It has been said that the whale only breathes through his spout hole. If it could truthfully be added that his spouts are mixed with water, then I opine we should be furnished with the reason why his sense of smell seems obliterated in him, for the only thing about him that at all answers to his nose is that identical spout hole, and being so clogged with two elements, it could not be expected to have the power of smelling. But owing to the mystery of the spout, whether it be water or whether it be vapor, no absolute certainty can as yet be arrived at on this head. Sure it is, nevertheless, that the sperm whale has no proper olfactories. But what does he want of them? No roses, no violets, no cologne water in the sea. Furthermore, as his windpipe solely opens into the tube of his spouting canal, and as that long canal, like the Grand Erie Canal, is furnished with a sort of locks that open and shut for the downward retention of air or the upward exclusion of water, therefore the whale has no voice, unless you insult him by saying that when he so strangely rumbles he talks through his nose. But then again, what has the whale to say? Seldom have I known any profound being that had anything to say to this world, unless forced to stammer out something by way of getting a living. Oh, happy that the world is such an excellent listener. Now the spouting canal of the sperm whale, chiefly intended as it is for the conveyance of air, and for several feet laid along horizontally just beneath the upper surface of his head, and a little to one side, this curious canal is very much like a gas-pipe, laid down in a city on one side of a street. But the question returns whether this gas-pipe is also a water-pipe. In other words, whether the spout of the sperm whale is the mere vapor of the exhaled breath, or whether that exhaled breath is mixed with water taken in at the mouth and discharged through the spiracle. It is certain that the mouth indirectly communicates with the spouting canal, but it cannot be proved that this is for the purpose of discharging water through the spiracle, because the greatest necessity for so doing would seem to be when in feeding he accidentally takes in water. But the sperm whale's food is far beneath the surface, and there he cannot spout even if he would. Besides, if you regard him very closely, and time him with your watch, you will find that when unmolested, there is an undeviating rhyme between the periods of his jets and the ordinary periods of respiration. But why pester one with all this reasoning on the subject? Speak out! You have seen him spout. Then declare what the spout is. 
Can you not tell water from air? My dear sir, in this world it is not so easy to settle these plain things. I have ever found your plain things the naughtiest of all, and as for this whale-spout, you might almost stand in it and yet be undecided as to what it is precisely. The central body of it is hidden in the snowy, sparkling mist enveloping it, and how can you certainly tell whether any water falls from it, when always, when you are close enough to a whale to get a close view of his spout, he is in a prodigious commotion, the water cascading all around him. And if at such times you should think that you really perceive drops of moisture in the spout, how do you know that they are not merely condensed from its vapor? Or how do you know that they are not those identical drops superficially lodged in the spout-hole fissure which is countersunk into the summit of the whale's head, for even when tranquilly swimming through the midday sea in a calm, with his elevated hump sun-dried as a dromedary's in the desert, even then the whale always carries a small basin of water on his head, as under a blazing sun you will sometimes see a cavity in a rock filled up with rain. Nor is it at all prudent for the hunter to be over-curious touching the precise nature of the whale-spout. It will not do for him to be peering into it and putting his face in it. You cannot go with your pitcher to this fountain and fill it and bring it away. For even when coming into slight contact with the outer vapory shreds of the jet, which will often happen, your skin will feverishly smart from the acridness of the thing so touching it. And I know one who, coming into still closer contact with the spout, whether with some scientific object in view or otherwise, I cannot say, the skin peeled off from his cheek and arm. Wherefore, among whalemen, the spout is deemed poisonous. They try to evade it. Another thing. I have heard it said, and I do not much doubt it, that if the jet is fairly spouted into your eyes, it will blind you. The wisest thing the investigator can do, then, it seems to me, is to let this deadly spout alone. Still, we can hypothesize, even if we cannot prove and establish. My hypothesis is this, that the spout is nothing but mist. And besides other reasons, to this conclusion I am impelled by considerations touching the great inherent dignity and sublimity of the sperm whale. I account him no common, shallow being, inasmuch as it is an undisputed fact that he is never found on soundings or near shores, all other whales sometimes are. He is both ponderous and profound, and I am convinced that from the heads of all ponderous, profound beings, such as Plato, Pyrrho, the Devil, Jupiter, Dante, and so on, there always goes up a certain semi-visible steam while in the act of thinking deep thoughts. While composing a little treatise on eternity, I had the curiosity to place a mirror before me, and ere long saw reflected there a curious, involved worming and undulation in the atmosphere over my head, the invariable moisture of my hair, while plunged in deep thought, after six cups of hot tea in my thin shingled attic of an August noon, this seems an additional argument for the above supposition. And how nobly it raises our conceit of the mighty, misty monster, to behold him solemnly sailing through a calm tropical sea, his vast, mild head overhung by a canopy of vapor, engendered by his incommunicable contemplations, and that vapor, as you will sometimes see it, glorified by a rainbow, as if heaven itself had put its seal upon his thoughts. For, do you see, rainbows do not visit the clear air, they only irradiate vapor. And so, through all the thick mists of the dim doubts in my mind, divine intuitions now and then shoot, enkindling my fog with a heavenly ray. And for this I thank God, for all have doubts, many deny, but doubts or denials, few along with them have intuitions. Doubts of all things earthly, and intuitions of some things heavenly, this combination makes neither believer nor infidel, but makes a man who regards them both with equal eye. Chapter 86 The Tale 
Other poets have warbled the praises of the soft eye of the antelope, and the lovely plumage of the bird that never alights. Less celestial, I celebrate a tale. Reckoning the largest sized sperm whale's tail to begin at that point of the trunk where it tapers to about the girth of a man, it comprises, upon its upper surface alone, an area of at least fifty square feet. The compact round body of its root expands into two broad, firm, flat palms or flukes, gradually shoaling away to less than an inch in thickness. At the crotch or junction, these flukes slightly overlap, then sideways recede from each other like wings, leaving a wide vacancy between. In no living thing are the lines of beauty more exquisitely defined than in the crescentic borders of these flukes. At its utmost expansion in the full-grown whale, the tail will considerably exceed twenty feet across. The entire member seems a dense webbed bed of welded sinews, but cut into it and you find that three distinct strata compose it, upper, middle, and lower. The fibers in the upper and lower layers are long and horizontal, those of the middle one very short and running crosswise between the outside layers. This triune structure, as much as anything else, imparts power to the tail. To the student of old Roman walls, the middle layer will furnish a curious parallel to the thin course of tiles always alternating with the stone in those wonderful relics of the antique, and which undoubtedly contribute so much to the great strength of the masonry. But as if this vast local power in the tendinous tail were not enough, the whole bulk of the leviathan is knit over with a warp and woof of muscular fibers and filaments, which, passing on either side the loins and running down into the flukes, insensibly blend with them, and largely contribute to their might so that in the tail the confluent measureless force of the whole whale seems concentrated to a point. Could annihilation occur to matter, this were the thing to do it. Nor does this, its amazing strength, at all tend to cripple the graceful flexion of its motions, where infantileness of ease undulates through a titanism of power. On the contrary, those motions derive their most appalling beauty from it, Real strength never impairs beauty or harmony, but it often bestows it, and in everything imposingly beautiful, strength has much to do with the magic. Take away the tied tendons that all over seem bursting from the marble in carved Hercules, and its charm would be gone. As the devout Eckerman lifted the linen sheet from the naked corpse of Goethe, he was overwhelmed with the massive chest of the man, that seemed as a Roman triumphal arch. When Angelo paints even God the Father in human form, mark what robustness is there. And whatever they may reveal of the divine love in the sun, the soft, curled, hermaphroditical Italian pictures, in which his idea has been most successfully embodied, these pictures, so destitute as they are of all brawniness, hint nothing of any power but the mere negative, feminine one of submission and endurance, which, on all hands, it is conceded, form the peculiar practical virtues of his teachings. Such is the subtle elasticity of the organ I treat of, that whether wielded in sport or in earnest, or in anger, whatever be the mood it be in, its flexions are invariably marked by exceeding grace. Therein no fairy's arm can transcend it. Five great motions are peculiar to it. First, when used as a fin for progression. Second, when used as a mace in battle. Third, in sweeping. Fourth, in lobtailing. Fifth, in peaking flukes. First, being horizontal in its position, the leviathan's tail acts in a different manner from the tails of all other sea creatures. It never wriggles. In man or fish, wriggling is a sign of inferiority. To the whale, his tail is the sole means of propulsion, scroll-wise coiled forwards beneath the body, and then rapidly sprung backwards, it is this which gives that singular darting, leaping motion to the monster when furiously swimming. His side-fins only serve to steer by. 
Second, it is a little significant that while one sperm whale only fights another sperm whale with his head and jaw, nevertheless in his conflicts with man he chiefly and contemptuously uses his tail. In striking at a boat he swiftly curves away his flukes from it, and the blow is only inflicted by the recoil. If it be made in the unobstructed air, especially if it descend to its mark, the stroke is then simply irresistible. No ribs of man or boat can withstand it. Your only salvation lies in eluding it, but if it comes sideways through the opposing water, then partly owing to the light buoyancy of the whale-boat, and the elasticity of its materials, a cracked rib or a dashed plank or two, a sort of stitch in the side, is generally the most serious result. These submerged side-blows are so often received in the fishery that they are accounted mere child's play. Someone strips off a frock, and the hole is stopped. Third, I cannot demonstrate it, but it seems to me that in the whale the sense of touch is concentrated in the tail, for in this respect there is a delicacy in it only equalled by the daintiness of the elephant's trunk. This delicacy is chiefly evinced in the action of sweeping, when in maidenly gentleness the whale with a certain soft slowness moves his immense flukes from side to side upon the surface of the sea and if he feels but a sailor's whisker, woe to that sailor, whiskers and all, what tenderness there is in that preliminary touch. Had this tale any prehensile power, I should straightway bethink me of Darmonides' elephant that so frequented the flower-market, and with low salutations presented nosegays to damsels, and then caressed their zones. On more accounts than one, a pity it is that the whale does not possess this prehensile virtue in his tail. For I have heard of yet another elephant that, when wounded in the fight, curved round his trunk and extracted the dart. Fourth, stealing unawares upon the whale in the fancied security of the middle of solitary seas, you find him unbent from the vast corpulence of his dignity, and kitten-like he plays on the ocean as if it were a hearth. But still you see his power in his play. The broad palms of his tail are flirted high into the air, then smiting the surface the thunderous concussion resounds for miles. You would almost think a great gun had been discharged, and if you notice the light wreath of vapour from the spiracle at his other extremity, you would think that that was the smoke from the touch-hole. Fifth, as in the ordinary floating posture of the Leviathan, the flukes lie considerably below the level of his back, they are then completely out of sight beneath the surface, but when he is about to plunge into the deeps, his entire flukes with at least thirty feet of his body are tossed erect in the air, and so remain vibrating a moment, till they downward shoot out of view. Excepting the sublime breach, somewhere else to be described, this peaking of the whale's flukes is perhaps the grandest sight to be seen in all animated nature. Out of the bottomless profundities the gigantic tail seems spasmodically snatching at the highest heaven. So in dreams have I seen majestic Satan thrusting forth his tormented colossal claw from the flame Baltic of hell. But in gazing at such scenes, it is all in all what mood you are in. If in the Dantean, the devils will occur to you. If in that of Isaiah, the archangels. Standing at the masthead of my ship during a sunrise that crimsoned sky and sea, I once saw a large herd of whales in the east, all heading towards the sun, and for a moment vibrating in concert with peaked flukes. As it seemed to me at the time, such a grand embodiment of adoration of the gods was never beheld, even in Persia, the home of the fire-worshippers. As Ptolemy Philopater testified of the African elephant, I then testified of the whale, pronouncing him the most devout of all beings. For, according to King Juba, the military elephants of antiquity often hailed the morning with their trunks uplifted in the profoundest silence. The chance comparison in this chapter between the whale and the elephant, so far as some aspects of the tail of the one and the trunk of the other are concerned, 
should not tend to place those two opposite organs on an equality, much less the creatures to which they respectively belong. For as the mightiest elephant is but a terrier to Leviathan, so, compared with Leviathan's tail, his trunk is but the stalk of a lily. The most direful blow from the elephant's trunk were as the playful tap of a fan, compared with the measureless crush and crash of the sperm whale's ponderous flukes, which, in repeated instances, have one after the other hurled entire boats with all their oars and crews into the air, very much as an Indian juggler tosses his balls. Footnote. Though all comparison in the way of general bulk between the whale and the elephant is preposterous, inasmuch as in that particular the elephant stands in much the same respect to the whale as a dog does to the elephant, nevertheless there are not wanting some points of curious similitude. Among these is the spout. It is well known that the elephant will often draw up water or dust in his trunk, and then, elevating it, jet it forth in a stream. End of footnote. The more I consider this mighty tale, the more do I deplore my inability to express it. At times there are gestures in it which, though they would well grace the hand of man, remain wholly inexplicable. In an extensive herd so remarkable occasionally are these mystic gestures that I have heard hunters who have declared them akin to Freemason signs and symbols, that the whale indeed by these methods intelligently conversed with the world nor are there wanting other motions of the whale in his general body, full of strangeness and unaccountable to his most experienced assailant. Dissect him how I may, then, I go but skin deep. I know him not, and never will. But if I know not even the tail of this whale, how understand his head? Much more how comprehend his face, when face he has none. Thou shalt see my back parts, my tail, he seems to say, but my face shall not be seen. But I cannot completely make out his back parts, and hint what he will about his face. I say again, he has no face. End of chapters 83 to 86